Welcome back, welcome back. We're starting another project here. Uh, <laughs> if you've been watching this channel for a while, you know I like starting projects. And I've started a lot more projects than i finished. Because, well, I mean, why solve your problems when you can just create new ones? And it is as intricate and precise as a well-played game of chess. As you've guessed from the title, and some of you have guessed from the previous video where I mentioned there may have been a new project starting, we're trying to make Cubane. But more specifically here, we're trying to make this molecule up here, which I've drawn terribly. I've drawn all this terribly. Cubane 1, 4 dicarboxylate. So the Cubane with those two carboxylate groups on, on the either side of them. That's our end target molecule for this synthesis. Um, that's what we're trying to do. I might switch over to the other camera because people enjoy the other camera more than my hand waving in front of the camera all the time. So before we dive into the synthetic plan, I think it should be asked, why are we making this? And well, very quickly, it's it's very nice. I mean, people like making the Cubane without the carboxylate groups on it, just because it's, it's a very cool molecule to look at. Uh, people thought it was impossible to make a molecule like this until a group uh, in the 1960s, of course. Fuck me, I love the 60s. And that was a really great demo. The fact that you can really synthetically plan something and, and and actually make it happen it, it was it was very cool i'm interested in from from an energetics point of view obviously there's the absolute classic explosive octonitrocubane and heptanitrocubane they are considered the the best secondary explosives but they're also like the hardest thing to make ever so even if we get it to here perfectly actually getting to the the octa or, or heptanitrocubane is impossible we're, we're not going to be able to do that it's it's impossible for basically all labs to do so no one's really made it and and actually tested it in the field so its claim of being the best explosive ever is kind of very easy to make when no one can uh, no one can uh, test it out very well. However, just because octonitrocubane is too impossible to make, doesn't mean it should discourage us from trying to make other energetic cubane molecules. Really, there is some interest in making energetics out of cubane more and more now, as this molecule has kind of uh, become commercially available in recent years. It's still obviously expensive, but it's it's sort of getting to the point now where people are even using it in like pyrotechnic compositions, because you've got a really energetic source of carbon here. In our cubane dicarboxylate, we've got, you know, 10 carbons, so eight in the cube and two in the carboxylate groups and, and four oxygens. And if we consider a, a similar molecule, with, with a very similar molecular formula, but instead we've got benzene group and we've got two, you know, uh, methyl groups and two carboxylate groups. So we've still got the same number of carbons, same number of oxygens, but this cumane molecule is, is much more energetic. Those eight carbons are forced into awkward bond angles. You get lots of energy out from that from that strain. If you have this with an idle mix of an oxidizer, you're going from an unstable molecule all, all the way to something stable, whereas here, this is quite stable, so you're not going to get a whole lot of energy out. So even though you're going to the same amount of carbon dioxide, the same amount of carbon at the end of the reaction, you're not starting from something very unstable. You're starting from something stable, so you don't get a whole lot more energy out. When you have only a limited amount of stuff to work with and you want the most energy out per gram or something like that, suddenly cubanes become very attractive because they're a hydrocarbon source that's very energy dense. So, so how, how can we make it? How are we approaching this? Traditionally, this is thought as being way too hard, and that's because most people reference the classic 1962 synthesis, which uses some quite exotic reagents and stuff like that. But over the years, it's actually been refined, and different papers come out, and they refine each step. But there's really two papers, one in the late 90s and one in 2011. They're both actually from uh, Victoria in Australia from the CSIRO. So yes, Australian chemistry. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to make it an approachable synthesis. First one from, came out in the 1990s, which is an a lab scale synthesis and the one in 2011 is a pilot scale synthesis so what they're trying to do is they're trying to say how can we make five kilos of cubane at once and that's the sort of approach that you know like ligma aldrich will, will take on so then they can start selling it they can make 500 you know not 500 but like five kilos in a batch so that drives the price down makes it commercially available for everyone so what i've done here is i've drawn up the synthetic pathway from uh basically from the 2011 paper and in blue there's some um slight changes from the 1997 lab scale paper we're going to obviously be doing it on the lab scale we're not going to be doing it liters and liters scale because that pilot scale paper is uh, it's quite threatening to read actually when they do like oh yes just adding in 2.3 kilos of sodium hydroxide and eight liters of methanol you're kind of like Ugh. 
But what you'll notice about the synthesis is, is first of all, when you first glance at it, it looks really complicated because you've got these weird structures and that sort of thing and what's going on here and my drawing really doesn't help. But really, when you start looking at it closer, you start realizing that, hey, look at the reagents they're using. There's bromine, dioxane, sodium hydroxide, methanol, sulfuric acid, and hydrochloric acid, and, and that's about it. Most complicated uh, reagent they're using really is, is the solvent dioxane here. There's nothing that they're using that I don't already own and is, is not really an approachable lab home lab chemical. Um, so the pilot scale paper starts from this um, diether here, but the lab scale paper from the 90s starts one step back at this um, cyclopentanone. And you might remember that I made cyclopentanone a couple of weeks ago. I, I don't know how long, however long ago. I'm sure it was more than a couple of weeks at this point from adipic acid. So this step we've actually already done. <laughs> um, so we turned adipic acid, which is a food preservative, into our cyclopentanone. And then we're using the cyclopentanone, we're acted with ethylene glycol to form this diether here. Then bromine to put these bromine groups on here. This is actually a Diels Alder reaction because we're pulling off these bromines which kind of forms these uh, double bonds here and, and so two of these molecules will react together in, in what's a, what's a Diels Alder reaction um, which is you know a real classic uh, you know exam question type reaction and then uh, sulfuric acid just just to pull some um, those really protecting groups off. And then what's interesting here is we've got a UV reaction. Now I've never done a re UV reaction. There's been quite a few requests for one. We do some photolysis here, sort of cyclize the molecule a little more to start forming a cube. And then they're just using um, sodium hydroxide and, and methanol and, and some acids and, and they form the, the dimethyl ester of the uh, the carboxylate. They do that just for purification. Apparently this one's very easy to purify because they can purify it by sublimation. Once you purify it, you can just um, cleave the the ester groups and, and you've got your final product. So it's quite different than the 1962 synthesis. It doesn't start from a dipic acid. It starts, I think there's a double bond here, which is much less approachable because we can't just make that from a food preservative that I got from Amazon. Really, it's actually strangely approachable. There is of course many many small catches, little subtleties, um, you know things that we're gonna have to try, new, new things, things that are really gonna test us out in the lab here. For example in uh, going from here to here there's a there's a vacuum distillation which I'm not sure we can get around. Haven't done a vacuum distillation. This UV source here wants a UVB line so we're gonna have to get a mercury lamp but like a medium pressure one or, or maybe just filter it out with some borosilicate and just use a three 11 line or so, I, I don't know, anyway, it's, it, all of these steps are quite interesting, but amazingly, it's actually quite approachable. And so it'd be really great to get, have just a few grams of this final product here, um, this cubane, and then we can think about what we do afterwards. It could all be a complete disaster and I might never finish it. If you have any suggestions, I've obviously linked the two papers in the description and, and Zoll obviously working towards a main channel video where we look at some cubanes and that probably won't be made for a long time. There's obviously gonna be quite a few videos <laughs> coming along in this, but um, I'm really looking forward to do some really cool organic chemistry. Hopefully it doesn't all go bloody yellow or tar up. Or I, I think it's all gonna go yellow at every step. <laughs> knowing this sort of organic chemistry, but can you feel my enthusiasm? I think I can. I feel like I'm enthusiastic. Um, yeah. All right, here we are again. Another, uh, I mean, it's vaguely sunny. I was promised that it wouldn't rain today, but I still don't trust it. So we're going to go undercover here. I'm going to try and rush through today because it's winter solstice pretty much. So it's like the shortest day of the year. So we don't have much light. And as per usual, I tend to run out of light even on long summer days. So on winter solstice, I'm pretty much guaranteed to be working in blackness before long. Today we're trying to make cyclohexanone. So, no, what? No, we're not. Cyclopentanone. Yeah, look, we're rushing and I'm getting things wrong. So how are we making the cyclopentanone? Well, we have here some magnesium stearate. And you might be asking, how the fuck is he turning magnesium stearate into cyclopentanone? That is a very good question. I have no idea how the fuck we're gonna turn magnesium stearate into cyclopentanone. I didn't even order magnesium stearate. Pretty much the only chemical that I've ordered in the last month or so has been adipic acid. So this must be adipic acid. Well, this is my adipic acid order shipment. So they've either labeled it magnesium stearate just to get around customs or something, or they've just sent me the wrong uh, chemical, which either of them is probably just as likely. So first thing we have to do is actually open our package and see if it's actually the chemical we think it is before we can even start anything else. 
All right, that was the least exciting reveal ever. We just got a package. Inside the package, it says adipic acid. I assume that that magnesium stearate, I think it's a food or a soap preservative, so it just clears customs easier than putting adipic acid. They probably would investigate the package more than just having a soap material, so it's just a... It's just a scam to, well, is it a scam? I don't know. It's a scam that helps me out. Thanks, China, for helping my parcels clear customs. You do feel bad for a lot of suppliers from, like, you know, locally in Australia that I really have to follow these rules exactly. Otherwise, they get big, big fines. Very hard to compete with people who do the stuff like this. So this is a catalytic decarboxylation. I'm fairly sure those are the correct words. And we're following a synthesis from um, Tom's Lab, which if you don't know Tom's Lab is, is a very good channel. Very nice organic synthesis like this. So I'll, I'll link him in the description so you can check out Tom's Lab channel. And we're gonna be following it pretty much exactly, I, I believe, I mean, why not? It worked well for him, so maybe it will work well for us. And for that, we need barium hydroxide. And I'm fairly sure I have barium hydroxide. Should be somewhere around either... Oh, where did I... Oxides? No. Ba oh, there it is. Look at that. Bases sort of cupboard. Look at me go. I just like flexing that I can actually locate things. Tom's lab does a 100 gram scale. We're going to do a 200 gram scale. So he does 100 grams of adipic acid and 5 grams of barium hydroxide. I like how I'm saying he does this, he does this. So if everything goes wrong, I can just be like, it was Tom's lab. He did it. As if I somehow lack the ability to, to double check things. Uh, anyway, whatever. 200 grams of adipic acid and, and 10 grams of barium hydroxide. I think I've got enough of that. Yep, that's fine. Don't touch the poisons without the gloves. Set it up for simple distillation. I've started heating. There's some water coming off around the top here, and that's what we expect. We expect a bit of water to come off. I might change that flask later on, but we're gonna have to redistill, which is why I've got no nice head here. It's just that corner piece and no temperature control. We'll, uh, we'll work that out. Hold on, I should turn on that condenser water. Um, I need this one there. So this will probably need heating for uh, a little while, quite a few hours, potentially. The big concern is we don't want to sublime off too much adipic acid. We don't want it to clog, but we also don't want it to come over. If it's starting to come over, I can change this out for a different head, but I've just put this head in here for uh, efficiency. It's just a corner piece so we don't lose any like heat or have any reflux going on. We should just have our product just coming over. It will probably be a little bit more contaminated than if I was using a nice head. Once again, we are redistilling it. So I'm going for efficiency here. We're fucking speed running this synthesis safely. All the adipic acid has melted, which of course it has, uh, because it has a melting point of 152. Let it go for a little while. Hopefully um, the stuff coming over is water, not uh, adipic acid, although it's getting a little cloudy here, so. Ah, I don't know. Fuck it. It should be all right. It doesn't seem to be boiling very nicely, so I might chuck some fucking boiling stones in there, like rocks or something just to help that boil, because it doesn't look like it's, looks like it's on the verge of bumping. Okay, usually I blame the chemistry for uh, going yellow, but this time it was it was definitely me. It was a perfectly clear melt until I added some literal rocks into it, and uh, and then it turned yellow. So so the yellow here is due to me adding some rocks, <laughs> but shouldn't affect it. The yellow shouldn't come over. The yellow shouldn't spread, although it probably will, knowing me. It's uh, acting a little violent, and I think that's because it's the melt is like, you know, 180 degrees or something like that, and it's producing water, and if that water refluxes down and then hits that hot melt, then it's kind of flash boiling. Hopefully it, it should calm down, you, you would hope. Otherwise, this is going to be one rocky distillation. Yeah, she'll be right. All right, I covered the flask in foil because everyone knows if you can't see the bad stuff happening, then it definitely just isn't happening, so... Um, good, we've stopped it now because I can't see it. It's a little concerning in there with stalactite, stalagmites. We maybe should run at a lower reaction temperature here in the pot so we have less adipic acid coming over, but that's some very summer solstice thinking. So we're going the winter solstice method where we go hard, just fuck things up, but quickly.
appears I wasn't given this uh, desolation the time, love and care it deserves. Went and spewed some acid over. Well, I think it's just been subliming it over, but the pot temperature probably got a little hot. Um, it's a little bit threatening how close this is to clogging. I probably should do something about this. Lord, oh Lord, that's, that's, a, that's a narrow point with a lot of bloody acid forced into it. So, ah, there's a saying we have in chemistry. She'll be right. Damn miracle we finished our distillation look at that we've got actual product it looks all good all that's left in the flask here is a little bit of tar and delicious barium hydroxide so that's looking great I mean that's great that's an achievement in of itself but really the real miracle is it's still daylight we still have like half an hour of sunlight left so I might actually even pack this up without it going dark have I improved have I learned from my mistakes look it's looking like it Although it's more likely to be just pure luck. Thank you, Tom's Lab. I haven't finished yet. I still have potential to crack everything and drop everything in the ground, so I won't make too much grand statements yet. We didn't clog it, although we came threateningly close. So uh, there's some lost yield here with all the acid that came over, but hey, look, we're not taking away from the fact that we've sped run this enough that, that I don't have to <laughs> pack this up in the middle of the night. So, um, you know, hey, hey, I'm taking my achievements where I can bloody well get them. So I've got two fractions here, and I say fractions, uh, but that implies that I had some sort of temperature control and I didn't. I just thought I was having water over the, at the front here, and I just thought I'd switch out the flask, but, but on closer inspection, it looks like it's mostly cyclopentanone with a little bit of uh, water at the bottom, which is collecting all that uh, powdered acid. I will combine these two and then we'll, we'll have to do a lot of chemical cleanup and then a redistillation. But hey, I can stop now and actually have a, I've gone on about this too much, right? We get it, Tom. You managed to do one simple distillation in one day, all right? We get it, okay? Calm the fuck down. Here we are the next day and we've got a lot of uh, acid crystallizing out here, which is fine. I mean, it's all lost yield. I wouldn't be surprised if all the water's been kind of sucked into that adipic acid there. Wow, this, this sunbeam coming through is really bad. Winter is really not the best time for me to film for several issues. I mean, it gets wet, there's less sun, you know, it rains, it gets dark, but definitely the sun lining up with the entranceway of this door here. And I, if, even if I shut that door, then it leaves that gap at the top there. Makes it bad for filming at these sunbeams all the way through. In, in summer, it doesn't line up so bad, so it doesn't like perfectly shine on these things. But anyway, sorry, I'm just griping about winter a lot in this video. There's still probably a lot of acid dissolved in here, so I'm just gonna have to do a base wash here in a separatory funnel and then uh, dry it somewhat before our distillation. We really wanna get as much acid out as we can chemically so that none of it comes over in the distillation. All right, I added some distilled water just to wash out some of the acid initially, and it's all formed one nice clean layer. So we either have one, everything that we've distilled over and collected is water, <laughs> which would be a very big disappointment and also very surprising. And the other option, which is far more likely, is that uh, the water's just dissolving in the cyclo um, pentanone. I'm just forgetting the name of the compound every time that we're making. The water's dissolving in the cyclopentanone, along with all the acid and everything like that. It's all just dissolving into one mix. So I've got some uh, sodium carbonate here and adding it should neutralize the acid, but also force that water layer out. So usual practice is just a shake and vent now, but there's no way I'm sealing this up with this much gas generation from so much acid. We're just gonna let this sit for a little while and hopefully um, it sorts itself out. You can already see it's kind of, look kind of oily, but that's that water phase separating out. Yeah, look at it go, see it phase separating out. So yes, we're just gonna let this go and I'm gonna go have a, a, a cheese toasty. That sounds like a bloody, a, a good step in this synthesis and feel like some bread and cheese, you know? much liquid as we have left. I used a lot of uh, neutralizing solution. There's just a lot of acid. So much so that there's probably worth recovering that sodium adipate 
from uh, that solution. Then we can regenerate it back to a dipic acid and add it to the 300 grams we have left over. And uh, I'm just gonna run this through a simple distillation. If there's any acid left, well, there might even be still be some acid left, um, that should stay in the pot because the, the pot temperature doesn't have to get too hot now because we only have to boil over the uh, cyclopentanone. And remember the name that time. as much as we can get out of there because it's getting really ugly there in the boiling flask and it's making my product turn ever so slightly yellow. You can even see a little bit of a gradient. See at the top there, it's a little bit yellow. So it's just starting to yellow up and tar up and, and come over and contaminate my beautiful product. Because, yeah, ah, oh, there's half, there's fuck all in there, right? Yeah, no, that's that's cool. Product looks good, so no complaints. Let's just weigh it, determine a yield, and um, everybody gets to go home. All right, so there's 54.8 grams, and that's, I, I don't actually know what the percentage yield of that is, but I say it's kind of okay-ish. Um, I don't know where we lost a lot of the stuff. I think we did lose a bit of stuff in the neutralization. We lost a little bit of the distillation here. A lot of it came over with the water. I should have used my bloody fancier head with a fractionating column a little bit inbuilt. Would have had that separation between the water and the cyclopentanone uh, much more distinct. We don't need a particularly dry fry application anyway, so she'll be right. Anyway, we've turned what is basically a food preservative that's easily shipped from overseas into a, a flammable liquid. Thanks you all for watching and I'll see you all next time. task today is to make that dye ether at the end there. This is our end product. And it's a reasonably simple reaction. I don't think it's too complicated and we're copying it basically directly from our text. Uh, there's, there's a little few changes. So we're acting this ketone here with ethylene glycol, which is, you know, there's two carbons with the two uh, alcohol groups on the end of it. And this is a reasonably common reaction because it's kind of a protecting group in a sense. To so say you had this molecule and you had a double bond, say here, and you wanted to do some sort of chemistry to this, so say add some sort of group you're going to have some trouble because under most circumstances that ketone group is going to react with whatever you want to react with this first because it's more reactive so what you can do is you can kind of put this protecting group so put this group on there form that ether then you can do this reaction on this group down here because this is not going to react and then later on you can have some conditions to remove this and then put that back on there plus your extra little group on down there which is basically exactly what we're doing but in this case we're actually attacking alkanes here so i'm fairly sure put bromide groups sort of along the molecule and we can't react this raw cyclopentanone with the bromine because it's just going to attack that ketone group this is sort of where it comes from it's quite a common reaction to um use ethylene glycol as a protecting group for a um ketone so a lot of you organic chemistry wizards out there will be familiar with these reaction conditions what we're using is toluene uh because we're forming water in this reaction right and we need some way of driving this reaction forward so we need to remove water continuously from the reaction so that the reaction will keep going forward because if the water builds up then it will just go back the other way and you know we might have 10 percent yield or something like that whereas if we can continue to remove water that reaction is going to get forced that way toluene is a chemical i can't pronounce very well and haven't used all that much but it's very useful in this circumstance because it has an azeotrope with water so that is uh it's going to boil in the presence of water earlier than it would without the uh, the water there, so at a, at a lower temperature. So that water is going to come over with the toluene as we boil it, so it's going to get pulled out azeotropically. And then we're going to collect it in a Dean Stark, which, which I'll get into later on. But yeah, it's a way of having a solvent that's also actually going to drive this reaction forward. Uh, the toluene also has another use as well. Um, we're going to be using sulfuric acid, which is not going to work terribly well for this reaction, I, I think or it might not play terribly nicely, but in the presence of toluene, we can drive this the reaction between sulfuric acid and toluene to form um, powered toluene sulfonic acid, which is PETSA here. 
and that's going to be a strong acid that actually can dissolve in the organic solvents because everything here will dissolve nicely in the toluene except the sulfuric acid so that will play the role as our strong acid to help this reaction along. If I had all the time in the universe to play with I could make the paratolus sulfonic acid thing TSA whatever four hands and then add it in but um, we're going to try and do this all in the bloody one pot and just have the sulfuric acid and and hope it doesn't absolutely murder our reactions reactants reactants hopefully it just doesn't murder everything including me I don't want to get murdered by the sulfuric acid um, but we'll have to see so on paper it's reasonably straightforward I mean it's it's not too bad but there are a lot of little subtleties that we're going to have to take care of and I might list them up all right okay it's not that many steps and I realized I've forgotten the entire step but first of all we need to purify our toluene because it's it's very um uh, low quality fuel grade basically so we're gonna have to we're gonna have to purify that then we're gonna have to run this whole reaction which might take a little while and then finally we're gonna actually have to vacuum distill our product and i think i'm gonna leave that for a future video because we haven't done a vacuum distillation before i haven't really done a vacuum distillation before here and that's a brand new challenge that we're gonna have to gonna have to face the little worry for me is actually if we finish the uh the video here and then we do the vacuum distillation in a later video we won't actually know if the synthesis has worked until after the vacuum distillation because we, we won't be able to tell if we have product or not until after the vacuum distillation which worries me a lot um but uh yeah it leaves us all in suspense um <laughs> so you can watch this video and um and just pray it works so let's get on to it this is my uh, toluene um, I don't have that much left. I was hoping to get some more. This is my litre container. But the store I buy it from has stopped selling it by the litre. You used to be able to just take your own container and they would sell you a litre for $8. But now they don't crack open the 20 litre cylinders that toluene comes in. You have to buy the whole 20 litres yourself and I'm not about to drop $160 on toluene. All we have left is uh, this container here. I just got it out to see how much was there. For this small first step here, we're uh, copying basically exactly a procedure from Doug's lab, which he highlights the fact that a lot of toluene, and I suspect this is the case for this one, contains some methyl thiophene. Thiophene? God, I'm terrible with words. Methyl thiophene. Th which has a very similar boiling point to the toluene. However, in the presence of sulfuric acid, it tends to yellow up and tar up, and we don't want that in our final product or in our reaction mix at all, really. So the idea is to get the yellowing out the way early, and then we could just remove the yellow and hopefully not have yellowing going on later on in our reactions. And we're gonna do that with some uh, sulfuric acid, which will sulfonate the methylthiathene preferentially and um, should leave toluene alone when it's all cold. we did this step that yellowed up a metric fuck ton and a half look at that that's crazy all right well glad we did it uh we're just gonna decant the toluene off ditch the sulfuric acid it's too yellow and then we're just gonna wash this with some bicarb so just stir it over with some bicarb for uh, a little while So we got all our reactants here. The toluene is a little wet. Uh, it's got a little bit of water at the bottom, but it should be fine. We only need 100 to 150 mils, really. Just take that little fraction off and leave that wet stuff behind and process it and put it into storage. We have our cyclopentanone from last video. That's uh, 54 grams. So we'll use, I think we'll use all of that. We have ethylene glycol here. This was in my cupboard, so that's great. Um, I can't remember why I needed this or what I did it for. November 2016, so that's three and a half years ago. I think it had something to do with the plastics video, trying to get benzene from PET. All right, so we need pure ethylene glycol from this ethylene glycol mess. So I lost all the footage for the ethylene glycol distillation. So uh, in summary, it was awful. So I've got a small amount of recovered 
dried ethylene glycol. I'll have to check it, but I'm fairly sure I just do it from antifreeze and it's pretty dry. But yeah, I think it comes from antifreeze. Anyway, we got 48 to 49 grams here and there. I'm just forgetting the numbers already. I just weighed it out. I'm pretty sure it was 49 grams. This is just, uh, you know, drain cleaner, concentrate of sulfuric acid. So we'll use, I don't know, roughly three mils of that or something like that. So we're going to put it all in there and reflux, but we need a special kind of reflux here because we want to remove the water. So I have purchased... A Dean Stark apparatus and I haven't got one of these before because they're really not that like useful But um, when you need one, it's it's really nice to have one. This is huge I saw it and I was like, oh, yeah, buddy 30 mil Dean Stark trap. That's fine. It's huge. That's fucking Ginormous anyway, so this reaction is gonna look fucking weird as because it's gonna be tall as all fuck but Oh well, I'm going to add everything except the ethylene glycol and just set it up to a bit of a reflux to see if we collect a bit of water. It'll be nice to dry it out first without uh, running into the ethylene glycol because we don't want the ethylene glycol reacting with itself to form dioxane. So the more progress we can make without the ethylene glycol in there, the better because then, you know, we're going to have to remove that water anyway before we can start the reaction. So we might as well do it without the ethylene glycol. Not sure if I'm overthinking it or underthinking it or thinking it exactly the appropriate amount. I never know with these videos. Everything's assembled. Uh, it's a little scary, but I think everything's clamped appropriately. We've just got it heating now. I've added a little bit, like uh, maybe a third of the ethylene glycol. I said I wouldn't add any, but I've just chickened out and added like a third of it. Because now the problem is time, because uh, the paper we're following reflux this for 30 hours while collecting the water in the Dean Stark trap, which means I'll probably do it just for all of today and, and maybe another day as well. I'm not sure about 30 hours. We'll be able to monitor the progress by how much water collects in this Dean Stark trap here. I will add the rest of the ethylene glycol at some point, maybe in, in two portions. I just don't want to flood it with ethylene glycol so that it starts reacting with itself. The paper didn't do it, but I'm, I'm a little worried that um, because we're using sulfuric acid rather than uh, you know the acidic resin that that, that might happen. But um, anyway, I got a long while to go, so um, yeah, already going yellow. Uh, developing a bit of a red crust around the outside. I'm not sure you can see that very well. You're dissolving into the solution and forming that orangey yellow color in there. So I do wonder if the ketones are doing something weird together because it's not enough ethylene glycol, which is a concern. Um, so I'm just going to put the rest of the ethylene glycol in as per the paper did it all at the start. Maybe there was a reason for that. <laughs> um, uh, oh well. Yeah, look, I'll just, just chuck it all in now and um, hopefully it's all fine. about all the time I have today to do this reflux. It's looking a bit black. Yeah, okay, it's black now. It was kind of a, a yellow and then it went a bit ready, but now it's now it's definitely black. Um, so hopefully it hasn't tied up. I mean, there's just some tar in there. 
but hopefully we do have some product. I still think there's quite a bit of water to come out of this, so there's still a bit of the reaction to push along. So I'm gonna come back another day in a couple of days and, and restart this. You can see it hasn't phase separated perfectly, but you can see a line here where this is all basically water and this is all sort of toluene. So I'm gonna take this out now and just weigh it. I realize that the markings are on the other side. <laughs> I put this around the other way, I should be should be going that way rather than this way. Anyway, I'm gonna weigh this so we can work out just how much water we've taken out so far and we can kind of roughly work out how much longer the reaction has to go. So it's 25 grams of uh, liquid we've collected. Looking a little bit weird, but uh, it's mostly water. So we'll just, we'll just call it 25 mils of water. All right, we're back again after my uh, reasonably questionable decision to leave this setup for a couple of days until I next had some free time to do some stuff. But yes, we return here with our awfully tire looking uh, reaction pot. I've just started a refluxing again. It hasn't been refluxing for four days. It's fine. Don't worry. Calm down. I ran the calculations and we should only be producing about 15 mils of water from our two reactions, both the uh, toluene reacting with the sulfuric acid and the ether formation. And we've already produced, say, uh, I can't remember, it was about, it was 25 mils, right? So we collected 25 mils, we should only be producing 15. That's a bad sign. Our products could be especially wet. But um, I also have no idea where the end point is. We're just going to have to keep going until we don't see any more water coming over. And we can't rely on any theoretical calculations about where that should be. We're just going to do the entirely practical approach. Yeah, you can still see some water droplets sink there. So we are still getting some water through into the trap. Uh, it's coming over a bit weird. I don't know what that's all about. It's all a bit cloudy. It's up here too. Um, so... Don't know what's up with that, but uh, yeah, we're just going to have to keep monitoring this until we get no more of those water droplets sinking. It's hard to think how it could look any worse than it does currently. I suppose it could all actually char up and it could just be activated carbon by the time we're finished. Um, but, fuck knows. Alright, it's been refluxing for a total of 8 hours now, and I know 8 hours is a lot short of the 30 hours recommended to us, but there really isn't a lot more water coming over. The top of that tape to that top of the line there is how much water it produced in the last hour. You can see some drops come through occasionally if we wait here long enough. Um, it's like every 40 seconds or so. Yeah, there's one, right? But it, but it doesn't really add a whole lot to it, so... I ideally, of course, I'd just let this run for, you know, overnight or something, but I just don't have the time. Because <laughs> uh, what I want to do now is I want to take off the rest of the toluene, uh, see if there's any dioxane that comes off. I, I mean, I could sort of, like, pretend to distill it through this if I just, like, left the tap open and I could just distill off the toluene. But we have no temperature control and it shouldn't be too much effort just to, to, to change this setup to a simple distillation setup. And then we can see what we're left with. So thanks, Dean Stark. You've been helpful, but uh, the time is up now. It's time to time to move on. All right, I've quickly set this up for distillation, and I realized I've forgotten an entire step. There's a step in the middle where, um, after the Dean Stark, it's then um, neutralized so that uh, um, there's no more sulfuric acid in there. Fuck, what do I do at this point? Um, look, it was fine refluxing before... Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna let it go. Uh, maybe it's to, to stop dioxane formation now, but, um, we're just gonna take off a little bit of solvent and then, uh, <laughs> leave that other set for the neutralization and then the rest of the toluene we can get rid of during the vacuum distillation. So we'll just remove, uh, the bulk of the solvent without, um, trying to boil it dry or anything like that. Off well, roughly 50 mils of toluene, toluene, toluene. Yep, yeah, that's fine. We could have taken more off, but I reckon I'll err on the safe side. Everything's still in solution here. We've just got to do a little bit of washing just to remove the sulfuric acid before our vacuum distillation. I assume it's to stop the sulfuric acid coming over with the product when you vacuum distill. So we'll uh, do that in the next episode. I'm sorry to split this into two parts, but otherwise things just get too long. I reckon, buddy, place your bets in the comments. What's our percentage yield? And no guessing a percentage yield of zero because that's that's too easy to guess, right? Assuming we have some yield, what's the uh, what's the percentage yield? And I'll 
buddy, I'll PayPal the winning guest two dollars. How's that? That's incentive. I <laughs> don't know what I'm doing. It's two dollars though. It's two Australian dollars, which is like a dollar fifty US. But correctly guess what our percentage yield will be of the ether after vacuum distillation. All right. I'll see you next time. Really excited about it. Solution in the flask here is uh, pretty gross, pretty tarry, yeah. Look how much it sticks to the walls. So it's a bit thick. It's never what we want to see, really. We, we never want a thick solution. We know there's a lot of acid in there, so uh, our next step is really put it in the SEP funnel and do washings with sodium hydroxide solution. It's really just neutralizing it. But because we've got so much acid in this <laughs> really uh, thick solution here, I'm just going to be adding some uh, sodium carbonate to this flask here, and we'll stir it around and let it get uh, most of the acid out that way. Oh yeah, there's no reaction. We should be expecting that because um, there's no water in here at all. We've driven all the water out uh, with the Dean Stark. You can see that that solid is down the bottom. It can't really react because um, it needs the water to react. We assume that all the sulfuric acid has migrated into the toluene as paratoluene sulfonic acid, you know, PTSA or whatever. It's gone this uh, uh, milky coffee kind of color. And I think that's because the paratolosulfuric acid, wow, parasulfonic acid, fucking whatever. TSA is, is precipitating out as a TSA hydroxide. Hydrate? Hydrate. Wow, I really need to learn some chemistry. And PTSA hydrate is, is precipitating out. We don't want any of that solid, really. We're gonna have to think of some way of removing it. Yeah, okay, that's an interesting thought. Problem basically solved itself because that is phase separated perfectly. So we want that top layer, the the tarry looking one, and the bottom layer with the precipitate is uh, what we don't want because that's the PTSA. So um, we'll use the set funnel uh, and we'll do a couple more washes just with sodium hydroxide solution and then a brine just to try and dry that top layer before we go to the vacuum distillation. I'll crack out my set funnel wherever the fuck that is hiding. Look at that, I added just enough water so that's pretty much exactly fits in my set funnel, you know. I may make blunders constantly, but every once in a while I do something like this. It makes me think, I'm a fucking genius at this. Fucking a savant. is all that's settled out after like an hour of it so uh, uh this is not very good it's not emulsified it's just goddamn thick i put a lot of salt in there to try and drive the water out increase the density of those water droplets so they should sink faster or, or whatever it'll collect and something something polarity something so so i did manage to form a perfect emulsion but i think i've uh, managed to break it it was perfectly emulsified for two days but I think I've broken it with a whole lot more salt and a little bit more uh, toluene. The phase boundary I think is impossible to see in this lighting. I'm going to have to go out in the direct sunlight, which I'm a little nervous about seeing as I drop that cesium on the lawns. We're doing our best not to drop this on the lawn. There. I cannot see that on the phone screen at all, but maybe I can increase the contrast. Thanks editing Tom for uh, putting that in and that's the line there. So we want this top layer here and we get rid of the bottom layer there. Just one final brine wash. I'm going to shake this very gently. In fact, I'm not going to shake. I'm just going to swirl it together. I hope for the best. to get all the water and all the soap hydroxide out. Just left with a horrible tarry uh, toluene layer. We haven't done a vacuum distillation in uh, years. I don't think ever really with this equipment. I have vague memories of me trying one years ago with like a vacuum cleaner. And if I can find the footage...
but really it's it's quite a big unknown so rather than just jump straight to our precious substrate what we've got here is just some water so we're just going to be boiling some water you know we should be able to tell what our vacuum strength is right because we know water boils at 100 degrees obviously at room pressure but you know we don't know what pressure our vacuum pulls this is a, a shitty vacuum pump well it's not it's not that shitty but it's i, I don't mind if it gets ruined uh, over time because it's not it's not my big precious high vacuum pump so it's just a, a little ebay 12 volt pump um it's got a brand new power supply thank you everyone from that um video before whatever video that was um that recommended that i need a better power supply because it was stalling because it wasn't getting enough current so now i've got a, a power supply that gives it more current so if we plug this in pulling a vacuum on on this i'll work out a way for that to make less of a racket but yeah see all these joints are tight i, I grease them i very rarely grease my joints which i can't tell is laziness or efficiency but now with the vacuum on um the, the joints are all all sealed i can't get them apart so we are pulling a vacuum on there so we'll slowly heat the water and see the what temperature it boils over i need the thermometer in there but yeah So I've got a tiny piddly little stir bar in there which uh, isn't helping, it's bumping <laughs> quite significantly there. But it appears to be working fine and a key bit of information here is that our temperature is 66 degrees. So now using that we can calculate uh, what our pressure is here in this system. Probably get better pressures out, we use a different uh, line here but uh, this might be enough, you know, at least this way. It's not uh, getting water through the pump but... <laughs> Boiling at 65 degrees water means our pressure inside the system is 181 uh, mercuries. Mercuries? What the fuck? 181 millimetres of mercury. The paper uses, I think, what? It's like 23 millimetres of mercury. And the boiling point of the compound is 59 to 60 something degrees. So we can put those numbers into our system and say, well, what would the boiling point be if it's at 181 millimetres of mercury? And we see that it's about 110 degrees, which, you know, is not too high. I mean, it's the temperature it's been subjected to during its uh, Dean Stark reflux anyway. Even though 181 millimetres of mercury is a lot higher than their uh, pressure that they're using, I still think we can get away with it. All right, here we are. We're nearly ready for our vacuum distillation. This is our solution. If you've forgotten what it looks like, um, it looks pretty bad. But uh, we'll, we'll run that through the distillation now. We know there's a little bit of toluene left over, so we need to take some fractions, which is going to be annoying. What's also as annoying is that I broke the bloody connection on uh, the vacuum pump, so I've got to resolder that and um, uh, a few other things. But apart from that, we'll... all right, well, I've repaired that badly, but at least it's repaired. The next thing to repair is uh, this. Why is my stirring not working? Oh, I got a stir bar in there and uh, it's not stirring and I tried a different stir bar and it's still not stirring. So, um, <sighs> all right, I'll take this apart as well. Yeah, sure. All right, all right, all right. All right, it's still spinning. So why is it not spinning the stir bar? Hmm. All right, so this is a magnet here and uh, and we can see it it's spinning. You can see it doesn't really spin the spin the stir bar unless the stir bar is really really close to it. Basically touching it. So why is the magnet so weak all of a sudden? All right, I've come to the conclusion that the heating mantle is fine and the problem is all my oval stir bars are all absolutely trash magnets. I couldn't even like <laughs> retrieve this stir bar with a magnet. I had to use this grippy retrieval tool. You know, I had a magnet retrieval tool. It didn't even can't even pick it up ah, and that was the case for the other oval stir bars I, I tried as well so um we're using a, <laughs> a better stir bar and now i reckon if we plug this all in and turn the stirring on look it actually stirs all right ah so i don't have any good oval stir bars um but the straight ones kind of work okay ish now if nothing else decides to uh play up and be weird i'm going to set up for the vacuum distillation finally we're up and running uh we've got our nice high vacuum grease on all the joints we've got our tar solution in there it's heating it's stirring nicely uh, we're pulling somewhat of a vacuum thermometer in there it's currently nine degrees which is fucking cold for where i am it's fucking freezing i'm dying when our first fraction comes over i don't know what temperature there's going to be because i don't really know what pressure it is in this system uh exactly but you know the first fraction is just going to be solvent so we're just going to be waiting for that first fraction to come over then the temperature should rise somewhat and then we'll have to take off the vacuum change over the flask put it back under vacuum and then continue heating it for that second fraction which should be our product
I was really hoping to get this uh, next bit over, but I just can't get it distilling over very well at all. Uh, maybe my vacuum pressure is just not high enough. It's really starting to decompose. Got this whole fraction here, which I'm pretty sure is just our solvent. Really nothing is coming over of this. I, I, I don't know whether the fractionating column was a good choice for this then. It's really, really looking very tar-like in that flask. It's uh, getting dark, but I reckon we're done here. Everything's uh, cooled down. Uh, you can see uh, um, it's starting to tar up through the, through the column. Uh, I was distilling off that horrible brown liquid. Uh, I haven't broken any equipment, so, so that's good, but um, freezing my ass off in this fucking experiment. So we get to calculate our yield now, and, and there was a lot of bets of people uh, putting bets on for how much uh, our yield percentage yield was, and, and, and thank you for all the comments. I feel really bad because uh, no one was correct, because I didn't let you guess 0%. This is just our solvent. This is our reaction pot, and it looks exactly how a lot of you suspected it would look. Is what we call tar. <laughs> look at that. That's absolutely fucked. So a lot of you suspected this would happen, and uh, that's because I made a mistake in the synthesis. Um, well, I mean, I was overthinking a little. I didn't want to produce any dioxane, so I held off the ethylene glycol, and I put the sulfuric acid, the toluene, and the cyclopentanone in the flask and heated it up minimal ethylene glycol to start with. I think I put a third in near the start. The problem with that is that there's another side reaction and that's an aldol condensation. Two different cyclopentone molecules can react under acidic conditions. Those two can then react with a further ketone molecule. So it can keep going and going and going. What you get is this huge condensation reaction and the result is uh, tar. And a classic sign is this red tinge here. That's a classic sort of aldol condensation sign. It's, it's not a yellow, it's a red. So I'm not gonna start hating on red, but it was a, it was a mistake we should have seen coming. And and I might have got away with it as well if I hadn't used such a huge amount of sulfuric acid. I think I used four to five mils. And honestly, it's about 10 times as much as I should have used. Way overdone. And, and that really contributed to this aldol condensation side reaction. So the ethylene glycol gets washed out during the washing steps and uh, cyclopentanone ends up as tar. So this project is far from over. We're, we're just going to go back and, and, and redo it all again. I'll have to make new cyclopentanone. I'll have to make new ethylene glycol. Our second attempt should be heaps better. There's so many suggestions from you. All these little subtle things that I should be doing or maybe think about or maybe can avoid doing that should help stuff out so our next run should be should be very very good and i will be honoring everyone's bets because <laughs> there was a lot of optimistic bets like in the 60 to 70 percent range uh, and our final synthesis when we finally do get some cyclopentanone ether um i will be honoring those bets <laughs> i think i gotta work out a way to clean this fucking flask We have tried this reaction before. In the previous episode, we had some old ethylene glycol and we had made this cyclopentanone before and we attempted to make this compound, which we need overall for our cubane synthesis. I'm referring to it as, as a key towel. We tried this before and it didn't work. There was lots and lots of comments. A lot of you um, had, had a lot of very helpful suggestions on things I could do a lot better for this reaction. So we're trying it again. I'm out of this <laughs> compound, so we have to make this again. I'm pretty much out of ethylene glycol, so we have to make this or extract this. The toluene needs purification, so I've got to purify that. We need to purify our toluene, we need to make more cyclopentanone, we need to gather more ethylene glycol, we need to do all this reaction, and then we need to do a vacuum distillation. Yes, on the second attempt, we should be much better at this. All right. All right, we've got um, the distillation toluene underway. I've put some sulfuric acid in there, and it's, it's disgusting, so hopefully that'll take out a lot of the color once again. It's coming over looking looking filthy, honestly, and that's a bit of a shame. It's 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 fine all through here, uh, so I don't I don't know what's up with that. It's just black in there now. So hopefully we've stripped any um, non-toluene components out, you know, and, and I chucked away the um the first bit of the fraction of the toluene. So so we should have a much more pure solvent than than what we had before. We've got the psychopentanone. Is it? Psycho psychopentanone, yes, that's that's it. I keep forgetting its name every time. I was gonna run this distillation at the same time, but I remembered I only have one pump now. I mean I have two pumps, but I, I lent one of the pumps out to a friend for his home brew uh, distillation, so that's a noble cause. His rum tasted awful, but I'm hearing reports that his vodka is, is better than his rum, so I will reap the rewards of that eventually. All right, things are working much better with the fractionating column in it um, compared to last time. We're not getting uh, nearly as much acid over looking much better. So, so we'll probably get much better yield <laughs> compared to last time. So, so things do improve on, on the second run. The catch with the fractionating column is, is really the speed. It's so slow. It's been hours. <sighs> this is going to be another one of those times. I pack up in the dark, isn't it? It's going to be late for dinner, but um, at least the yield will be higher. So 
So much yield. So much yield. I am so late for dinner. My lord. Look at that. Don't look at that pentagon. That's the worst pentagon I've drawn in my life. Ah, yield. All right. It's not even late at all. Not even... Oh, God, I'm hungry. One thing to notice is the uh, the lack of acid that's crystallized out here. In our last synthesis, we um, had a lot of acid crystallize out of this step, but it looks like we've done the conversion much more efficiently this time, and there's not so much acid coming out. So we're not going to have to use so much sodium carbonate for the neutralization, um, but uh, we'll still have to add some because we want to phase separate the water here. Distillation of the cyclopentanone. After we've got that water fraction over, we've lost a little bit. That's our fraction with the water in it. It's like 50-50 water cyclopentanone. But um, this fraction now is, is water free, it's coming over 126, so it's, it's uh, great. Oh, the thermometer's a little low. Yep, yeah, just like last time, there's a tiny little bit of sort of tarry stuff at the bottom, and we've let it go on for just slightly too long, so the top you can see is a little bit more yellow than the bottom, so it's just starting to yellow come over, so instead of being perfectly clear, we've now got a little bit of yellow. All good, once again. I, I just like turning on the camera and, and praising how good I'm doing. It's just like, yeah, look at me go. Alright, that's the update. Cool. Thanks. And here's our yield, we've got 114 grams, which is a 72% yield. So we started with 275 grams of dipic acid rather than last time we started with 200, I believe. A lot better than last time. It's, it's a lot drier too, by the looks of it. The last one had the odd water droplet down the bottom. I, I still don't think it's completely dry, but um, there's no water droplets visible in it. Yes, fantastic, fantastic. All right, what else do we need to continue this on? Final piece of the puzzle is our ethylene glycol. So we have here some um, car coolant. Uh, it's a concentrated stuff, so there's not much water. It's pretty much all ethylene glycol. There's a little bit of something else in there, according to the MSDS. Um, we're just going to distill the ethylene glycol out. The water should come over first. There'll be residual water. The difficulty with this is uh, ethylene glycol tends to bump quite violently from, from previous experience because it's got a boiling point of 199 quite high boiling point so so we got strong stirring and I'm going to put some of the uh, magic ingredient in there which is sand and hopefully the sand as well as strong stirring will uh, prevent a lot of bumping I, I think I might run a short path condenser anyway get crank out the uh, the short path hopefully we don't get any of this dye over because it is ludicrously green okay I forgot how short this short path condenser is I know it's got short in the name but like how, how am I how, how, how am I attaching a flask to, to this <laughs> doesn't reach over the side of the <laughs> fucking broke it didn't I <sighs> all right this is going fine honestly um, yeah 200 mils or so a bit of water that came over first we were very conservative you know I'm just checking away all this hundred mils here really even though there's probably less than 10 mils of water in it everything is going all fine all right we have everything assembled we have our hobby car fuel which we um re-distilled and is somewhat dry decomposed food preservative distilled and it looks all good we've got a heap of that our car coolant which we've distilled i'm not sure it's dry but we'll do that that in a second and we have our drain cleaner which um, we're going to use as is. I think we're only going to add a tiny amount of the drain cleaner to our hobby car fuel. I'm going to say maybe like 0.2 mils, like six drops. And I reckon we'll use all of the hobby car fuel and the car coolant in excess to the decomposed food preservative. Apart from the change in amount of sulfuric acid compared to last time, another major change we're doing is the order in which we do things. So what we're going to do is we're going to reflux the toluene and the sulfuric acid first in the Dean Stark setup to form the paratolu sulfonic acid in situ first and then we'll add our reactants and that way we're not exposing the cyclopentanone to the sulfuric acid directly because that's really what I think drove all those side reactions that ended up with our reaction turning into tar. Maybe we'll dry these out a little bit more so when we add them in we, we, we have no water and any water we create from then it will be just from the reaction and, and it shouldn't interfere with things too much. I'm not sure that makes sense, but we're just going to go ahead and do that. It also allows us to see how much of the tar is coming just from the toluene because we've done a sulfuric acid wash. I distilled it over sulfuric acid each time it, it you know, turned to color and, and went a little bit tarry. So hopefully having distilled it over sulfuric acid, there isn't much of that left whatever is in the toluene that's causing it to, to tar up in the presence of acid. But um, no promises.
Right, so while we're refluxing the sulfuric acid and the toluene, why don't we pre-dry our two reagents with um, some molecular sieves? If we really dry out our two reactants before we add them into the toluene with the paratolosulfuric acid, it won't ship that equilibrium back to form sulfuric acid too much. I have quite a few molecular sieves in various states of uh, dryness and cleanliness because I tend to reuse sieves, which is something a real lab doesn't do, by the way. <laughs> a real lab seizes is disposable, um, but so I don't run a real lab. I run a terrible lab in a shitty shed, so um, I reuse my sieves. These ones are clean. Um, they're also dry. I just cannot get the lid off the jar <laughs> because they were dry when I put them in the jar. You can see that vacuum thing is down and now I can't open the jar. So <laughs> I will spend the next couple of minutes trying to open this jar. I'm not going to feel myself struggling to open a jar because that will make me feel insecure. Actually, no, these sieves reek of sulfur. <laughs> um, so I, that's probably why they're in this jar. Probably because I can't bring myself to throw them out even though I should. So we're going to use um, this jar which has dried written on it in um, very scrubbed off text. So not the most promising, but um, we'll re-dry them and at least they don't reek. So it's a start. All right, I preheated these in the microwave and quite a bit of water came off. They're very, very hot. But to get the last of the water off, I'm just gonna put it under a bit of mild vacuum. I haven't really done this before. Don't tend to use sieves too much. I have this running joke that every time sieves appear in a video, the video doesn't make it to air. And I've made that joke at least three times now about the running joke and the things not making it to, air, to air, but that joke's never made it to air either. And I'm fairly sure I've made the joke about that joke not making it to air before, but it's just never made it to air. So we're at least three layers to four layers deep at this point. Let's see what happens when we chuck this vacuum on. All right, it's been cooling down under the vacuum for quite a while. Um, it's still a little warm. Let's start weighing out our reagents. So we need ethylene glycol and a cyclopentanone. I'm just going to mix them together and put them over these sieves for um, just a little bit before adding them to our flask, which is um, looking concerning, but we'll get back to that in a second. <laughs> So we have our two somewhat dried reagents together and they needed to be added to our solvent and acid and refluxed. Our solvent and acid is looking, I mean, it's bad, but it's not as bad as expected. And, and, and oh, I can't believe I'm saying this, but hopefully the fact that it's tied up on the sides there means there's nothing left to, to react with things. And <laughs> I've turned off the heating a little while ago, so it's, it's cooled down slightly enough so I can pour some stuff in. You can see that's one nice even layer. So we don't have any raw sulfuric acid in there. Should be nice and dry in that flask. Um, maybe I won't add all of it at once. Let's add half of it or so. See if it all tars up instantaneously, in which case we shouldn't really add the other half. Maybe save it for a, a better day. Oh, I forgot to press record. Just pretend I poured half of this in there and that you saw that and it was good cinematography or whatever. Fucking doesn't matter, whatever. Taking the flask off the heating, oh, look at that. It's been heating for a couple of minutes, but why is it phase separated? There's not that much water in there. There's no way there's that much water in there. <sighs> That's not a good sign at all. Why would it do that? Fuck me, what can we do? All right, well, we're supposed to be just gotta heat it and see if it unphase separates, but fuck. Phase separating implies that there's a lot of water at the bottom and that's separating from the toluene because the ethylene glycol and the cyclopentanone should all dissolve in the toluene fine. So, but there's heaps of stuff. Maybe a little bit of water could cause the ethylene glycol to phase separate out. Maybe the ethylene glycol just doesn't want to dissolve initially. I don't like it. Don't like it at all. All right, let's, you know, lambs to the slaughter. Let's go. 
yeah, you can still see that's a little bit translucent, whereas before it was it was really, really black and disgusting. So it looks much better than it did last time. So um, yes, I'm just going to wait for this to cool down, and then we're going to quickly get to the sodium hydroxide washing steps, the neutralization, and the drying out, and then um, we'll do the vacuum station another day. Everything is cooled down. Uh, we've got the sodium hydroxide, just a, a, a weak solution there. And we've got some saturated sodium chloride. Uh, I don't think all this solution is going to fit nicely into my set funnel at the same time. So we might have to do it in, in portions. Other than that, it should be all right. Or well, apart from the fact that I'm going to be very late for dinner. Once again, um, yeah. What the fuck is up with this bottom layer? What is this? All right, it's a beautiful day. Got my cup of tea. Um, it's wonderfully sunny and it's a good day for vacuum distillation. In other good news, our product doesn't look like it's decomposed significantly in the week that I've left it here. Always nice to see. I was a little bit worried about it being over the sieves, but um, we'll just filter the sieves off. I've got a little bit of cotton there. All right, this is a vacuum distillation, so we have to talk about pumps. Last time we used our eBay 12 volt vacuum pump, and it wasn't very good. Uh, there was quite a few suggestions in the comments to uh, of how we could improve that setup slightly, because I'm pretty sure all of you agreed it wasn't it wasn't a very optimal setup, and we didn't get a really a strong enough vacuum for what we needed to do. I saw quite a few comments suggesting different pump types I could I could buy and and acquire and do it all. You know, they're they're really helpful. Um, shipping out of China is especially slow, and that's the only source of uh, cheap pumps generally oh, I can get some some stuff locally a couple of suggestions though were to just use my big pump and stop being such a wuss about it I've, I've got a very good pump sure I like to protect it but um, I might as well bloody use it I uh, gotta stop yeah just being a wuss about it it might get some toluene sucked into it but it's an oil based pump it'll cope it's built to cope even if the whole thing gets sucked in there, I could probably just replace the wheel and it'll be fine. There's no point having a good pump and just not using it. So we're going to use it. We're not going to crank it all the way up to max vacuum because um, that's quite a lot. That This is what adjusts vacuum pressure in this line here. Um, we've got a trap of sorts here. It's not an excellent trap, but um, I'll fill this up with ice. It's not that cold, so it won't do that good. <laughs> um, but uh, it'll do something, I'm hoping. It's leaking oil, it's still leaking oil. I never fix that leak, so it's slowly leaking oil. I've topped it up, so it's, it's fine. It's got enough oil in it. Yeah, all right, let's set up the rest of this apparatus. All right, a lot of working parts to this, but I reckon we're, um, we're good to go. Moment is in, stirring on, stuff's cooling down, condenser water is flowing. Got some calcium chloride in that ice there just to help reduce the temperature a little. Let's um, turn the pump on. All right, this seems surprisingly pleasant. Nothing has gone catastrophically wrong. There's even a hint that that's kind of even nearly boiling already. So, um, hey, we might actually be able to pull this off, much to my own surprise. levels of yellow they're getting stronger it's getting yellower I think that's just because we're removing the solvent from whatever it, the yellow thing is but still it's never nice to see still solvent coming over at 40 degrees we're nearly there I think oh, I don't know but uh, hopefully we're nearly there I think I really am abusing the pump a little um, you can see some toluene in the line here so that's getting sucked into there. Doesn't look like it's leaving this trap, it's doing its job, but um, I put some ice here as well. I think we are really sucking some toluene in there, but it's, I don't think it's a big deal, but um, if I had easier access to dry ice, I could, you know, make a much colder trap, and that's what a 
proper lab would do but as I often point out I'm not a proper lab and I don't have nice access to dry ice so um, uh, yeah we have to make do. Rising in temperature a little we're at a nice stable 40 now we're at 45 so to see if this spikes too much more we'll have to change out the flasks and then um, start collecting hopefully product. Hopefully it's not so yellow. It's <laughs> very um, dehydrated piss colour at the moment. It's never what you want to see, either in your piss or in your bloody uh, flask. This is the first fraction. Um, we got a little bit before, but I, I put it back in the bottle um, of solvent. So, because um, we use like 200 mils of solvent, that's only like 50 mils. So the rest I, I put back already. We got the second fraction. I, I changed out the flask and, and when I thought it sort of changed, but I'm more confident now because the stuff isn't boiling over. The pressure's the same. You know, it's not boiling at all actually. So, so now I reckon the stuff in our flask is really what we want. So we've just got to just deal with this last bit. I'm not sure what temperature is going to come over. This came over at, at you know 30 to 40. This came over to um, you know 40 to 55 but it's probably still just solvent but now we're into the good stuff. Taking a fourth fraction with this last little bit that's in the flask there and then I'm going to pack this up uh, very quickly because it's going to rain and I'm due to be somewhere else and I'm already late so it's struggling to come through the the column now there's not enough material left but that's all right there's only a couple of meals but we're getting a couple of drops here more product more product and excellent excellent you can see actually the pump oil is overflowing here because uh, it's so full of solvent that it's um you know got more volume and and is overflowing so forgive me i have sinned sorry pump here we have four fractions and they all look identical at this point if this was a good lab i'd run an nmr nmr to um, determine the composition of each of these fractions. This is our product, or if it's all solvent, or if from here is our product. We don't have that, so we've got to think of some analytical techniques of our own, to determine if there's any difference between all these fractions. So, what have we got available? Um, hmm, not a whole lot, honestly. <laughs> so to begin with, they definitely do smell different. This one tastes like not taste. Oh, I'm not going that far. This one smells like fuel, really. I mean, sort of a little bit sweeter than the classic Tywin smell. Yeah, I'm probably imagining that. Whereas this smells a lot more decomposed. That's not a real smell. It's quite a distinct difference. It's not telling us that these are different chemicals completely, but it's at least telling us that there's some difference between the samples, potentially. All right, that's a start. Um, what else have we got? So I have three drops of fraction one here um, and we're going to light it on fire. Um, Tolin burns with a very orange flame and a very sooty um, smoke which it is doing uh, because it's aromatic it's got no oxygen in the in the structure it doesn't burn cleanly at all and that is a typical Tolin flame no surprises there at all. All right we've got three drops of the fourth fraction in there now uh, it's a new bit of alfoil uh, and we'll light it on fire. Let's see, that is burning just a little bit cleaner, a touch cleaner. Wasn't very conclusive for my liking. All right, I've done some thinking, and the only way I feel like I could be convinced that it's our product is if we have a nice boiling point separation between the toluene and our product. And we know there is one. We know that the boiling point of our product uh, is a lot higher than toluene. We, we don't know what it is, but toluene oil is 110, and our product is a lot higher than that. If we just have an oil bath here, and we heat this up to 115 degrees, so it'll be above the boiling point of toluene. If it's all solvent, it'll all boil off, and if it's our product, it should stay behind, and hopefully it shouldn't decompose under that heat. All right, look at that temperature and look at the lack of boiling. Even if I turn the stirring off, there's one floaty in there. God damn it, how does that happen? Um, but there's there's nothing. 
No boiling. So why don't we be a bit over the top and I'll put a thermometer directly in that solution while it's heating there. If there's any toluene in it, it can't get over 110 degrees because that's the boiling point of it. There we go, 130, 140 degrees. It's so hard to see that on camera. This is such a cheap thermometer. There we go, there it is. It's accurate enough, I think. <laughs> I have tested these ones before and these ones aren't too bad, but it's definitely over 100 degrees. It's not boiling. Look, I'm happy with that. I'm damn happy with that. Hell yeah, let's cool that down, bottle it up, and actually call it a bloody day. Another property we can test pretty easily is our density. We have here a 10 mil cylinder, so we can measure out 10 mils and see how much that 10 mils weighs. If it's all just our cyclopentanone ketal product, then we expect it to be 10 grams because the density, according to the source I saw, was 1.03 grams per mil. All right, that's bang on. I didn't actually know if this was <laughs> going to work or not. We're right on top there. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. If it was ethylene glycol or cyclopentanone, we'd see a very different density, but um, this is bang on. Well, once again, not bang on, but it's my level of perfect, which as you know by now is much lower than most other people's version of perfect, but that's how we roll here. And here it is, here's our yield, a yield of 44 grams. Amazingly, and of course, the moment you've all been waiting for, I did say people could put bets on, and I'd give you two Australian dollars if you correctly guessed our percentage yield when we got it. Uh, it was a couple of videos ago. So 44 grams gives us a percentage yield of 31%. So congratulations to Mark and Corbin for correctly guessing 31%. I will uh, PayPal you both two Australian dollars. I feel really bad for the people that guessed like 32% and 30% you missed out. You, you just you just weren't on it. You just weren't on the same levels that Mark and Corbin were. Given the fact that most people guessed somewhere between 1% and 10% and not many people guessed above 10%, <laughs> I'm bloody well happy with 31%. I'll take it. Anyway, well, see you next time. Thanks for uh, putting the bets on. Um, gambling. Is this illegal? I'm not sure if this is illegal gambling. Ah, oh well back out into the sun. Oh, cat, what have you got? Oh, don't bring the rabbit inside. Oi, oi, do not bring the rabbit inside. What have I said? All right, where are we? Uh, so I'll put the whole bloody schematic up on the screen now. Thank you, editing Tom. Yeah, so we, we've done a few steps. Look at us go. We've got um, some product, where is it? Yeah, so that's where we are. Um, what we need to do now is the bromination. So this is our product here in the container and we need to put some um, bromide groups onto it here. To do that, we need elemental bromine in 1,4-dioxane, which is a solvent here. Both of these things I have made previously and actually I think I have videos on both of them. Made bromine from a bull chemical called something or other, bromochloro... Hide it. Actually, I'm not going to say that word because I got it wrong in the video and people are still paying me out about it. Bromochlorodimethyl... I'm going to get this last word wrong. Hide... 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 Well, 1,4-dioxane we made for ethylene glycol, which is the same chemical we used to make these protecting groups here. So, uh, actually, if I just pan the camera down a little... So, this is where our dioxane is. Uh, this is how much dioxane we have. And we have some amount of bromine in an ampule here. Bromine. So the bromine's quite old now, um, but you know, it does keep in these ampules, luckily. Now, is it enough of either chemical? Uh, no. <laughs> Both these chemicals are quite old. The problem with the bromine is that we made it from a method that um, we think there's quite a lot of chloride contamination in it, or quite a lot of chlorine, and that's not great because if we have some chlorine in the bromine, that there's a risk that we put a chloro group on the molecule at some point. If at any point a chloro group gets substituted instead of a bromo group, then, you know, it's going to be a complete loss. So we want um, pretty pure bromine. We also want quite dry dioxane. This has to be a quite a dry environment, I think, for it to work. This dioxane is quite old and we know it absorbs water from the atmosphere, so it's not going to be dry anymore. I also did a peroxide test on it a little while ago and um, it's got oh, some, some peroxides in it. So that, that's no oh. good either. So, so we can't just distill it straight from where it is. And also in terms of scale, we need quite a lot of both of these things because so we need at least 
three moles of bromine for one mole of our, our cyclopentanone ether, ketal, ketal, cyclopentanone ketal. It's tempting to say we only have three bromine groups over here, so we only need like one and a half Br2s because, you know, one and a half times Br2 is, is three, but um, that's not how it adds on. You know, we need um, one Br2 to add one Br group on there. Does that make sense? And the paper we're following uses just slightly over a three times amount, so, so there is a little bit of an excess of bromine. The consequence of this means that um, we need quite like really a shit ton of bromine. Uh, for 10 grams of our ketal uh, reagent here, we need nearly 40 grams of bromine. So uh, it's like 38, 39 grams. Once we got 40 grams here, if we wanted to convert this all to um, the tribromo product here, you know, we'd need heaps and heaps of bromine. Yeah, I, I tend not to do things on a very small scale <laughs> to start with, which um, sets me up to fail quite significantly if you haven't noticed across the years. Uh, uh, any advice about this reaction that you have, um, please let me know in the comments because we're not going to get to it this video. But um, I feel like the important thing about this reaction is um, the quality of the reagents. So we really want to kind of have good dry dioxane, bromine without any chloride contaminant, chlor chlorine contaminant, and, and, and is dry once again. I think today I'm just going to go from the bromide salt to bromine via an oxidizer like... Um, uh, hydrogen peroxide I reckon got quite a bit of that and it's just been sitting around in storage and I'm kind of sick of storing it So um, if I use hydrogen peroxide, then um, we won't have any halogen contaminants in our bromine Let's get let's get started on some reagent acquisition let's... Okay, that's, that's enough Starting with the dioxane here, I've got the same antifreeze that we um, distilled the ethylene glycol off of, mostly ethylene glycol. It's got a tiny bit of water in it um, and a whole lot of dye. So we got, what, like 250, 300 mils or so there. I think it's about 300 mils. So we got uh, 55 mils. I think I used 70 mils of concentrated sulfuric acid last time. I got 55 mils. Um, just, I'm just going to see if it works still with slightly less acid because, um, you know, I'm always interested in conserving my concentrated sulfuric acid useful reagent and then we're just going to set up for simple distillation run it uh, up until the point where it starts to tar over and we're going to stop it before it tars up because we don't need a whole lot of dioxane as soon as that stuff starts to really tar it um, creates a lot more work for me in the cleanup so um, we're going to try and prevent it from tarring up and i'm saying that now with authority because i know that i won't be able to stop it as per always a few moments later how do i keep letting this happen <laughs> Why? Why? All right, dioxane set up uh, 2.0. Already uh, charred up, so hopefully that means it's got no more char to char up, which is uh, doesn't make any sense. No, uh, <laughs> gotta watch it a little better and not let it get so hot like it did last time, which um, I'd like to pretend didn't happen. But um, look at that solid lump of carbon in that flask. <laughs> What an atrocity. Anyway, wouldn't be an extraction and I video unless we committed at least three atrocities. Ah, uh, oh well. Um, continuing on. So here's our dioxane. I've combined it with the uh, the old dioxane. It's very yellow, of course. So I'm um, do something about the peroxides, vaguely dry it out, and also remove some of the yellow. What we're going to be doing, as per we did in the previous dioxane run, is put it over some chocolate ice cream, which in our case is um, potassium hydroxide. I don't know how it's managed to survive in this chocolate ice cream container for so long. It kind of sounds like mostly one block but there is some loose powder in there as well which is surprising because i was expecting it to have fused into one massive block at this point but thank you buller family dairy chocolate real dairy ice cream we've got to filter these sieves off and there's there's a little bit of gross stuff in this as well i mean it's been sitting here for like a week and um i think it's done something weird with the sieves not the dioxane but the whatever other impurities are in there so it's kind of good we'll filter that off and it'll get rid of a lot of the shit that's in the dioxane. And also, if you've ever been waiting for a nice demonstration on how to do a nicely folded filter paper, well, I can tell you that this is definitely not the channel for you. <laughs> Fuck, I've never learned that. Fuck, why am I so sweaty already? Just put these gloves on. Oh, the hot weather, it's starting. That's gross. I don't want to feel bad. That's disgusting. All 
right, so this is what it looks like after an hour. I'm gonna get into the set funnel here because uh, there is two layers. Oh, actually, you can see that on camera better than you can see that in person. Anyway, we'll separate that off and then I'm gonna put that top layer back over some potassium hydroxide just to um, further reduce this red color out. I mean, it's turning the yellow into red, which is kind of what we want in a way because that yellow is getting sort of dragged out of solution. It's not getting dragged out of solution, it's polymerizing so that when we go and distill it later on, it won't come over with our dioxane. So now onto the bromine. As part of the bragging rights, I suppose, well, we'll call them bragging rights of, of this project, I really wanted to do most of this stuff from chemicals from the hardware store. Not just saying, oh, I'm using, you know, analytical grade sulfuric acid, but you could get it from the hardware store. I'm actually using the stuff that I got from the hardware store. If I really wanted to stick to that sort of line, then I should be doing this all from uh, stuff that I could get personally from, from the hardware store. We're, we're not because um, I've wanted to try a new method of making bromine. I think this method will be better because we won't have the chlorine contamination as I've mentioned. So we're gonna be making it from sodium bromide. I think this is about 500 grams. I also have a little container here um, still of this Bromstart, which is sodium bromide from a hardware store. However, it's a hardware store in the US. Um, it's not often you find sodium bromide in an Australian hardware store. Um, I think it might be sold, but um, I haven't seen it. We're gonna be using this. Uh, but there's only, what, two Oz, two Oz, oh, I know what it says, it's fine, uh, 56 grams of this, you know, we need more bromine than that, so we're going to use some of this, and um, all of this, let's just use all of this, a considerable amount of this, and we can pretend that I got all the sodium bromide from a hardware store, also we're going to be using my 50% acid, sulfuric acid, because I could be using my hardware store grade acid, but it's just such a waste to take um, concentrated acid and then dilute it down when I have um, like two liters of 50% acid that I acquired somewhere from a cleaning store or something. I can't remember. I'm also using my um, my uh, peroxide, which I did get over the counter many years ago. Uh, it's been in the freezer since, and um, obviously that's where the liquid still is. So it's, uh, yeah. It, it needs to be used up, it's quite old. And I have no idea what the concentration is. Anyway, source of bromine, acid, oxidizer. So um, we'll just get this all set up. So much more than it says. Maybe Americans always give 110%, who knows? Alright, we're nearly ready to go. That sunlight is streaming in to remind me that the sun is setting. Uh, and I'm just starting, but um, anyway, it's a little concerning this peroxide, uh, the fact that it's just <laughs> violently outgassing oxygen, even on its own, seems to imply to me that it's over at least 30% at this point um, still, which is, I think, an impressive seeing it's been in the freezer a couple years. Very, very concentrated, so it might be very violent when we add it in here. To make matters worse, I've lost stirring. Um, the bromide is solidified at the bottom. I've still got a heap more to add, but um, I'm not just going to dump in a whole lot of crystals now. We're just going to wait. When we add this to this, it's going to produce a lot of heat, which will heat up the mixture and then should dissolve all the bromide. So yeah, it should all work out in the end. I've got my long 30 centimeter condenser in here. Uh, I need some ice in there. I need some ice in here just to make sure the fumes stay a little bit controlled. Other than that, I think we're all pretty good to go. Also got my lab coat on. Lab coat, lab coat, because uh, bromine splashes, if they happen, would be very bad to my clothes and also my skin. So yes, lab coat time.
All right, I think we're pretty much done here. What I'm gonna do, uh, because I'm really out of time for today, is just get this bromine. I think we've got quite a bit of it. Sorry, it's getting protected from the light by that thing. As soon as I set this up, the bloody sun came in and it started heat everything up and the bloody vapors were going everywhere. Doing my best to block out the, the sunlight. So what was I saying? Oh yeah, the bromine, I'm just gonna uh, add some cold sulfuric acid to it. Leave it in that uh, flask. Uh, I'm just gonna put it in this jar as well with some bicarb at the bottom to neutralize any fumes. Hopefully the layer of sulfuric acid at the top sort of stops the fuming a little. Ideally, I'd be able to put in a freezer, but I don't have a lab freezer. I'm not about to put bromine in the, in the normal food freezer. That That's um, not very nice to the freezer or the food. But yeah, hopefully we've got quite a bit of bromine. I'm keen to take it apart and actually see how much bromine we got. Hell yeah, safe and secure. Well, at least I hope so. It's got a little layer of sulfuric acid there. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully it's okay. All right, I'm gonna neutralize this bromine solution with some sodium thiosulfate chlorine remover. That's what it says on the front. It's gonna be bromine remover. So I'm gonna take a couple of crystals. Beautiful. Here's what our solution looks like after about a week over the potassium hydroxide. So we've got some more water phase separated at the bottom. We also have this kind of solid red mass at the bottom of the flask. You can see it's sort of sticking to the walls there. And this is just, you know, the impurities condensing out, polymerizing out. So I think, I think it's been useful having this another week over the potassium hydroxide to really get rid of all this stuff. We still need to distill it. And I'm fairly sure all the potassium hydroxide would have taken care of the peroxides that we know were present in the dioxane. Uh, but just to overkill it, I'm gonna add some sodium sulfite to this, bisulfite to this, um, which will reduce any uh, peroxides. For some reason I decided to give it a wash with uh, salt water to try and dry it out. In pretty much immediate hindsight, it was a stupid idea because dioxane is quite soluble in water. I think it's miscible in water. We probably lost more dioxane than we dried it out and um, the potassium hydroxide did a reasonable job, I think, of phase separating and drying it out. The sodium chloride wash has probably reversed that. So I've dumped a whole lot of salt in to try and drag out the water and get them to phase separate better again. That was a bit stupid. I hope we end up with more dioxane than we started with this whole procedure, but <laughs> I'm worried we're not going to, and that would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? God damn. So the way this is meant to work is dioxane has an azeotrope with water, so it will boil it uh, like 85, 80 or so degrees with 18% water, and that's the liquid you collect is 18% water in there. That boils first, and then the pure dioxane boils at 101 degrees. So what I was hoping to see is just a little bit of stuff that comes over early, which contains all your water, and then you throw that away, even though it's 80% or so dioxane, the rest of your stuff comes over dry. Um, God damn, look how much azeotrope came over. Oh, it's so much dioxane, you know, I can't really throw that out. It doesn't leave me with a whole lot of dry stuff. It's finally starting to come over now. Oh, man, that sodium chloride wash must have ruined everything. But if we get a small amount of very dry stuff, that's still useful enough. If we get 50 or so mils, it should be enough for the next step. So what I'm going to do now, rather than distill it and then dry it over sodium and then redistill, I'm just going to put some lumps of sodium into this now. It's mostly dry anyway because all the water has been taken out on the azeotrope. But if I just put in a little couple lumps of sodium once this cools down a little bit more, then we'll dry it even further and, and just distill it and the stuff we collect at the end will be uh, nice and dry dioxane. I'll keep this for something, separate it and redistill it later on when we need more dioxane because I'm sure we will need more dioxane in future. I don't know why I keep doing this on such a huge scale and ending up with like fuck all dioxane. <laughs> this is all we have 
uh, for the dry stuff. It's about 30 mils. It's got some solid stuff down there, which is itself freezing because I put it in the freezer or the fridge and it started to solidify, which is a really good sign of purity. So we have a lot of this stuff. It's probably more concentrated than the azeotrope, which explains where all our dioxane went, but um, it's still too wet for our purposes. So I'll need to redry that if we hope to use it in this reaction. This is our bromine. It's over sulfuric acid. Uh, I've got a hot tip from Eric who was done this reaction before and sent me some tips on Discord. The bromine contains some sulfuric acid after you dry it with the sulfuric acid. So I need to redistill the bromine because the reaction, the bromination reaction that we're doing is particularly sensitive to acid. So we need to make sure there's no acid there. I need to redistill the bromine. Could film it, but honestly, I'm not going to because I'm sick of distillations at the moment. I'm sick of filming distillations. Done nothing but distillations recently. We've got our dioxane, we've got our bromine, we've got our um, cyclopentanone key towel ether thing should be all good to do a run of the bromination step i have purchased some tlc plates so i'll be able to monitor the reaction that way i hope you enjoyed this and i'll see you in another video um soon again everyone we've made it we've made it to the bloody summer holidays beautiful sunny day we've got some test cricket on the radio and some cool chemistry to do it's been a bit of a tough year 2020 as i know it has been for everyone but um it's looking like things are going to improve so i hope that's the case for you as well things are on the up so what have we got planned for today let's take it away other camera We've seen this reaction scheme before, in fact, this exact one last episode. But the difference was last episode, we didn't actually have these reagents and we made them last episode. So now we are in possession of everything we need to be able to do this reaction. So we're finally doing it. We're turning our psychopentanone key towel into uh, the tribromo cyclopentanone key towel um, using elemental bromine and dioxane. As per usual, we're drawing from two papers from the CSIRO in Victoria. Shout out to the CSIRO in Victoria. Thanks for tweeting at me. That was really fun. So if you're watching, hello. I'm continuing to butcher your work, but um, <laughs> thanks for writing these papers. But also another resource I found which will be quite useful now and, and going forward is from 1989 out of um, the US uh, Naval Research Labs. So shout out to the US War Machine for uh, continuing to bring us good papers. They provide these reaction details in, in, in quite a lot of detail. Details and detail. The obvious one, of course, is the use of dioxane. As I've mentioned before, it's it's uh, a chemical that's used quite a lot in home chemistry because it's made easily from, well, okay, I won't say easily. <laughs> oh, fuck. How do I keep letting this happen? Can be made from ethylene glycol, which is a very available uh, chemical. So it, it, it seems like uh, a modification that I've made to this procedure, but no, according to this um, 1989 um, research paper, they really tried to use a lot of different solvents other than dioxane, and dioxane was the only one that worked. So dioxane is actually necessary for this reaction to happen. They speculate that this is a thing that gets brominated, so you actually turn the dioxane into dibromine dioxane or something like that, and then that species then brominates the uh, the key tail. However, they do drop another key bit of information because if we scan down and have a look at our reagents, Go down here. So first of all, look how nice they are. If you've been following my channel, it's rare that we start from reagents that are this nice. <laughs> Especially when they've all been made from hardware chemicals, basically. Maybe it's just the containers that give me this false sense of um, security about their, their purity. Really, we got quite a bit of bromine, a decent amount of our key towel. But we don't have a whole lot of dioxane. It's actually frozen at the moment. It's been in the fridge. But um, we don't have a whole lot of it. And what's frustrating is it's kind of the limiting thing in this case because we need it both as a reagent, as, as a bromination sort of species in the middle, but also as a solvent because we need everything dissolved. The paper from the research lab mentions that you can actually use DCM as a solvent as well. So as long as you've got the dioxane in there, that's fine. You can use much smaller amounts of it and then use just DCM to keep everything dissolved. So that's what we're going to do. This is my dichloromethane. This came from Paint Stripper from the same hardware store everything else is coming from. Um, I distilled it uh, from the Paint Stripper. It comes over with some methanol, but then um, I redistilled it and then distilled it over... Um, phosphorus pentoxide. Now phosphorus pentoxide is a very good dehydrating agent. It's not something you find at your hardware store. It's not something you find very easily at all. And I did that because I just wanted to. Sometimes I just do chemistry because I want to. Um, I just wanted to see how it worked and, and getting this stuff really dry. Um, we need all the stuff really dry, but I did cheat a little bit on our hardware sort of uh, getting things from hardware stores by, by using phosphorus pentoxide. But 
we won't count it because it's not a reagent. As I've mentioned and re-mentioned, um, the difficult part about this is the fact that it, it has to be dry. I'm actually going to dry that out over some sieves before we um, run this thing. I've, I have re-distilled the bromine. That was something I, I didn't mention last episode. It was, you know, fine. You know, a lot of time but um it's it's there so the bromine is dry well you know everything is dry but we'll just overdo it with some sieves because um this is particularly water sensitive and dioxane does tend to absorb water from the atmosphere over time and it's been a little while since i made it so yes anyway Oops, I accidentally set one on fire. I think it was that one there. It just started going very orange. So, uh, yes, 10 second burst at most. Oh, it's very hot. These are looking pretty damn dry. There's not really much water coming off and they're, they're very hot. So I'm gonna cool these down over vacuum, which should um, get the last little bits of water out. Some of you were probably already about to comment like, hey, shouldn't you not put flat bottom flasks under vacuum while they're hot? Doesn't that deform the glass? Normally I'd be like, ah, nah, this vacuum isn't strong enough for that. It's not going to deform. It's not that hot, but look at this. Look at the bottom of the flask. It's got all sucked in under the vacuum. What happens is the sieves are so hot that they actually heat up the glass enough that it's slightly malleable and then put this sealed flask under, under vacuum. It starts to deform. All right, it's dreadful. I should... Not do that, don't do that. You should be doing this with a round bottom flask. Much better structural integrity because it's all um, circular. It's very cool. Doesn't um, <laughs> have a flat surface to, to form like this. That's uh, pretty terrible. Ah, oh well. At least the sieves are dry. to go that bromine's doing its best to be an escape artist as it tends to do we've got our dcm cyclopentanoid ketal dioxane mixture here it's cooling slightly uh, temperature is really the difficult part of this reaction well i haven't tried it before this is what i'm thinking is a difficult part of the action looking at this prep it says if we go over 30 degrees at all even for 10 minutes it'll get destroyed it won't work at all <laughs> we can run this reaction for just a couple of hours to completion at 27 degrees. But if we go three degrees higher, it just tars up apparently. So what is recommended or what, what people seem to do with this reaction is to go uh, slightly colder, like 20 degrees or so, and then run it overnight and then it still runs to completion. So normally you'd think watching this channel, normally I'd go the fast and loose method where we crank it up, we try and get exactly, uh, you know, as hot as we can. And then we try and do it as quick as possible. Instead, I'm gonna do the, uh, the slow and more thoughtful method just because then I put all my problems onto future Tom tomorrow, <laughs> who hopefully is a lot wiser and um, has more time to do things. Oh, also, yes, the authors ran this under uh, nitrogen atmosphere. It might just be keep out water, but it might also be uh, prevent oxygen getting in, which um, is a big, much bigger of a deal. I'm um, not running it under a bloody nitrogen atmosphere. Hopefully everything doesn't blow up because, you know, it might generate a lot of gas and I'm keeping it sealed. So I'm trying to make that balancing act between protecting it but also not letting it blow up so there's a there's a line there i'm trying to walk also light coming in you know using bromine tends to have some reaction with uv i think that's a little bit overdone but i will try to protect this from the light just so that we negate that possibility from um you know ruining our yields because if we get a shit yield everyone will comment oh it's because of the uv the sun was coming in and yes we will try and block it out. Not for the moment because I don't want to use alfoil and a bromine at the same time. And fuck off, spider. Spiders are so quick. This I just put this down. Don't build a web around my fucking bromine. I literally just put that down, all right? Do not build a fucking web. Now fuck off. Fuck off. Go.
letting off a lot more gas than I thought it would. So it's uh, venting a little bit. Uh, the drip rate's reasonably slow. Oh, it's not that slow. But yeah, you see it. <laughs> Give me off clouds of, buddy, um, I assume hydrobromic acid fumes. Not the healthiest. And um, yeah, not the best system for it then, obviously. Don't want things doing that, but I also can't just have it open. I suppose I might have to, but... Oh, well, we'll just run it like this for a little while. have to watch it, because uh, if I leave it, it'll... <laughs> it'll explode everywhere. And uh, I don't want that. So, yeah. It's not heating up a lot. I'm um, adding the bromine um, reasonably fast now, but it is putting off a lot of gas. I think that's a sign it's working, right? I think so. Anyway pretty uh, goddamn corrosive really can't put the stopper on there I could before but now it's producing heaps and heaps so yeah I'm not a big fan of this I gotta say really gotta think of a better way of doing this if I'm gonna do this again like a scrubber or something I mean the paper mentions a scrubber and I just neglected that bit but I should have got one ah this is dreadful, dreadful, dreadful. But hey, maybe it'll still work. So we just keep going. All right, somewhat stop violently outgassing <laughs> hydrobromic acid fumes. Obviously, the gas needs to escape, but I can't let any water get in. And the hydrobromic acid is so hygroscopic, you can see some water collecting even around that neck there because that acid vapor, you know, really pulls water from the air very quickly. So it may have stuffed everything up. Um, it's looking very tarry, but maybe it'll look like that. If it's, you know, maybe it's meant to look like that is what I mean. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm heating it up now. The room temperature is about 25 degrees, which is about where we want it. So I'm just letting it warm up on its own. I'm not using any heating. We're sitting in this water, which is still pretty cold. So it was about 15 degrees. So I'll let it just warm up over the next little while. We will continue on. All right, I've just done now what I probably should have done at the start, which is put a drying tube on. So this allows gas to escape because it's just loosely packed calcium chloride in there. Well, not that loosely packed, but packed calcium chloride in here. And any air can go back this way, but it gets stripped of its moisture by the calcium chloride here. So you can have gas exchange, but you can't have any moisture get back into the flask. Oh, I don't know. Maybe maybe it could have had a stopper. It's not venting that much HBR gas. But at this point, um, I am going to leave it overnight. Um, it looks like... A dreadful sign <laughs> um uh it's not good at all but um we'll let that go overnight it's at about 20 degrees uh it's not going to get much colder than that tonight oh i mean it might get to 15 degrees or so but it's not going to get too much hotter than 25 tomorrow hopefully before i come back and we get to do some work up on it and then hopefully everything will be all okay so we've made it to the next morning unscathed. I've just uncovered it, uh, none of the things popped off, uh, and it looks like tar. So that's really not great, but um, let's just do the work up and see if we can um, salvage anything from this. Hell yeah, let's do it. Here is our DCM solution. It's noticeably dense. Even for DCM, it's um, very heavy, which is a good sign because our brominator product should be pretty heavy because those bromines are heavy. Uh, in here, we have our dichloromethane. We have our dioxane, which apparently isn't really removed in the water washes because it dissolves so well in DCM. Any unreacted ketal, we have, you know, the monobrominated, the dibrominated, and the tribrominated. Hopefully, given the length of the reaction, most of the brominated 
ones are the tribromo. We don't have too much of the di or the monobrominated one. It's currently over some anhydrous sodium carbonate and um, just a few molecular sieves. I'm trying to remove the water from this. I'm not doing a great job of it, but I'm going to filter it into this flask and we're going to be removing the solvent. So the paper we're following does this under vacuum. They obviously just rotovap it, which is a cool bit of equipment that I don't have. So I'm just going to be doing, you know, unrotary evaporation. So I'm just going to blow some air through it, give it some very gentle heat because we want to remove pretty much all the dichloromethane. We want to remove dioxane as well, but we don't want to heat it up to 100 degrees or anything like that. But I think there's only a little bit of dioxane left, so we should be able to, if we just blow some air through it and give it some gentle heat, the dioxane should evaporate off. And we'll be left with potentially an oil of our brominated um, species, which we want to then crystallize out, which um, we will do by performing some black voodoo magic and um, praying to some gods and hopefully it does crystallize out. It is a bit more yellow than my liking. I mean, it's orange and orange is okay, I guess. I'm taking it because it looks a lot less like tar than it did before. This has been sitting at, oh, the water's 50 degrees or so. So um, it's been sitting here for about half an hour, yeah. So uh, all the DCM has been removed. I was hoping to remove a little bit of the dioxane. It's, you know, somewhat volatile. Got the air flowing in and it's it's warmed up, so should be able to remove volatile stuff. But there's still quite a bit of liquid left. So hopefully it's our, it's our product. It's worth noting that it's a pretty weird smell coming off this, like, moldy towel that you use at the swim centre from like the pool chlorine, but also like the weird towel mold kind of thing. It's kind of like that, but a little bit more synthetic. That's the kind of smell that comes off this thing. First method I'm gonna to try to get this to crystallize out is the lazy method. Uh, I'm just gonna put this into <laughs> the freezer overnight and uh, see if it crystallizes out. Will this work? Um, probably not, but um, I'm tired and I need an iced coffee so um, that's the method we're going to do and um, if it doesn't work tomorrow when we come back we'll um, <laughs> try something else but uh, for now let's just chuck it in the freezer and um, send it some thoughts and prayers. Here we are the next day and hell yeah I mean it could all be dioxane frozen in there because it's been in the freezer and dioxane freezes at uh, some reasonably not too cold temperature looks better than that it looks like there's some solid in here it looks really good it looks like our lazy method has actually worked so what i'm going to do is i'm going to let this warm up slightly i'm going to add some water to it water should crash out any uh, remaining stuff from the dioxane and dissolve the dioxane filter wash with a little ice cold methanol and then dry thoroughly on the pump So it actually hasn't crystallized out. <laughs> I was really optimistic, but you see that water there, but then below the water, there's this horrible orange liquid layer, and that's our product. So we've got a lot of product, but um, if I try to filter this now, I'm worried that all our product will just go straight through the filter because uh, it's not really a nice solid. Um, we're gonna have to try and crystallize it out. It was seeming very solid because the dioxane was mixed in with it and the dioxane was frozen but once the dioxane gets dissolved in the water and stops being a solid our trobromide product really um <laughs> doesn't really form a nice solid maybe I'll, I'll give it a go filtering but um it might get a little bit messy All right, look at that, we have solid. It has crystallized out. Obviously, it's really fucking yellow. It always goddamn is. The methanol was, was uh, washing some of that color out, but it's also washing a lot of the product out. You can see it sort of crashing out down here, but not crashing out well, not really forming a solid here, so getting this solid back out of here might might be a big issue. Uh, this isn't all of it, uh, I've still got uh, quite a bit more in the flask. It's just a test to see if it actually stayed in the filter paper. Let's try and get some of this color out. I'm just gonna add a little bit of uh, thiosulfate to this water solution above the orange. Hopefully that takes some of the color out. And then we um, if we'll filter the rest off and hope it, the rest of it crystallizes just like this.
we go. Here's our final yield. It's uh, This is the first little batch that I tried out. It is a little bit yellow, but um, it did lighten up considerably with some ethanol washes, so I'm feeling really confident about it. All in all, we got 17.5 grams, 43% yield, which, you know, isn't great, but also the papers that we're following only get around 50 to 60% uh, percent yield anyway, just for this step. Uh, and so I'm really happy with this. So we lost a lot there. Um, this is all our bromide washings from earlier with like the set funnel so there's probably a lot of product in there should really do a melting point test before we're um, too confident about it should melt around um, 70 to 80 degrees yeah absolutely excellent so um I won't say easily. We've made it significantly further than I think a lot of people thought we would. Um, here's the whole schematic and, and you know in green is obviously the bits that we've done and we've completed so we've got this step to do today and it's a bit of a strange step because um, it's when things start looking very very hard on paper. Not so much the, the steps but when you start looking at the structure everything starts looking a little bit messed up. I'm going to explain what we're doing today. I'm going to talk a little bit about what um, is theoretically happening because um, the synthesis part of this step isn't really that interesting. In fact, it's probably the easiest step overall that we've got to do, uh, assuming it works. Um, it's very easy to call something easy when you haven't tried it yet. So what we're doing is we're making this molecule here and, and on its own, independently, this looks stupid. I mean, my chalk drawing really doesn't help it out at all, but even when it's drawn properly, it, it looks really messed up. And it's a bit hard to think how are we going from this simple molecule to this quite complicated molecule um, in one step. What we're doing is we're actually going via this sort of intermediate here. I'm not sure whether we're actually going via this intermediate, but effectively, for this explanation, we're going via this intermediate here. I'm going to talk about how we're going to get from here to here, but just for now, how do we get from here to here? This is the simple bit where we're running it in, in quite basic conditions, um, sodium hydroxide, and we're going to be pulling off bromine. So, you know, we've got a hydrogen here and a bromine here, so we're going to pull that one off, pull that one off, and then put the double bond there. And then the same thing going to happen on this side. So we've got a hydrogen here and a bromine here, and we'll take that hydrogen and bromine off at the same time effectively, and then and then put a double one there. So that's how we get from this that one to this one here. But how are we getting from this one to this one here? Well, it's a reaction called a Diels outer reaction, and it's it's very typical of a university chemistry course to go quite in depth into the Diels outer reaction. And I think it's taught a lot. Well, I, I don't know why things are taught at university because there's so much to teach, but why you spend so much time on the Diels outer reaction? Uh, I mean, I'm sure it's it's an industrially significant reaction, but I, I think one of the reasons you start learning about it is that it gets you to think about molecules reacting more than just two dimensionally. You're used to seeing molecules like this written sort of in a 2D plane and you think they sort of react as if they lived in sort of flat land and things sort of react just in two dimensions but they don't and what you have here with these these double bonds and where the electrons are is more than just in the two dimensions so these double bonds what's actually happening is that a lot of that electron density where the actual electrons are where the bonds are they come out of the page so they're there in this z direction so if this is x and this is y they're off, they're in the z direction so they are, you know, above and below. So what's actually happening when these two molecules react with each other, one of them is coming on top of the other one and they're reacting. Okay, so we've got two of our intermediates here and you've got to imagine that this one is coming on top of this one. Uh, I, I can't draw that, but you have to imagine that this one in 3D space is coming on top of this one. And what's happening is that this carbon here is this, so this double bond is going to flick out. Well, I mean, it's not how it works, but you can imagine that and then react with that. So this is, this is going down. So this one's underneath and this one's on top. And then this one will go, this double bond will go here, like that. That'll rotate around, so it'll like that. And then like this. And then this double bond will come all the way down to that one there. So you see how that, that kind of works? <laughs> so that's how we end up with, with it like this, right? Like that one there. So we've got this thing here and then the bonds between this one. So we've like, you know, moved a bonds round in a circle. Well, it's a circle three-dimensionally. <laughs> 
So we've shifted all the bonds around, so that's how we end up with, with this kind of complex molecule is we, we get two of them and we form this, this ring. So that's Adil's outer reaction. Very favourable, it's quite fast, if we get the right conditions. So really the conditions are all about pulling off those bromines, because once we've pulled off those bromines, these two molecules react together quite fast in, in, in a good yield. And the interesting thing is also is there's, there's sort of two ways that they can react, because it's coming on top here, you can imagine that this molecule could also react sort of the other way, and then the bromine would be on the other side. It's it's pretty hard to visualize and quite hard to draw, but um, there's sort of two ways a deals outer can go. There's an endo product and an exo product, that's what they're called. Don't ask me to tell you <laughs> how they're named. Um, I have learned that at some point, but I would need to break out the chemistry textbook <laughs> um, to be able to tell you um, endo versus exo these days. But the good news is, is um, this product here we know is an endo product. We just know that from the paper. And there's no mention of the exo product. So we're forming the endo product at 100%. That's the other interesting thing about the deals older reaction and why you learn it is because that ratio of endo to exo and when the product's going to be the exo form and when the product's going to be the endo form and what drives that is really interesting and you, and you need to learn. Well, I'm not sure about interesting, but there's a lot of science there. And really you think, well, if this goes around the other way, then that bromine is gonna be awkwardly there, there or here or something like that. And that clash means that it's not as favorable. And because that form is not as favorable, is that what making the endo form be 100% or is it just because this you know happens a lot faster and it happens before any exo one can form? So there's a lot of depth to the deals outer reaction and it teaches you a lot of stuff about fucking chemistry. The good news about this reaction is that we no longer have to worry about anhydrous conditions. Apparently you get a slightly better yield if you use anhydrous conditions such as I think initially people were talking about using uh, tertiary butanol and um, potassium ter butoxide but the 1989 paper found that the yields were just as good if you used just sodium hydroxide and ethanol or methanol and then the uh, 1997 paper follows it up with um, using sodium hydroxide in methanol. We're going back to our roots here with hardware store ingredients. It's just uh, ethanol from the hardware store. It's 95% ethanol with some denatrant in it. Uh, it's called methylated spirits. Doesn't actually have any methanol in it. Uh, sodium hydroxide is a big container of sodium hydroxide. And we're just going to use both of these like without further purification, just straight from the hardware store shelf. <laughs> so yeah, back to fast and loose. Not worrying about drying anything out or uh, uh, redistilling stuff. It's just fast and loose and see, we'll see how we go. I'm not going to use all our tribromide up, maybe like a third of it or so, so that if this fast and loose method doesn't work, then we don't lose all our product, but um, we'll see what kind of yields we can get. yellow and I haven't even added the yellow stuff yet. It's just the sodium hydroxide and the ethanol. <laughs> it gets on this weird coloration. I've seen this before from it when uh, adding sodium to ethanol, you know, this sort of grade of ethanol. So there's there's something a little bit weird in it, but um, I don't think it'll harm it too much. It doesn't look very pretty when it's this horrible coloration already. Ah, uh, oh well. Got the condenser on, I gotta hook up the water and add the rest of this solid. Well, add any of it because I haven't had it I haven't added any of it yet, even though it looks like I have. And I will say, I'm generally pretty relaxed about greasing joints. I, I tend not to do it as much as like the rest of the world tends to do it. But for reaction mixtures like this, where we've got sodium hydroxide in ethanol, that mixture can sort of etch glass ever so slightly, especially while hot. It's not going to damage the flask really, but if it can get in the joint here and then heated, because it's a ground glass joint, it's got a lot of surface area between two things, it, it can very easily fuse the two together. When dealing with very basic stuff, yeah, you, you've got to really worry about your joints. And I don't want this condenser stuck to this flask forever, you know, because uh, it's one thing to have them stuck, but it's another thing to have them really cease and actually like fuse together by the sodium hydroxide, because then you can never get them apart. Um, so I've got this brand new bloody grease. Uh, this is some very expensive stuff. This is like the proper fluorinated stuff, and it's a whole lot of it. So this is <laughs> probably the most expensive lube you'll ever see. Actually, well, I don't know. I don't know what kind of lube you're buying. You can probably get very expensive lube that's got fucking 
gold flakes that are ribbed for a pleasure or something in it, but this is expensive lube. <laughs> um, this came from the US, from Brian, who um, DM'd me on Twitter, and thanks for it. Um, he, he didn't buy this, he actually saved it from the bin. His company were throwing it out because they used a small amount and then decided that they didn't need the rest of it, so they <laughs> put it in the bin, so, and he thought I could use it to actually grease some joints. So um, with this much, I can probably grease 8,000 joints. three hours on the reflux there and uh, there's there's precipitate at the bottom you can kind of see that spun around yeah yeah, yeah. so hopefully that's uh, sodium bromide that's precipitating out because that's that sodium hydroxide pulls off the bromides on the organic molecule it'll form sodium bromide which isn't soluble in the ethanol and that's a good sign what we're going to do is we're going to dump it out in a whole lot of cold water uh, like 500 mils or so so it's quite a lot of, of stuff and that'll dissolve the bromide but precipitate out our products and then, and then we can filter that off so at the moment, you know, the precipitate is the thing that we don't want. <laughs> Everything that we want is dissolved, so we'll be swapping that around by just dumping it out in a whole lot of water. Uh, it's not a great colour, <laughs> um, but we'll see how we go. It never is the bloody right colour. <laughs> Here we are the next day. This is a bit of a glassware graveyard at the moment. <laughs> yeah, from this experiment, the last one. Been churning through the glassware, but I'll um, clean it up in a second. I swear. Let's have a look at our product. It looks really good. Well, I mean, you know, it's it's brown, and you know that's not great. But this looks exactly like I was expecting it to. Even really the brown colour, I was I was thinking it was you know going to come out of this colour. It's not really tar, but it's not like crystalline or anything, and it looks very different than our than our product started out being. This is a lot less dense. It's more like clay or mud. That's excellent. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to recrystallize it from some hot ethanol. This has been heating up. I'll just get that back heating again. Make it recrystallize into a bit more of a a white colour or something we could call beige potentially rather than just brown, which this is brown. I'm not going to pretend and call this beige. I mean, if I was publishing a paper, I'd call this off-white. <laughs> nah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not that mean. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's just an off-white product. Um, <laughs> all right, let's get this recrystallizing. Here's our final product. It's only uh, 0.6 grams, which corresponds to a, a percentage yield of uh, 18% <laughs> based on our starting reagents. I'm fairly sure all of that has been from the recrist. We've got a lot 
still in this ethanol, um, and I, I filtered some out. I, I, I think there's some potassium bromide in there, but we lost quite a bit of solvent that way. But it's all right. I'll be running the synthesis again, and I'll just reuse this solvent, if that makes sense, for the recris next time. So uh, we haven't really lost anything here. I'll just carry the yield forward that we lost this time into the reaction next time. I don't think that's a really a thing people do, but that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Point being is that we got this, and it's looking pretty nice. I mean, it's not brown. I wouldn't call it brown. It's not very nice to call a solid a brown solid when you're looking for something colorless, as per the author's got a colors product. But I'd go so far as to say this is tan. A light tan powder. Maybe not light tan, just tan. In terms of confirming uh, what it is, we can do the world's crudest melting point test. We know our, our product we started with has a melting point of about 78. And this, if it is our product, should have a melting point of about 170 odd. And then if it's all just sodium bromide, which is our other byproduct from the action, it'll have a melting point of about 782. So I'm just going to heat it with, with, with a bit of a, a light flame. And if it melts, um, you know, that's roughly in our right range because that sort of flame temp should melt something about 200 pretty easily. But um, not so easily that, you know, we see that it's an 80 degree melting point thing. But um, if it's just sodium bromide, it won't melt at all. But yes, like I said, world's cruise melting point test. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to get too confident, but... Holy shit, we, we might actually be doing this. <laughs> All right, thanks for watching. I'll uh, see you in the next video. Um, so previously, this is the molecule we've made. I think it's correct. At least it's mostly correct. Um, and if it's not correct, I will just edit it in post, I'll fix it in post, it'll be fine. And so the next step for us in making cubane in the big series is to get rid of these groups here on the end and return them back to being what they're called ketone, yeah, forgetting words. So the moment this is sort of acting as a protecting group, I want to remove them and then put that, you know, you know, whatever, uh, <laughs> um, to, you know, being this group here. And so the synthetic pathway we've been following for, um, uh, uh, the last little while has it the next step with this and sulfuric acid and it gets rid of both of these groups at the same time however i'm going to deviate from that slightly and instead i'm going to do a different method and it's only going to remove one of the groups it's going to turn this molecule into something that looks more like uh this so we have this protecting group still on and this one off And we, we're going to do that by following a procedure from the 1989 paper, but not exactly, because there's a big issue with it, um, which I'll get into. How was the sound levels? Was it okay? Were you checking that? Was it clipping too much? Yeah, so this is what we're doing. It's this step today. <laughs> now, can anyone see the problem with this step as it's written? Yeah, it's carbon tet. <laughs> I have a lot of carbon tet, but geez, I don't want to use it. So they try all these different solvents, but the best one by far was carbon tetrachloride. Uh, but I don't want to do carbon tetrachloride. I kind of want to use dichloromethane, which they mentioned. Yeah, so it's also converted to monoketone, that's the product we want, in mixtures of concentrated hydrochloric acid and other solvents such as toluene, hexane, methylene chloride, chloroform, and carbon tet. Good results were obtained with methylene chloride and the solvent was used during the second half of the program. So we can use methylene chloride, which is dichloromethane. All right, so this is a product from last video. Um, this is the Deals Outer product. We only got about 0.6 grams, if I recall correctly. It wasn't a whole lot, but I did say I was gonna go back and, and redo it, which I have done. And uh, this is our product, more of the Deals Outer product. It looks kind of the same color. I did the recrist a little better. I just spent longer on it, let it cool down for longer. So I got really nice sort of crystalline material out of it. We've got only a little bit of dichloromethane, but we don't need very much at all for this video. And I've just got like liters of hydrochloric acid, so that is no issue at all. So if we've got four kilos of um, the bisquetal, then we need 2.4 liters of hydrochloric acid and 10 liters of solvent. Scaling that down, we'll, we'll just using two grams, one and a half mils of hydrochloric, five mils of dichloromethane, which the volume is very small, so I might increase that.
this up. Perfect. One in, one in a million shot. Oh yeah, that's the shot. See, that was a good shot, right? That was a good shot. <laughs> I'll get another shot. From the same angle, but at a different time, so I can like fade them together. <laughs> I'm so sweaty. So this has been going on for about three hours, three or four hours of reflux, three or four hours of reflux. But how much does it need is a very good question. Uh, it needs quite a lot, an unspecified amount. Interestingly, these notes say that really high purity stuff takes a long while to properly convert. However, impure stuff converts a lot quicker because um, they think some of the uh, impurity acts as a bit of a phase transfer agent. So the dichloromethane layer can react with the hydrochloric acid aqueous layer easier if there's some impurity that allows them to sort of mix together a little bit better. I'm gonna guess that my product is impure even though I did recrystallize it. It's probably impure enough to count as impure. <laughs> so it probably gets converted reasonably quickly, but it's still several hours. Now there is a way we can actually tell when that endpoint is and that's via TLC. TLC plate. So TLC obviously stands for time, love and care because you only do it when you actually give a shit about the outcome of your reaction. But I'm not going to do that today. I'm actually just going to seal this up, come back to it another day. Uh, it should be all right just to sit here by itself. The weather is stupidly hot today. It's like mid 40s outside. It's not as hot in the lab, but the fact that the air temperature outside is the boiling point of <laughs> um, dichloromethane makes me worry for the storage a little bit. I'll let it cool down and um, we'll come back in a couple of days to run a TLC and see if it's finished. And if so, we'll run the workup. If not, we'll just restart the reflux. That, um, again, that's no stress. All right, we're back a few days later and uh, everything looks okay. It looks like a little bit of solid has separated out. There's a little bit of brown sort of dust in here, which I'm not too mad about because I think our product does actually solidify out of the reaction mix eventually. It's probably product, so <laughs> no complaints there. I'm just gonna get this stirring once again to keep it reacting, because it doesn't really react too much when it's just sitting there because they're two different phases and they need to mix together to react. And here's what the plate looks like. So it's just very fine silica adhered to, in this case, an aluminum backing. It's also got some fluorescent compounds a little bit in there, I think. These ones do, so that if your compound absorbs UV, you can see where the compounds are in the in the spots, which won't be relevant to us today. Uh, they're pretty useful. They are disposable in, in terms of like their single use. So I've got a hundred of them, um, and you know we can only run a hundred. So a hundred's a lot, but <laughs> they still weren't cheap per plate. We've just got one here, and um, we've got to spot our samples onto there. This is a very small amount of our reagent. So this is the um, the dye key towel um, that we started with. It's a very small amount and we'll dilute this into DCM and we'll be running this as well. This might have several spots in it because um, we don't know how pure this compound is and there might have traces of um, you know different isomers or completely different compounds. Um, the fact that it's a light brown sort of color means it probably does contain a bit of other stuff in there as well. The usual solvents for TLC are things like ethyl acetate and hexane or mixtures of the two, uh, but I don't have <laughs> either of those at the moment. Um, so we're just gonna rely on good old pure DCM and just hope it works. I also uh, don't have any TLC spotters, so I'm gonna attempt to spot it very gently with like a pipette, which is a bad idea. I'm gonna be running it in this orange marmalade jar. I can't get the label off, but it seems a very nice shape for it. So I'm gonna just use it with a marmalade label on. And then finally, we're gonna be staining it with some potassium permanganate solution, which I'm not terribly familiar with, but I assume we're just gonna make a dilute solution of it up and then maybe like dip our plate into it afterwards and give it a little bit of heat and hopefully our spots will develop. We'll be able to visualize them because where the compound has moved to, it'll react with the uh, potassium panganate and turn a different color. Hopefully that works, hopefully this works, hopefully that works, hopefully that works. There's a lot of variables. I have no idea if this is gonna work. This will be a great success if it does, but holy shit, there's a lot of variables.
went badly, but the fact that it went at all uh, is a good sign and <laughs> gives us something to work towards. It did like nearly work. What this looks like to me is that I dramatically overloaded the plate. Um, I'm inexperienced, uh, but also the, the pipette um, can't put a very small amount of material on. You kind of want a small spot of a little bit of material and it puts like a big drop and it spreads out. So you get these huge smears. So I found, you know, as you do, some um, hypodermic needles and um, these should be better. I'm not sure actually, because I kind of slanted at the tip. Maybe if I cut them off, it'll, it'll be a bit nicer. Um, yeah, it's a small one. And then I've got like a medium one. And this one physically pains me to look at. That goes, that can, you can go through my entire arm. Why are they injecting two people at once? Like what, my wrist is here, but you need to inject me through someone else's wrist. Holy shit. Why do I have this? coming together it's coming together we didn't really develop it very well on this side this is a reagent and product I'm not sure about the symbols really <laughs> we'll do one more I'll, I'll load it up a little bit more than I did in this one because I want to see that um, you know we've turned this product into this product Right, so hardly the world's greatest TLC, but still, once again, we're being amazed that it works at all. The fact that this is sort of smearing here means that there's probably a lot of this product and there's a lot of the starting material here and this sort of smearing together and it's this one long dot here. I mean, I don't know how good the separation's meant to be anyway, just given the fact that we're using just DCM as a solvent, but um, the fact that they have quite different polarities means that they should at least have some separation, even though the solvent's not very good. Uh, this makes me think we need to do this reaction just for a little bit longer because it just looks like there's some starting material still in our reaction mix. But it looks like it's working. At least we've caused a change to our material. Um, it's no longer exactly the same as our product. We, we've changed its polarity in some way, so we must have done something to its structure. So uh, we might give it just an hour or two more of reflux. I might um, add an extra mil of hydrochloric acid. Might as well, because we're just gonna separate it off in, in a sec anyway. I want to get that pump there, but there's a big fuck off spider protecting it. I'm gonna need a stick or something. Maybe I could do without the pump, but Mm. Not as big as I thought. Oh, you're pretty. Sorry, mate. All right, leave. Leave. About as big as those spiders get. Gross. Gross. Here's our dried product, and I gotta say. It really <laughs> looks like a reactant. I know the paper, wherever I've put the paper, mentions that um, they crystallize out the product. Oh, such a small amount, I just ended up drying out all the DCM. Yeah, look, it looks the same color as our starting material, except you see around here, and this is probably the stuff that would crystallize out first, you see this brown material here. And we know from the paper that uh, the product we're making is, is a sort of a brown color. It's not meant to be, but it tends to be a browner color. So I'd say this sort of material around here is the sort of thing that we want. And it's easy to say, well, just heat it for longer. Why, why, why are you stopping now? Like, why aren't you heating for longer? It's had probably six hours at reflux, so that's at mid forties, and mother eight hours, eight to nine hours of vigorous stirring, but at room temperature, which is like 25 to 30 degrees. So it's not that much far off reflux anyway. And then it's been sitting there. I know it's a biphasic mixture, so it doesn't really count, but it has just been sitting for nearly a week now. <laughs> 
If you're saying, oh, it looks like only 10% of it has been converted, then what am I gonna do? Am I gonna reflux it for 90 hours to convert two grams? It's crazy. If we can't convert it over this length of time, then we've gotta look at other methods to be able to convert it, whether that be trying to boost up the hydrochloric acid concentration because we're only using 32%. We know from the paper that it will go faster with 37% acid. It's just a bit of a shit to make the 37% acid. That's not something I get directly from the hardware store shelves. Hopefully I can run some a bit more in-depth analysis, collaborate with someone who will let me run a little bit of analysis on my samples so far, and I'll try and scrape out and get a more brown bit around here, because I reckon that's our product. So our yield calculation, um, let's pull a number out of our ass and say fucking 12%. Oh, that's good, yeah, 12%, well done, we did it. I had sort of a speculative yield of about 12%, and uh, that was a number I just and pulled out of my ass. I thought um, the yield was this this brown material around the outside. These little flecks of brown um, was our uh, mono ketal and everything else was just unreacted uh, dye ketal. However, after that video finished, I put a call out on Reddit and said, does anyone have access to an NMR machine? Nuclear magnetic resonance, which which tells you sort of information about your, your uh, compound that allows you to identify it. Uh, it's a very common technique and I'm sure a lot of you watching will be familiar with this and I often refer to it as, uh, rather than NMR, just sort of one syllable as NMR. I've got a lot of comments of people who hate that, um, so I'm going to continue doing that. We got some NMR spectra of our compound, yes, because someone took me up on that. He doesn't really want to be named, but um, he's a former current chem guest. I was really worried about the tribromo because, you know, we didn't really do any purification on it, and, you know, there's nothing stopping di bromo ketal or tetrabromo ketal forming or this decomposing over time because it's been several months since I made it. it smells kind of weird it looks kind of yellow the spectra came up flawlessly no overbromination no underbromination nothing but fucking net beautiful and it continues recrystallized deals other product is very pure well, I mean it's not like sensationally pure but Sorry, I'm getting excited, I'm getting carried away. Even though there's several isomers of this you could form in the Dill's Outer Reaction, we didn't pick up any peaks of anything else in there. It's like 99% pure, this is. And you know what? It continues getting even better. Running this, we see that the bulk reaction mix <laughs> has a, a conversion to the monoketal of about 87% just in the bulk reaction mix, um, which is incredible. So even though in the last video I was really sort of depressed because I thought, oh, if we can run this for nine hours and you know it's only 10% converted, we're actually nearly there. The last bit of good news is the spectralized scent of the darker compound, that you know, enriched in the darker compound, is actually got less monoketal in it, which sort of didn't make much sense to me, but it really sort of shows us that this dark compound isn't a monoketal forming, it's really, just tar. <laughs> I, I don't think we're going to worry about, you know, the two different colors. We'll just run this for another couple of hours. We, we've shown that um, we've done reasonable conversion efficiency with the method already. So we'll just run another couple of hours and we're not expecting it all to go this different color. Absolutely beautiful. We're hitting this hard step, which is not this video. It's going to be next video. Uh, we're hitting this hard step really running. So what we're going to do is we're going to finish off converting this to the monoketal. And now that we have the monoketal in reasonable reasonable confidence, we're going to start planning out the UV step and the UV setup. So I'll, I'll be doing this in this video. Of course, I haven't done it before you can comment. So if you want to have suggestions on things I should change, you know, please, please suggest away. Here is our reaction mix, and you might remember from last time, the difficulty is that this is a biphasic reaction mix. So we've got hydrochloric acid in water, obviously, and the dichloromethane, and we need those two layers to mix, and that pushes out our reaction time. We ran this for about nine hours of reflux. From the NMR, we know it's progressed a reasonable way, but not all the way. So uh, I did ask for opinions on how we could speed this up. Uh, a lot of people told me to use carbon tet. Uh, I'm not gonna use carbon tet. <laughs> Thanks for the suggestions. There's a lot of other more obscure suggestions like uh, phase transfer, for reagents, but there was one obscure suggestion which I was really a fan of. Uh, I mentioned the word ultrasonic. So I've gotten this out of some rusty corner of the shed. Yeah, you, you might recognize this from, from quite some time ago. I, I used it before at some point for something. Given the small reaction volume and the fact that this can actually heat a water bath, 
<laughs> I want to try running the reaction mix in here. Um, but first, um, I wanted to have another go at TLC. There was a lot of sessions in the comments on how I could improve the TLC. Uh, for example, making this uh, potassium permanganate uh, stain basic. Apparently that helps a lot. And capillary tubes, where are they? Here they are. These aren't really thin enough now that I've got them. I could drag them out, you know, with a flame and make a really pointy end, but I'll have a go seeing using them as is. Required some ethyl acetate, um, so because the usual TLC reaction mixes are ethyl acetate and hexane mixes, um, but now I don't have any hexane. For now, we'll use whatever the leftover dichloromethane that I have is, which is like three mils, you know, sweet fuck all, but we'll make do. I mean, it's sort of working, uh, it sort of doesn't look so good, but earlier it, you could see those spots a little bit better and it's good I circled them, but the top dot's our starting product, there's our co-spot, so there's our, our two, two dots, and there's our mixture of our starting material and final product is that lower dot there. So if we consult some of these old TLCs from last time, see that top dot there, uh, our starting material, and then top dot um, smudged together with the bottom dot there so we're able to start uh, separating those two dots out um, if we make the dots uh, slightly smaller which we've done all right i'm going to give up on this uh, bath i think it's very good for like suspending particles in a liquid but it's not very good at, at mixing these two uh, biphasic mixtures you can see that bottom layer there i turn it on like it boils more the mixtures really aren't stirring anymore they're not really stirring together also the sound is horrendous sorry yeah, I sort of had to mute that in post, but yeah, the, the mixture isn't really mixing together. So I'm just going to go back to the ye olde hot plate and stir it because I've got to stop overthinking it. Fast and loose. We're trying to fucking do it fast and loose. So I've got to stop overthinking this. So it's had several more hours of reflux. Uh, it's since cooled down a week or so has passed, maybe two weeks, I don't know, time eludes me. But we've got some stuff crystallizing out of the reaction mix. It's probably because I didn't use enough dichloromethane, but um, I believe that's our product. It looks excellent, so I'm, I'm not gonna complain. I'm, I reckon I'm just gonna collect that solid. We'll call that our final product. I can't believe I fucking seize these joints like a fucking amateur. Yeah, don't need to grease anything. Just fucking take the thing off the heat and seal it up. Everything will be fucking fine. Fucking amateur. Yeah, big pair of pliers and gently trying to spin it. And when I say gently, I mean excessive amounts of force. But hey, it didn't crack the vial. So just, I think, fucking, I'm lucky. Get away with it, but that could have gone badly.
after drying off that acetone, we're left with uh, exactly one gram of um, pretty pure mono ketal. Well, I believe it's pretty pure mono ketal. Everything else that didn't uh, crystallize out from that reaction mix, I've kept, which will be a mix of the mono ketal and, and the diketal, I reckon. And we'll just use this um, when we run the reaction again, because um, I still have some uh, starting material, the diketal, to, to put in to um, make more mono ketal, because we'll need more than a gram going forward. Let's um, talk about the UV step and what's needed for that. So we need a source of UV for our UV reaction. And um, there's quite a few choices of lamps or like sources of UV to choose from. So we can have a look through the papers that we're following to see what they're using. In the 1989 paper, which is the most detailed out of all of them because they kind of list things that they tried and didn't work too well, they use quite a few of them, including um, sun lamps and just straight sunlight. Most of them do work. Uh, however, they only sort of work well on the small scale. Um, so they end up going to medium pressure mercury lamps uh, for large scale. But even, even the sunlight did actually work to convert, you know, gram amounts. And that's kind of what we're doing. We're, we're working on the gram amounts, obviously. So they did note when the reaction took a long time, so like several days or, or even longer, like, you know, uh, several weeks, um, you end up with a lot of sort of side products in there. So the faster you can do it, the more efficient you can do it. Uh, it's not only quicker, but it should be cleaner. So you're trying to do it um, you know, quite fast, quite quickly. When we go to these, um, these other two papers, the 1997 and the 2013 one, they are using, once again, these medium pressure mercury lamps, but they say they're trying to hit the region between 300 and 350 nanometers. And what's sort of a little strange about this setup is that they're intentionally using borosilicate glass here because they're, it's a little unclear, but I think it's because um, they're using that borosilicate glass as a filter sort of for the shorter wavelengths of the lamp. So they don't want anything below 300 nanometers really getting to the reaction mix. Instead of using quartz, usually there's a quartz reaction set up um, because quartz is transparent down to there. But when you go to borosilicate, it doesn't uh, transmit those lower wavelengths. So if everyone's using a medium pressure mercury lamp, then I suppose I should be using a medium pressure mercury lamp, but I don't have one. They're expensive. I don't know where I'm gonna get one from. I've got a slightly more nicer and more available source of UV. This here, is a reptile lamp. It's not very high wattage, it's only 25 watts, which is, uh, you know, like nearly a 20th as powerful as the ones being used in the paper because they're what, 400, 500 watt lamps. However, a lot of the light that this produces is in the correct range uh, because we need UVB light for this reaction, sort of 300, 350 nanometers, and that's the light region that the reptiles need. I don't really know how reptiles work, but yeah, so it's got a bit of a spectrum on the back here, but we can actually confirm that spectrum ourselves because I have a fiber coupled spectrometer here, as, as you do um, for reasons. Uh, I bought this a while ago. We can use this to um, measure the spectrum that's coming out of our lamp here. So I'll try not to shine it into my eyes because that it does put out quite a bit of UV. Shouldn't really putting my skin in the way of it, but um, it won't be on for very long, so that's right. Put it on there and uh, I'll click acquire. Yeah, so here's the spectrum here. There's quite a few lines, quite bright, sharp lines. Um, the spectrometer is quite reasonable, so it can resolve um, these pretty well. Um, better than better than this box art does. We see this lump here um, from 300 to 350, and that's kind of our region. It's, it's not a whole lot of light, <laughs> like percentage-wise is coming out in that region, but I'm hoping it might be enough. The advantage of using a lamp like this um, that's reasonably low wattage is that it won't put out a whole lot of heat. If we use something like a sun lamp, it puts out a whole lot of infrared as well, put out so much heat that we'll need to actively cool the reaction, which will be hard to do because I'm not very good at engineering something like that. Um, and we're running it in DCM, so we don't want to like boil our reaction mix constantly. This lamp is what I'm thinking to use for the UV step. So let me know in the comments if you think that's a good idea or I should go some stupidly high powered sun lamp. But I think using this sort of makes sense because it's in the right range but not stupidly powerful. So we might get away with it, but it might not work. So we'll have to see. We're here at a very important step today and I'm very excited. And I know a lot of people are very excited about this step because we get to dip our toes into the deep, murky, uh, slightly frightening ocean that is photochemistry. Wasn't certain we we're ever going to make it this far through the synthesis to get to try out this step, but here we are, we get to try out the photochemistry, do the UV step. I think this is one of the most important steps in the synthesis because it's kind of, for me, I think it's a bit of a bottleneck in the synthesis. It seems like the hardest to get right. 
it's hard to know when you when it's working and when it's not working and also it's it doesn't scale up very well so it's a bottleneck both on the on the lab scale here like the home lab scale because it's hard to know when you, you're doing it right or not but it's also a bottleneck on the industrial scale because it's very hard to scale up if we can manage this step very well then um, I don't think there'll be any issues for the entire synthesis because the next couple of steps are comparatively um, a lot more straightforward well uh, that's what I think anyway. I'm not going to make any big claims because it could fall down at any point. Okay, so what's actually happening with the chemistry? We've made this molecule, which we call the monoketal, because it's got one ketal group and the other one's a ketone. And we've got two double bonds sort of on the either side of the molecule. What the aim is, is we're going to excite those double bonds with UV light and it will cause a, a sort of a ring closure. So the molecule will sort of... Uh, the two double bonds will react and it will sort of pinch in on itself. So it's going to form what's called a cage molecule. So I suppose we can call it like the cage ketal. Still got that ketal group on there and we'll have to remove that in the next step. We're forming that cage molecule so we want it to sort of fold in on itself. And that's what's starting to form that cube. So this is the important sort of cube forming step. But yeah, a lot of the synthesis is setting up this molecule so it allows this internal sort of cyclization to happen. It's not, is it a cyclization? I don't know. It's forming that cage. So that, that's what's happening. To do this, we need to excite those double bonds, but only those double bonds. So we don't want to excite anything else because that will lead to side reactions. And we know where the absorption line of those double bonds are from the paper we're following. It's about 300 to 350 nanometers. I talked about this a little bit in the end of the last video, but it's important to note this range because if we're too into the red, so say we do 365 or 395, which are common LED wavelengths, and you can get a lot of power out of there, it's too it's too into the red. We're not going to absorb into those um, double bonds. However, if we go too short a wavelength, so if we say we use an unfiltered mercury lamp and it's putting out sort of 200, 250 nanometers, we're going to absorb into uh, the rest of the molecule, other parts of the molecule, and drive all these side reactions. So we don't want that. So we want a very targeted range. Now, the advantage of the reptile lamp is that it produces pretty much exactly where we want it to. It's got um, a reasonably high UVB output, which is that sort of 300 to 350 nanometer range. The downside is that it's not very high wattage. So this is still only 25 watts. And um, the comment section, I'd say, was pretty split on whether this was a good idea or not. Some people said they genuinely tried this in a lab setting and it totally sucked, it didn't work. Some people said they tried this in in a lab setting and it actually did work. So uh, I'm inclined to just try it. We have it. Um, it's the most over-the-counter sort of UV source. Mercury lamps start getting a little bit specialist, I suppose, but if we can achieve it with this sort of over-the-counter reptile lamp, that plays into the overall theme of this Cubane series where we're just trying to do things from the hardware store and, you know, the pet store. I don't know how well it's going to work. I don't know if it's going to work at all, um, but let's, let's try it out and see if we can start forming the dang cage. All right, so we're using UV light, which is a bit of a safety concern. So I was thinking if I can like enclose everything in this plastic box, then we should be able to sort of make it a bit safer because uh, the UV won't be able to escape this plastic very well. Um, so it won't be a danger to be around this when it's on. So what I was thinking is if I could like put this in the wall here, have this hot part like on the outside and then have this blasting into the chamber, and have the reaction set up in here. That could work well, I guess, and then we could run it with a lid on or whatever. So I just need to like put a hole here. Fuck it, let's do it, why not? See how we go. We need to consider safety, so this is uh, my enclosed space for safety. Thanks a lot. Oh, 
every time I pick up a power tool, it always ends in fucking disaster. <laughs> I'm so bad at engineering. Anyway, nothing a bit of tape and a bit of glue can't fix. Whatever, you know, the reflector's in there. Let's, uh, let's get the bulb in there. Yeah, all right. So the box might work well as a protective barrier, but uh, I think it won't work well in terms of uh, efficiency because any bit of UV light that doesn't hit our sample in there is gonna hit the sides of these plastic and be absorbed. So we kinda want that to be reflected back in. So even though it's probably gonna make it look horrendous, I kinda wanna <laughs> put a lot of aluminium around here because aluminium has pretty good re reflectivity in the UV. Uh, that's what this reflector is made out as well because um, all that light comes out of the globe in all directions, um, but then it gets pushed forward by this aluminium reflector. Glasses on, and right, sure. Sure, that's a, that's a thing. Okay, so the most ideal, uh, I suppose, flask or container for uh, our material is something very thin. In the paper we're following, they use uh, normal borosilicate glassware um, and that's so that the walls, the Pyrex walls, strip out the real short wavelengths, which they don't want. Um, our lamp doesn't produce any of those short wavelengths, so that's not really going to be so much of an issue. So we don't really have to worry about the glass thickness. So this is probably the best bet. It's a test tube, at least I can stopper it properly. Um, that stopper does fit in there. And it's nothing specialised, it's just a test tube really. Um, but uh, yeah, so that would sit, I'm thinking, something like that. Uh, my normal clamp stand doesn't fit in the box, I've just realised, so um, I've just sort of made something up to make it sit nicely. But uh, yeah, that, that sits there, you know, in front of the lamp. We chug it on and uh, let it run. I mean, this is what I've sort of visualised the reactor would look like. So, you know, if it doesn't work, then that's a problem with my uh, thinking. Not so much with the, the actual equipment. So, um, yeah, shit. So we have our solvent here. This is uh, dichloromethane and methanol. Bit of a mixture. This is what comes straight out of the paint stripper. Um, and so what I would usually do now is I'd wash the dichloromethane to get rid of all the methanol and then redistill. But I'm thinking about doing this a bit fast and loose and just using this as is um, because we could probably use dichloromethane or methanol for our solvent for this UV reaction. So a mix of it is fine. So we don't need to purify it further than this. A little bit of water at the top, which um, you know isn't great, but uh, it should be reasonably dry enough. It doesn't have to be super dry. I think, once again, fast and loose. We're just gonna just you know take some solvent from the middle. So probably end up using five mils of solvent for about half a gram of solid. That's about the ratio that the, the paper we're following uses. You know, one kilo for 10 liters of solvent. So we're scaling that down quite a bit. But one thing I don't know is I don't know how much the lamp heats up um, the mixture. Our solid's pretty precious, so I don't want it boiling off or uh, getting ruined real quickly. So I, I, I want to test how, how much heat um, we're producing because if it gets really hot, we can like turn the lamp on for an hour and then off for an hour and on for an hour. But um, if it doesn't get really hot, then we can just leave it on for all the time and then, you know, it won't take nearly as long. So I might just put five mils of solvent in there without anything else in there and just see how hot it gets. Okay, five mils is not enough in this. <laughs> container and the clamp's in totally the wrong spot. So maybe I'll put that up to 10 mils and we'll just do half the concentration um, because we're illuminating a, a large area, then maybe a lower concentration will help anyway, potentially. So we'll put 10 mils in, why not? We've got solvent to burn for a change. Not the best of setups, but it is floating in there in front of the lamp. So let's chuck it on, why not? Sure. Uh, we'll come back in a little bit and see <laughs> if the temperature's warmed up or uh, we've lost all solvent. Actually, we might draw where that solvent line is. So then um, if, uh, if we lose any solvent, then at least we know we lose some solvent. So, all right, 30 minutes later, let's have a look. 
I mean, there's a bit of heat coming off the lamp. I can feel that. Solvent level hasn't dropped. All right, keep it going. We'll keep it going. We need to run it for longer than half an hour for the real reaction, so. Also, people will probably comment, hey, just use sunlight. But um, I hate to inform you, but it does actually rain here sometimes too. And it's not always sunny because it's the middle of winter here currently. Fuck, it's rained a whole week. Um, next week it'll be sunny and it was sunny the week before, but um, you know, this is rainy week. Once a year, we have uh, a couple of days of rain and then that's it. It's uh, blaring sunlight for the rest of it. But um, I fucking have uh, picked rainy week to be, um, you know, one week I'm trying to do a UV reaction. Yeah, the sun is somewhere in the sky. I don't even own an umbrella. There's the sun. There he is. What are you doing? Just gone over 90 minutes uh, continuously. Uh, turn him off. It's slightly warmer in here, not really. Um, you can feel the radiant heat coming off that bowl, but once again, this sort of shielding isn't hot. None of this is hot. This is no real warmer than the outside temperature. Solvent level's pretty good, so the stopper seems to be keeping it in. It doesn't really look like the right size stopper, but this is the stopper I got sent with it. Whoever sent me this, thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've greased this stopper as well, so. All right, well, there's literally nothing to complain about for now. We can definitely do 90 minutes, two hours at a time, probably longer, uh, without worrying about the heating up and solvent loss and all that, so. Um, this is good, yeah, good. I don't have to bloody do any, like, control stuff. <laughs> I just plug it in and let it run. Perfect. That's what I want. All right, let's do it. We have our mono key towel. This is one gram. We'll use half of it. We'll use half a gram. Weigh it out, put it into our solvent. Here we already have our 10 mils of uh, mostly DCM, a little bit of methanol. Hopefully it all dissolves in the solvent. That's an important step. But uh, let's get it happening. Why not? Alright, that dissolved to form a, uh, I would say, perfectly clear solution. We've got one or two floaty bits in there. Just always seem to creep in because I, I'm doing things in a shed. <laughs> so, uh, it's time to start the clock, I guess. Sure. Goodbye. Good luck. We'll see it again in, oh, I suppose, an hour or so. Alright, it's been an hour, it's been an hour. I mean, a whole dang hour. Let's have a look. I mean, nothing has changed. What am I expecting after an hour? I don't know. I'm gonna have to like monitor this with like TLC, aren't I? Nothing magical has happened after one hour. So that's fine. Um, I'm gonna have to think about TLC for it. Hey, whatever, cool. It's fine, it's going, it's working. Maybe, who knows? Goodbye. Oi, why oh, you flaming galahs, get off the lawn. Stop eating the lawn. God, look how they ruin the grass. They're like eating the roots and shit. They dig it up. Yeah, I see ya. I'm gonna get ya. Oh yeah. Just hit two and a half hours. What am I expecting to see? Oh, it's a little warmer in here. Yeah, it's just the same. I <laughs> haven't worked out how to do the TLC yet. And by worked out, I mean, I know what I'm doing. I just haven't got around to it. Hopefully after two and a half hours, we start to see the formation of something else, even if it's a small amount. Hey, it didn't blow up. My, my, my expectations for this are very low. So the fact that it didn't blow up means that um, it's already exceeding expectations. <laughs> All right, it is very late at night. I still haven't done the TLC, but hey, good news. Uh, I ran this for another two hours. <laughs> it's fine. All right, all right, we'll approach it. The wires are lit slightly off. That's fine. Oh, now I can't see shit. Uh, I didn't think this through. Hold on. Hold on, where's the switch? Uh, interesting observation. So we're at the four and a half hour mark under the lamp, and uh, it's no longer a perfectly clear solution. 
a little subtle, but you know, it was perfectly clear when we first put it in, and now it is a slight brown color. Of course, that's probably just due to tar. All right, so here we are at the TLC station. I'm not that excited to do TLC. Uh, it takes up a lot of time, but uh, it's it's the best way of monitoring um, if this reaction is actually doing anything. We've got a few things to do. We've got to remake the permanganate stain. I've left the last stain out just in the light and in the air, and it's been like a month, so it looks like crap. People have said that they didn't really like the look of that stain anyway, so I will be making the stain to an exact recipe that someone posted in the comments. I think a few different people posted this exact formulation in the comments, so I'm inclined to believe it. So we'll do that. And if I keep it out of the light and with a lid on, it might last for more than a week. So we'll do that. We're gonna make more spotters out of these uh, uh, glass capillary tubes. I'm just gonna be using this DCM methanol uh, mixture as an elucent. Hopefully it works. It's like incredibly fast and loose because like it's still wet. I really should do a DCM distillation out of this, but um, I just can't be bothered. So I haven't got around to it yet. We're not gonna be using any of this hexane fraction that I sort of half-heartedly made last video i mean it's mostly evaporated anyway now it's crap but we've got you know a, a sample here at the two and a half hour mark under the lamp and the four and a half hour mark under the lamp and also the starting material so we'll run those three lanes and see if if any new spots develop over those uh, those three lanes um at the two and a half and four and a half hour mark you know hopefully if there are new spots they they you know separate in uh random allutant solvent allutant solvent allutant Yes. Okay, the good news is uh, the stain looked like it worked really well. Uh, that worked better, so thanks for the recipe. The bad news is it doesn't look like we got very much separation. Either that or we've just formed no product, but that uh, I don't think that's the case. It's probably because our, our allutant solvent, allutant solvent, allutant is just too polar. So it's <laughs> just too much methanol and too much water in this solvent. Yeah, shit. Um, I'm going to have to bloody distill the DCM out of this and get pure DCM. Okay, so removing the methanol uh, from the DCM did uh, did lower the dots. Um, you know, that's where they were when we had the methanol in there, and now you can see they've moved down. I mean, slightly. I don't want to say distilling the DCM was a waste of time, but it was a waste of time. Anyway, so this was the starting material after four hours and after 12 hours, and we're not really seeing much else apart from these <laughs> dots here. So I'm starting to come around uh, to thinking that maybe 
we've barely done anything to our starting material after 12 hours. You know, maybe it's not separating from here. Maybe, maybe, but I, I, I think it should. Yeah, we're just gonna run it under the lamp for some several more hours, quite a few more hours, and just see if we can do anything here. I really did think 12 hours we should at least start seeing the start of something, but um, not seeing anything after 12 hours really um, doesn't doesn't make this look good. I'll be honest. It has been 22 hours under the lamp. Wow, it is really raining outside. <laughs> um, it's pretty brown these days. Yeah, we've got to run the TLC, see what see what's happening, see if anything at all shows up after 22 hours. <laughs> I'm not going to bother filming it. I'm I'm sick of filming TLCs. Was oh, that some sunlight? Ooh. It has been flooding. All right, anyway. Could it be an extremely faint dot appearing? So on this plate, all three lanes are the 21 hour mark. Uh, they're just at different concentrations. So this first column has developed the, the best. And look here, look, it's a very faint dot. You know, it's not great. The reason I'm going on and on about this is TLC is quite sensitive. So we should be seeing a new product as a separate distinct dot below 10%, really. I, I would imagine if we had 10% of a different product, it should show up on TLC. It, it, it should really show up even much below that, you know. Um, on the other hand, potentially, um, maybe the stain doesn't really work on this because maybe the stain works really well here because we've got two double bonds in the structure, it's unsaturated, whereas our product here is saturated. So maybe the permanganate stain doesn't uh, change color quite as nicely for it. I'm not sure, but um, I mean, I suppose this is good news. This is the first time we're seeing evidence of a, a distinct product. Here we go, here's the plate after 24 hours of lamp time and that's spread across two weeks, which is less than optimal, but I, I like to be here when it's running. Um, so uh, yeah, it's only really when I'm in the lab am I running the lamp, so, so that's why that 24 hours is spread across two weeks. All three lanes, once again, are from um, the 24 hour. And look, we have more dots, more than one, but uh, more than two now. Um, I've had this bottom line here in, in a lot of plates. You can see it's very faintly here. Um, and I've sort of always discounted it because it sort of came through as a line uh, rather than like individual dots in individual lanes. But um, it sort of looks like it's resolving into dots now. It may be a, once again, uh, an artifact that the stain, the permanganate stain doesn't really pick up um, these sort of saturated products very well without the double bonds. A few of you would be screaming at me right now saying, why the fuck hasn't he got a fluorescent lamp and having a look at them under UV? I'm a bit of an idiot and I thought these weren't fluorescently backed. Um, so I never got a torch for it, but I went back and looked and they are fluorescently backed. And I thought they weren't fluorescently backed because I used my UV torch and saw that uh, it didn't light up at all. But this is a 395 nanometer UV torch and turns out you need 254 nanometer light. So um, this torch won't show up the fluorescent compound in the plate. So yes, um, we need to get that lamp, but it's getting shipped from overseas and that's very slow. So that will take weeks. Look, we only want one other product. So it looks like we've got two other products coming through which isn't great. Um, I've no idea what they are. You know, this could be product and tar. This could be tar and tar. Who knows? <laughs> All right, so we've run it for 24 hours. It's pretty tarry. You can see how discolored it is now. You know, that was perfectly clear going in and now it's definitely gone yellow. Fucking, of course it has. Look, I could keep running this under the lamp for more hours. I don't know if I'm wasting my time doing this. So I'm going to, I won't say cheat, rely on some, once again, some very generous help someone else has offered to run an NMR for me. So I will dry this out, I'll remove the solvent, uh, take the raw reaction mix here, send it off for analysis, and that analysis will be able to tell me if any of the product is formed and in what ratio. Last time we sent material off for analysis, the analysis came back with very good news. So maybe, maybe that will happen again. Um, no promises. We have evidence very faint evidence that we might be forming our product. And that's the best I can give you, I think, at this stage. So we're gonna pretend that we have product fucking at least 
10 micrograms of product. If our analysis comes back and we're saying, oh, maybe there's 2% of product there, if it's taken us 24 hours of lamp time to get to 2%, I'm not really going to run it for, for hundreds of hours. If it comes back and say maybe it's 30 to 40%, unlikely, but it might, we could run it for three days. Potentially I could get a second one of these identical lamps and put it on the other side of the box. I have a feeling a lot of comments will tell me just get a dang mercury lamp, but it's not that easy. Where do I even buy a, a mercury lamp from? I've got to pay for it and you know, money doesn't grow on trees here in Australia, it's plastic. How do I even run it? I think this is only rated for 150 watts and some mercury lamps aren't self ballasted so I need a ballast and I don't know what the fuck that even is. I hope to use this lamp but uh, if it's going to take hundreds of hours, that's too long. <laughs> this is too long. So please, any ideas in the comments for what we can do to speed this up and actually make it work, assuming that we've got a couple of percent of products and this lamp does work but is just extremely slow, what can we do? throw this lamp in the bin and get a completely new one. Do I get eight lamps? <laughs> That's a lot of money. Uh, and just focus it all in there. That will probably get very hot. Looking forward to your thoughts, but thanks for watching. Um, I'll see you next time, hopefully with the analysis results. And um, for now, we can be in denial and say that everything is all good. So in that last video, we got that UVB light, so in that 300 to 350 nanometer range, from a reptile lamp, the UVB bulb, and it didn't really seem to work. At the end of that video, I said, we're gonna send off the sample for analysis, and, and I did that. First, what I did is I uh, evaporated down that sample. I didn't use any heat, I just bubbled some air into the, um, the dichromethane to try and strip it off. And uh, it didn't just go yellow, it didn't just tar up, we got yellow tar <laughs> out of that. So it was not a very good sign. So I sent it off for some NMR analysis. As you might expect from, from the tar, we got a big forest of peaks and, and it's a big mess of compounds and it's not particularly, I think, what we want at all. Well, we don't want this, obviously, but we can't identify any of the peaks in there to be it, it, our materials. Whether or not we never form the material, or maybe we did form the material and I destroyed it when I evaporated it down, I don't know, but we ended up with this yellow tar. We've got to really start again this step and, and do it better. It is worth noting, however, with the with the NMR analysis that I sent off, I also sent off some starting material. We hadn't had a look at this one yet. It was perfect. <laughs> Once again, we've managed to do something over 99% purity. Uh, in the garage here. We still have half a gram of 99% purity um, mono ketal, and we've just got to get to, you know, do this cyclization photochemistry reaction just a little bit better, I think. I think we're close. Even though we ended up with yellow tar, I feel like we're close. I feel, I feel like it. Maybe I'm being too optimistic, but that's what I feel like. We need to make three improvements in this video, which cover pretty much everything. We need to fix the light source. We've got to fix the sample container, the vessel we put the stuff in, and we've got to fix the TLC. We've got to improve all of those things, and then I think we've got a chance of actually uh, completing this step better. So light source, I said uh, before that I was using the, the reptile lamp, which I got to say, it was not really that popular in the comment section. People wanted me to use LEDs or, or a high powered mercury lamp or something like that. And I really wanted to use a reptile lamp because it's funny. <laughs> I just want to use a reptile lamp because it sort of fits the theme of the series in the sense that if I buy a, a photochemistry industrial mercury lamp, it's not like a hardware store thing. Maybe, maybe you can get them from a hardware store, but and I haven't really easily been able to find some good LEDs uh, in that 300 to 350 nanometer range. Most UV LEDs are at 365 and 395. I do actually have some UV LEDs at university um, in the range. I obviously can't bring them here, but uh, I thought I'd show them off anyway, because people keep asking about them in the comments, so I'll show them now very briefly. But yeah, we do get reasonable light out in the right range from these bulbs and not a whole lot of heat. There's not a whole lot of IR coming out of these lamps. In this video, I'm gonna do something that's even more unpopular. <laughs> Instead of using one lamp, what about two reptile lamps? Yeah, you... you, you... <laughs> I think that'll be good, all right? And with two lamps, we can have two reflectors. Like a lot of people suggested they wanted like a mirror or a parabolic mirror to kind of focus in the light. But if we have two reflectors opposite each other, then the light should, 
you know, be good, right? It should bounce around in there and... Right? Now onto the glass. I was using this test tube last time. Still looks a bit dirty, but uh, I'm not sure why I chose this one. I, I don't think it was a very wise choice. It's quite thick glass, and uh, glass like this would absorb quite a lot of UV light in that range. So I think it was blocking a lot of the light from getting to our solution. Ideally, I'd be able to do something in quartz or something. I sh shouldn't need quartz in this range, but using really thick borosilica glass, like a lot of people pointed out, was a bit of a stupid move. So instead, I'm going to use something like this. This is a this is a vial. It's got it's got thin walls, right? They're not super super thin, but they're at least a lot thinner than what we're using before. If they're half as thin, they're going to let through quite a lot more UV light. Once again, it would be better if I had quartz, but I can't find something that's quartz that I can seal for cheap. Let's say I'm sure I can get stuff, but I'm not going to spend hundreds of dollars on a reaction vial for this project because that kind of feels like it defeats the purpose. Although I probably spend that much just on getting reptile lamps and reflexes. So <laughs> I don't really know anymore. Lastly, TLC. Uh, TLC. Uh, I'm not really making a secret of the fact that I'm not really enjoying this TLC section of the videos, but um, we can do better. I think people have suggested other stains we can try. I've also got a UV light. You say, well, funny hell, Tom, you've got UV lights already. Why didn't you just use them? Well, no, it's a proper mercury lamp. Well, it's like a quartz tube mercury lamp thing here. You say, well, there's a quartz tube. But yes, it's open at both ends. I take this apart and I can't seal it. Anyway, point being, this puts out 254 nanometers. So it's too short for our photochemistry reaction, but it allows us to visualize the TLC plate. So we can see on the plate where the dots are without having to do a stain. So if our stain doesn't show up our spot, we can we can use the light. Well, we just use the light first to see that if the spots show up. Being optimistic, I think they will. So maybe the UV torch will be better than the stain uh, to actually see our final product spot if we actually make some. There's a lot of improvements. We've got a lot of chemistry to do, a lot of photochemistry to run once again. So let's get into it. So this series, I've been getting everything from the hardware store and I've been getting my dichloromethane from this paint stripper, 870 grams per liter dichloromethane in this sort of goopy mess with methanol. I'm sick of this. I'm sick of doing the dichloromethane distillation. I just went out and bought some from a, from a chemical supply company. This was nearly, I think, actually, including shipping, I think it was over $100 for this one litre of dichloromethane, which has a label, but I'm not showing that because they're not sponsoring me and I'm not sure they want to be on a home chemistry channel. So, yes, I think most people would rather me actually finish this series rather than spending my time just doing the same thing, which I've already done before, which is incredibly boring both to view and to do. So this is a UV sensor, so apparently it changes a different colour if it, if it gets UVB light on it. So you can use it to sense whether it's appropriate levels for your lizard. So we'll put it under the light for 10 seconds. Ah, oh, look, it's already going in a different colour. Yeah, see it's purple. Right, so we're getting quite a lot of UVB. So now we've got the UV sensor um, and we've got that glass in front of it. This is the, uh, the tube we used last time. So we'll chuck this on. Obviously if the glass is completely transparent to the UV, we should see no difference where the glass is blocking the light and where it isn't. Yeah, you can see a line there. All right, so now for a comparison between uh, the vial and the test tube, which we used last time. So hopefully there's less of a less of a noticeable difference with the vial. We'll chuck it on. Yeah, you can see that line, line there where the first tube was. But there's not really a difference with the head across here. Yeah, that's showing what I want it to. I don't know if it's confirmation bias, but thanks lizard card, thanks reptile lamp. All right, so we've got the second lamp and reflector. Um, and if I wanted to make this symmetrical, I guess I'd put this other one in here. I do feel like it would be cool if we could put this closer and like really concentrate the light. It's tempting even just to like <laughs> do that and then put the, put the uh, sample in there, but probably get way too hot in there. So I mean, if I put it somewhere like here, I mean, I might have to do some cooling, like a fan, and I'll just, you know, blow some air across here. That seems, that seemed about right. It's good airflow. Obviously I'll cut some holes in both sides so we get some airflow from outside the box. We're not just recirculating the, uh, the hot air. Put this one on, and then this one on. This is good. 
It's a lot of bricks in there, but I'll just cover the bricks in aluminium foil and it, it'll look like it's part of it. Oh yeah, space age bricks. That's space agey. Fuck, I've had too much coffee. Look, I like vibrating. <laughs> Glad I'm not trying to do surgery or careful alignment right now. And as per always, my uh, work with a power tool I describe as adequate, but barely. <laughs> it's never a nice job. But look, I, I, I drew myself some guidelines and then didn't follow them in the slightest, really. So, But yeah, look, it runs. Got some air inlets, air outlets. I feel that air coming out. Yeah, I mean, it could be worse. It, it could definitely be worse. I'd hate to think how it could be worse, but here we are. All right, so here we have some dichloromethane. It's just plain dichloromethane. I want to see, once again, if it heats up too much or we have some leaking out of these um, vials. We've got some Teflon tape underneath the lid. We've got some electrical tape on the outside of the lid. And we're just going to wrap the lid in some aluminium foil so this plastic or whatever material it is doesn't get too embrittled by the intense UV light. That's probably overthinking it, but, you know, um, that's what this channel is all about. I will do that better. I can't do that one-handed. All right, you can see that solvent line is there. So we're going to see if this drops or the whole thing blows up or, or something. I don't know. Let's go. Okay, so fans on. Light one. Light two. Let it go. All right. Godspeed. All right, it's been close to an hour and a half. Let's have a look. What's in here? What's going on? Fan still running. Doesn't look like it's exploded. It's a bit warm. We haven't lost too much solvent. It's 30 odd degrees. It's hot, but I mean, it's like 30 degrees everywhere at the moment because that's like the room temperature. So we probably can run for an hour, hour or two. Hey, you know, the solvent level hasn't gone down. Haven't really had any leaks, so it's fine. So one of the problems with the TLC in the last video, our choice of TLC solvent. So we were just using uh, straight dichloromethane as the elutin solvent in the jar, which uh, the elutin solvent is what drags uh, spots, uh, materials up the plate. A lot of people are talking about hexanes and, and, you know, hexane mixtures. I don't have hexanes. I could, you know, distill some petrol down, etc. I've done that before. It's a bit of work. So I had a different suggestion. Someone, well, I think a few people maybe suggested this. I just got this recently. It's Shellite. Um, which is just a brand name and it says it's 100% hydrocarbon liquid. So I'm pretty sure this is just a like a, a light petroleum, like a petroleum naphtha, is that what people call it? Apparently, this might work as, as a good TLC solvent. We'll have to see. Right, let's, let's try it out. So I'll just grab some of our starting material, which is the monoketal, and we'll spot that onto the plate. Also check with our UV light if we can see the spots as well as they're developing. So I'll just dissolve up some of our, our starting material in some dichloromethane, spot them onto the plate, run it with the shellite as the uh, TLC solvent. Okay, it appears our spots have not moved. You can see those two spots at the bottom. Unless, unless they're not just showing up under the UV light, but let's um, let's give it a stain and see if we can see any more dots. But it looks like they're, they're at the bottom there. Here we go, you can see our dots didn't move at all. They're both still on the baseline there, and we've got no other dots. And we know our compound is pure from the uh, NMR analysis, so yes. Maybe maybe people suggested other solvents. I can't remember, maybe it was a mix of shellite and something else. Maybe I'm misremembering. We want um, higher polarity stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go see if I can find what people said. <laughs> let's go, let's go troll some comments. Or was it on Discord or Twitter? Or was it in the subreddit? Let's go troll the internet. Uh, it was 5 to 10% acetone in shellite. That was the suggestion. 
which makes a whole lot more sense. I like this because it's like just two hardware store solvents. They're basically next to each other on the shelf. We can control the polarity level with our level of acetone. That's good. Okay, let's make let's make a 10% acetone, I guess by mass, um, solution in the jar. Let's let's try that. Hey, look at that. We moved them up. So they're now like a third of the way in 10% acetone. Let's go more acetone. So maybe 25% acetone. And while we're there as well, turn this off. We might as well, because we've been using all these TLC plates, might as well run a TLC of this horrible yellow tar, um, which was our end product from last time, to see if we see any other spots as well under the UV. All right, yep, and okay, 25% acetones, move them about halfway. That, that seems okay, quite great, actually. Um, although, what isn't showing up is, because I've got the starting material and then two um, final product lines with the yellow tar lines. Well, you can see one dot showing up in each of those lines, which is probably the starting material. Well, it looks like the starting material. So I guess you can't see the other spots, the other compounds under the UV light. So I guess they're not UV active. So let's, um, let's stain it and see if we can see the spots that way. But... That would be a bit depressing if that's the case. Nothing, really. So maybe we need a different stain. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe. Hmm. Oh well, at least we've got a better solvent now. So I suppose it's time to finally actually get our product out, put it in the dichloromethane, and then put it in front of the lamp. I think we only have half a gram left. It doesn't even look like half a gram. But I'm going to be very conservative now because I know this is good, so I kind of want to keep some, I guess, for future reference. So, uh, let's go 0.2 grams. Okay, so we've done uh, three and a half hours and nothing is showing up underneath the torch here. Well, our starting material is showing up. The first line is a starting line. Um, there's a bit of smear, but it's probably just over concentrated. There's a co-spot in the middle and the final product spot. So you can see that that starting material is still there in each of them. So there is another possibility here that we are making the product, but we're just not seeing it with the UV torch and we're not seeing it with the stain, the permanganate stain. I don't think it's very likely, but it is something that does come up in the comments a lot. I think people are thinking that maybe it won't absorb the UV, our, our final product, the cage molecule won't absorb the UV and won't show up in the permanganate stain. So the suggestion was to use an iodine chamber. It's just a different way of developing the spots, maybe more sensitive to our target final compound. I think I have some iodine lying around. I'm not entirely certain any of my iodine is any good. We've got this one from uh, 2015, which I'm pretty sure is shot. I've stored this in a plastic container, and while it smells like iodine, I don't think there's anything in there. Iodine doesn't store that well, especially in plastic. I don't know why I thought, I mean, it's 2015, uh, you know. If anyone's gonna make mistakes, it's me in 2015. All that iodine is absorbed into the plastic. I'm gonna throw that out. Uh, this one, a little bit more promising, because it looks like it's in some glass, and it's from 2017, November 2017. So, you know, only a few years ago. Uh, problem is, <laughs> it's, the, it's pulled a vacuum on this jar and I, and I can't open it so um, I'm gonna have to really try and 
force my way into this jar. There is some staining on this tissue here, so that's not a good sign. But let's let's see if we can crack into this. embarrassing. Can't open a jar on my fucking YouTube channel. Uh, it looks like shit anyway because it's all liquid. I must have not have dried off the iodine before storing it, but I don't know why I did that. I don't know why the jar has sealed itself. I did find some more iodine. I thought I had some lying around. This ampule here, this is beautiful stuff. Beautiful. Look at this. Lovely. It's in this big jar with some bromine. Look how much bromine I've still got. Fuck yeah. I obviously made that, but I, I, I forget things. I forget things. So, you know, <laughs> that'll be useful when we have to redo this cubane synthesis. We need more bromine for the tribromination step. So it's good we got bromine to go back and redo that. But uh, crack open this beautiful ampule that stored this really well. It always feels a little bit of a shame to crack open an ampule that I've made. But I've got to do it. That's the point of it. That's the point of them. The iodine does work. Wow, it fades very quickly. <laughs> but, um, oh God, in the two minutes it took me to work out how to do filming, all the dots have faded. But we did we did develop the dots um, here as we'd expect them to, as we saw from the UV light. And we did get another roll of dots. Yeah, a third way up, and then two thirds is sort of our, our starting material dot. But the, the spot was um, in all three lane so it just looks like a small contaminant very small contaminant from our starting material i mean it could be the final product and you know we're forming a small amount of the final product in the starting material just because it's ambiently getting exposed to uv but i think that's a bit too much wishful wishful thinking so here's a tlc plate after um what five and a half hours yeah so each each of those lanes is a five and a half hours it's just at different concentrations and if i get the reflections right you see there's two spots in there so the top dot um, is our starting material and we know that just because we've run previous tlc's and that's where the top dot runs with this particular solvent ratio but we have that dot about a third of the way up which is interesting because it doesn't show up under the uv light or the permanganate stain well actually i should Maybe I'll take this plate out and run it in the permanganate stain. It might not be very good going from iodine stain to permanganate stain because the iodine stain might not make the permanganate stain then work. But I have a feeling that that spot doesn't show up. If that's the case, that, that might might well be our final product. And that same plate with the permanganate stain doesn't really show up that spot line, which is uh, very interesting. It wasn't really what I was expecting. Um, but, you know, well done to the people in the comments that thought that might have been the case. That, you know, doesn't show up on the permanganate stain and will show up on the iodine stain. So, I think maybe as I was drying this plate out you could faintly see the dots. But it was only because I knew what I was looking for because of the iodine stain. So I knew where they were supposed to be because of the iodine stain. From now on, let's let's leave the permanganate stain aside and just go with the, the iodine stain from now on. So excited. This is textbook stuff. Hold on, as long as it hasn't faded already. Yeah, it's fading, but it's fantastic. So we have our starting material dot here, no dot here. With our co-spot, we have a dot there and there. And with our final product, we have a small dot here with the starting material and then our final product dot. Fantastic. So everything appears to be working. Well, I, I can only assume that this is the final product we actually want, not just some sort of tar formation. Gosh, that fades fast. It's separating nicely on the TLC we can actually see it under the under the iodine stain you know we can't really see it too well see it a little bit I think it's just because the iodine stain has brought that out 
So it does appear to be working. Everything appears to be working. Uh, just, just slow. You might be able to see, even from a distance, uh, our solution looks a little different. Say the line, God damn yellow chemistry. It's, it's had uh, it's, uh, eight and a half hours under the lamp. It's only had an hour today, and, and why it's gone yellow is actually because I left it for a week. So I had the seven, seven and a half hours, and then it sat here for a week, uh, and then when I got back after the week, it was yellow. So actually, just having it sitting around doesn't seem like it's very good for it. I don't think that will come as a surprise to many of you if you let just things sit around in solutions a lot of the time they just go yellow. But I mean, it is interesting. What's going on? Why is it going yellow? Because if you remember our previous uh, stuff, it looks like this, you know, it got pretty yellow. Where is that impurity, right? Like what? what is that impurity and why didn't we see it when we ran TLC earlier? Well, now we have the iodine chamber. Let's have a look in there. All right, can we see in there with the camera? All right, so we've got three lanes. We've got our starting material, our, our yellow solution, which is our current end product, I guess, and then the, the previous end product. So they're both yellow, and the same thing has gone wrong with them, I guess. I'm assuming the yellow is wrong. The yellow is always wrong. We've got two dots in that first column, <laughs> which is a mystery onto itself. So there's that middle dot there, and then there's a dot higher up. I think the shadows are obscuring it. So that's about there, that dot, right? We know the top dot is the starting material. What's that second dot? Well, we think the second dot is the product. So where's the yellow then? That, that's an interesting point. But if we look even closer, we see on the starting line, no dot at all in the starting material, and then dots here in our final, new final product and, and previous final product. That implies to me that this yellow compound is in fact a very, very polar, well, it doesn't have to be very, very polar, but like a polar compound that's just not moving on the plate. I still think it's a photo oxidation product. It's, it looks like it's just getting, reacting with the air over time, which sucks because it's pretty dang yellow. It really does look like we're competing with the, uh, <laughs> the yellowing. I should put some more electrical tape on that. I forgot to put that back on. Why is the product showing up in our starting material? It shows up sometimes, it doesn't show up other times. I'm starting to have a conspiracy about it that it's genuinely making it like on the plate from ambient UV exposure. It could be just contamination, but, or even there could be final product in our starting material now because it's been six months and sitting around. I mean, it has been in darkness. We've done the analysis. We know it's 99%. The second dot only shows up sometimes. So I could use a TLC plate and run it in complete darkness and see if it has a spot and then run another one and run it in the sunlight and see if the spot's there to prove it. All right, you ready? It's the worst possible option. You can see that dot in the first lane where it's just solvent. That dot is just from the solvent before we even dissolve any solid into it. How is it, how is it getting there? That's, that's unfucking believable. It's very faint though. Look, hey, I got two bottles. I actually got two bottles of solvent. And I'm mad enough at this that I'm going to crack open the completely unopened bottle and run this. Just in case I've somehow fucking got contaminant into the bottle of DCM. Somehow. Fuck knows how. Okay, and here we are. And we've got one solitary dot. So the first lane, just quite far to the left, is uh, solvent directly out of the bottle. And then the next lane, which is sort of in the middle there, is uh, solvent in that I took out of the bottle, put into one of these Eppendorfs, clean Eppendorfs, you know, they're, they're well, I mean, they're past their expiry date, but they were sterile, packaged, open up, put the solvent in, mix the solvent around, and then spot it with the same spotter I used on the first lane onto the plate, and there's a goddamn dot.
There's the goddamn one spot. So nothing in the first lane as he expects. Purity is not insolvent. What I thought was the final product is a fucking impurity <laughs> from the Eppendorf certified purity grade. That's nonsense. That's is nonsense the right word? Defeating. It's not quite defeating. Catastrophic. Um. I don't know where the fuck this leaves us. We've, I mean, the stuff's been running in the box for 15 hours now. And the only spot we're getting, apart from the fucking starting material, is from the Eppendorf tube. Uh, what? This is some fucked up nonsense, honestly. A lot of fucked up things happen on this channel, but this, this is potentially top of the list. I think I'm done for the day. That's... <laughs> What more can I do? I'm fucking, what more can I do? <sighs> Think positive thoughts. Think positive thoughts. Let's get this off. Let's have a look. Positive thinking, positive. <laughs> I don't think positive thinking is going to be enough here. Yes, and after the 18 hours, I think a little over 18 hours, we're left with this dehydrated piss color. There's even some tar residue on the bottom. You know, this was a perfectly clear solution to start with. I'll run one more TLC just to be sure nothing new is showing up and maybe our final product, our desired final product, is showing up. I'm expecting just to see the starting material and uh, the dot along the baseline, which is some very oxygenated, oxidized species. Here is our plate. Both of these lanes are uh, uh, the yellow solution spotted directly onto the plate, not via an Eppendorf and dilution, so there's no contaminant in here <laughs> from the Eppendorf. Holy shit. Uh, there's a little bit of streaking for the more concentrated one, but it's developed a little better. You've got starting material dot, nothing, 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 tar dot, and we don't really see too much on that other, other lane because I guess I didn't spot too much on there, and the dots are fading. But point being, there's nothing but tar and starting material. And I guess being so yellow from all the tar, there's not gonna be a lot of UV penetration through that solution. So I, I think our efficiency's, you know, gone off a cliff. This is probably a brick wall to UV now. Given how yellow it is, that means it's absorbing blue, which means definitely, basically, it's absorbing UV. So if it's really strongly absorbing that UV from the yellow tar, then, that, then the UV's not gonna get to uh, starting material. There's no point running this further. It's, it's, it's just not going to fucking work as it is now. So we've once again reached the end of a video without having actually made our final product. So once again, I'm asking for help from you. What do you think we need to do to improve this in the comments? Are people going to slander the reptile lamps? I feel like we've got a new enemy to defeat and that's the air. We just got to defeat the air and I, I think that's our hurdle to get across. Oxygen is getting in while it's in the solvent there and, and making it go yellow and, and turn into something that isn't our product. I mean, so many reactions are published where they run under nitrogen or argon and it just doesn't really need to be. Maybe get an extra couple percent yield if you run out of nitrogen, but it, it's so much effort for me to, to be able to do that, that we have to try you know, the lowest denominator first. We have to see what the minimum amount of effort we have to put into these reactions are to get it to work, right? You know what, I, I'm not sure I'm getting this point across very well. I have a cylinder of argon, in fact. Oh, I'm not strong. I'm <laughs> Look, it's argon. And I should chain it up somewhere. <laughs> Especially where we bubbled air through the dichloromethane to strip the dichloromethane off. That seems like the stupidest idea. And if we're going to do something like that again, we'll use pure argon to strip the solvent off. Also, I'm coming to the conclusion that I have to be able to do this all in one day. This 15, 20 hours has been spread across, you know, six, seven different days across four weeks. Just trying to fit around my schedule, but it, it's not working like that. I think it needs to be 15 hours, like, in a block. We also don't have that much material left. I think I've got 0.2 grams left. We've only really got one more shot at this before I then have to go back and, and, and start doing some stuff again. So I want to make the next shot count. We will keep the series going. Sorry for the long breaks in between, but we're going to keep this series going until we get to the end. Whether you like it or not, it's just a matter of time and whether I die of old age first. That's the real competition. <laughs> and the lid is thoroughly stuck to the drum. Oh, I have a blood fork here. Right where it's contacting the suit. Easy.
If you've been following this series, you know that we've hit a sort of a bottleneck, a step that we knew from the outset would be pretty difficult, and it's turned out to be pretty difficult, the UV photo cyclization step. So for this step, to make the cyclization happen, we need to pump in UV light at approximately 300 to 350 nanometers. We're gonna do some UV LEDs. Uh, they've been a popular option from the start. Before we get into building the setup, I want to talk a little bit about LEDs and UV LEDs in particular because they're really an area of technological advancement um, that's really happening right now. LEDs were first sort of designed or discovered, I guess, in the 50s or, or 60s. They were commercially available by the 70s. You could get quite high powered LEDs, but you could only get red, yellow and, and green. You could get infrared LEDs as well, but you could not get blue LEDs. So there was this huge lag in blue LEDs over all the other colors because of the semiconductor material that was needed. And it was very hard to dope that semiconductor material. It was known there was going to be a, a huge amount of consumer demand for these blue LEDs once they were made. But it took until the 1990s to actually develop blue LEDs. And you know it was a hard problem because the people that developed the first blue LEDs or the first you know reasonable blue LEDs ended up getting the Nobel Prize for it in 20. 14. You don't win the Nobel Prize for solving easy problems. <laughs> so we had blue LEDs in the 90s, but they weren't used very much, obviously, because they were quite expensive. They're a new technology. While there's demand for them, they were very expensive. In the early 2000s, however, the price of the blue LEDs dropped drastically. And because the price dropped, they got used in more applications. And because they got used in more applications, more people went into manufacturing. So the manufacturing process got improved. So they got cheaper and it kept going. So now, I mean, you, you each of you, you know, at a computer or a TV can probably look around and find a blue LED um, you know, somewhere in, in your room. In just over 30 years, we've gone from something that was technologically impossible to do, despite millions of dollars of research a year, to uh, a product that is just um, you know, so commonplace. The reason I bring up blue LEDs is the same sort of development cycle is happening with UV LEDs, well, the sort of deep UV LEDs. Once again, there's been a lot of potential demand for them, but there's been a lot of challenges in their manufacturing. The problem with UV LEDs is that so many materials absorb the UV light, so you can't have either the semiconductor or any of the substrate or any part of the LED actually absorbing that UV light. So you need to build your UV LED with UV transparent materials, which aren't that common and, and really really adds to the complexity of making these LEDs. But you know, there were developments 10, 15 years ago that showed that it was possible and now we're seeing this sort of rapid increase. And because UVC light is a, such a good disinfectant, especially around um, 280 nanometers, there's a huge push, obviously in the last couple of years to make these new disinfectant UV LEDs. Then you can replace stuff like mercury lamps and you could, you know, really easily do um, sterilization if you had cheap available high power UVC LEDs. Obviously that comes with a lot of risks because UVC is not only an eye hazard but actually a skin hazard so you're not going to illuminate a room full of people with UVC LEDs. Uh, that would be very bad. So we're kind of at that stage where the UV LEDs are mostly available. I mean even a couple of years ago you couldn't really buy on a consumer level like a UV LED but in this video they're, they're, I mean they're still expensive-ish but you can just get them online now. And the price is just gonna keep plummeting. So within five to 10 years, uh, it's gonna look ludicrous that I even tried doing the synthesis with a reptile lamp because there are going to be deep UV LEDs, not everywhere, but in a large number of applications. Just like with the blue LEDs, there was a lot of applications that came in because they were cheap and available, stuff like backlit TVs and everything like that. So who knows what deep UV LEDs will go on to do. Obviously, safety hazard, safety hazard. You can't just put them in consumer devices. You know, you're not gonna put like a UV torch on an iPhone that puts out 280 nanometer light because you know, a child could turn that on and, and give themselves skin cancer. <laughs> you know, like they're, they're pretty hazardous, but there will be all these applications that will come in in the next couple of years that we haven't even thought of yet due to these devices. All right, so in this video, we're using 310 nanometer LEDs, 310 or 311 nanometer LEDs. Uh, they've probably got a, a width of about 20 nanometers, but um, yes, that's what we're going to try and do in this video. We're just going to be setting up the UV LEDs uh, and seeing <laughs> if I can get them working because uh, uh, my electronics knowledge is not the best. <sighs> ah, anyway, let's, let's get into it. Here are our LEDs. Look at these. All right, so they're 310 nanometers uh, and I wish I knew more about electronics, but I don't. 
<laughs> so there's four stars and on each star there's four LEDs. I will definitely need heat sinks for them. At least they've got copper backs on the stars. That looks good. But I'm keen to try and turn them on. I don't really know how best to power these. Um, they're 12 to 14 volts, but they said it only requires um, 40 milliamps, which seems very low. And I don't want to put one amp into these and then um, they're just like, get absolutely blown up. Because they're not that cheap, right? I mean, they're affordable, as in they're probably $15 for each star. So this is probably $60 worth of LEDs. It's not like it's so expensive it's unaffordable, but it is expensive enough to for me not to want to blow up any of these LEDs during testing. I reckon I'm gonna allow myself one failure. If I blow up one of these, or one of these stops working during testing, and then I get it working, I'll be happy. Not, not maybe not happy, content. But uh, if I start blowing up two or three out of the four, won't be so happy. So we're, we're allowing ourselves one failure. You gotta, you gotta leave yourself some room for error, especially on a channel like this. My God, do we have to leave ourselves room for error. I, I still really don't know how to power them. I, I've mentioned this. I, I've got this power supply. Um, it needs, what, 40 milliamps. I don't, I've asked about this on Twitter and I, I just don't get it. But sure, 40 milliamps. I don't know if, because some people are like, well, I mean, just give it whatever. And that's the current it will take. But like, the current determines the brightness. I just can't pump a fucking... 30 amps through it and expect it to be fine, right? <laughs> Let's hook one of them up. I have at least one cord, so... <laughs> Let's do this thing. I'm gonna put eye protection on as well, just in case um, it emits the power of the sun, you know, for 0.1 of a second before it blows up and blasts us with three 10 nanometer UV light because I'm sun smart. Right, no light, as expected. Hey, look at that. This is 12 to 14 volts. Can you see that on the camera? Yeah, I can see that with my... Oh yeah, all right, whoop. It suddenly draws a lot of amps. So once it goes above 12 volts, I guess it draws all these amps. Don't know if it's stable at like that, but... Oh, and it's drawing more and more and more. Okay. <laughs> all right, it did work. I have such low expectations. <laughs> oh yeah, pretty warm. Pretty warm already. I mean, not hot, but definitely a lot warmer than the other ones. All right, I mean, it definitely drew like at least an amp of power when it was actually running. I don't know whether that's sustainable at that point. I, I think I'm getting caught up on this 40 milliamp number too much and I don't think it's that relevant. So if I just get a constant current supply a driver that supplies I don't know, guess an amp at the correct voltage to maybe drive two stars at the same time then you know it should be all right right that seems right it seems right it seems right I'm trying to convince myself here it'll be all right okay here's my ebay haul after the appropriate amount of shipping time obviously just outlets uh, which will run into our led drivers here which um will provide 900 milliamps to the LEDs up to 36 volts. So we should be able to um, power like two stars off one of these drivers. And 900 milliamps seems like a reasonable amount. We've also got this, this is a little timing circuit, um, which should be able to switch um, the power to the LEDs on and off, just so um, both the LEDs don't get too hot, but also the reaction vessel itself, you know, we can't let that get too hot. I don't really know whether to put this in the driver line, like, you know, the 900 milliamps going around and it disconnects that, or put that in the power line, disconnects the power to the to the driver. You can take either uh, 10 amps at 250 volts, which, you know, is the power line, or it can take 28 volts of DC. Right, well, I think that's going to be slightly too much for it if we're in here and we're getting, you know, Two of these is 28 volts. So I, I think it can go in either either one. There's probably a better one to put it in, but that I don't know. It's just beyond my knowledge. So please comment <laughs> if I've got it wrong. Also, it does require power. Annoyingly, it requires a lot of power. 24 volts to come in here, which seems like a lot. And it's probably because I bought the wrong ones because they have definitely five volt versions of these. We'll see <laughs> if I can get this working at all. Should be able to adjust the on off timings with, with these two, you know, rotational 
fucking switches. What's the term? See, I'm out of my depth. Look how much I'm out of my depth in this fucking episode. Okay, so I've got some heat sinks. Hopefully they're uh, suitable for the job. I'll just get these LEDs and, uh, you know, put each one on the heat sink. So I don't have any uh, thermal grease, but I do have some uh, high fluorinated vacuum grease. So I'm just gonna be using that instead on the heat sink and hopefully it's okay. Okay, no, that one's a joke, that one's a joke. I am gonna be using, what's this, thermal glue. But feel free to tell me, um, this is inappropriate as well, because it might be, I don't know, I don't really know. People seem to be very particular about thermal paste and glues and epoxies and whatever, but I don't know. All right, well, this thing blew up. It says it wants 24 volts. This is 19.5 volts. It's not over it. Um, there's been quite a few unexpected explosions in this lab, but I've got to say, this one really got me. <laughs> you can see that bloody transistor has absolutely carked it. So, yeah, uh, I'll have a think about what I'm doing. Fuck me, whoops. Anyway, we shall continue somehow. I got it working. Um, I only blew up two of the circuits. One of them was, you know, catastrophic. And the other one, I'm pretty sure I got the polarity wrong. And still works, but um, both LEDs blew up. But uh, here we are. I bought three. Well, actually, I was hoping to get two working out of the three. But, you know, immediately destroyed two. Now we've got one. So I really do want the five volt ones because this fucking, using this huge transformer to power this seems ridiculous. We can change these off and on times. So make the off time really short. You know, now it's basically off all the time. And, the, and then... All right, so I've wired up this driver. I don't have an earth pin on this cord, which feels pretty irresponsible because there is a, a cord here for, you know, the driver's earth, although it does come out here. So I don't know, am I meant to just put it on the case or something? Please give me advice. I will switch this out for one with an earth um, if, if, that's what I need to do. It feels reckless to not have one. So I'm really keen to see if this driver actually powers up the LED or blows it up or not. Oop, sparks. All right, so I've officially cooked this LED. It looks like it's dead. I think the reason for that is I was running this one LED, which requires 12 to 14 volts forward voltage uh, off this driver, which gives it 24 to 42 volts. I thought the LED would just use w what it needs, but no, it, uh, it, it blew up. So to combat this, I've wired two LEDs in series so that if it provides the 24 volts, each of them get 12 volts, which seems to work if i attach these two to the to the the bench top power supply they they work at, at like the 24 to 30 volts the risk of course is that if i blow up these two then that's why well, i've got one more spare led i don't have any more spare heat sink hopefully they don't blow up because then i've got to really <laughs> go back and order some more stuff online which will be several weeks turning on three two one hey all right, I'll take that win. <laughs> I'll take that win. 
Okay, so even just after that 30 seconds there, the heat sinks are noticeably warm. I think it was less than 30 seconds. So the question is, do we put the relay in here or do we put the relay over in the power cord over there? Yeah, let's put it in here. Let's put it, let's put it in there. No, let's put it in there. I reckon we'll put it um, in the power cord there. So off. The LED goes on. They go on. They're on for about 12 seconds. They're off for about 12 seconds. And they're on again. Oh my god. Amazing. The electronics are working as designed. Shocking. And I keep forgetting how unimpressive these look on camera. How unimpressive the UV looks. So here's, here's some paper with some, you know, <laughs> highlighter on it. Ah, you can see that UV lighting up. Spread out pretty well, but you can get up close to it. It's very cool. All right, what do we think? Metal reaction chamber, the LEDs inside, heat sinks protruding out the side. So I'll put like a cooling fan on the outside, so that the heat you know dissipates there. Uh, and then you know the the steel in there is vaguely reflective for the UV. Obviously, I'll do the wiring a little better, which I keep saying, but. Once again, doesn't look that impressive until you put something like a bit of paper in there. Wow. <laughs> I really should be wearing skin protection around this. I don't know how I'm going to cool the reaction mix. Maybe I'll drill some holes in the bottom and put another fan on the top and cool it um, through the middle there. We can also scale up, you know, we can put more LEDs if needed. Yeah, something like this. Cooling fan, classic cooling fan. Should, you know, keep the, um, the heat sinks cool enough. It's pretty good. You know, I think it's pretty good. I have some sins to confess here. I um, sort of screwed up the electronics a little bit. Well, maybe you wouldn't get that from the video, but if you scroll down to the comments, <laughs> it's pretty clear <laughs> that I got some things wrong. Because the main issue is that I knew the LEDs were only rated for 40 milliamps. In fact, I, I, I said that, and then at some point I decided that I was overthinking that 40 milliamp number and decided to pump 900 milliamps through the LEDs, 2,200% what they're rated for. That's not a great way of driving an LED. <laughs> and people were genuinely surprised um, at how well the LEDs held up under such abuse. And um, I think it's actually a good advertisement for this random AliExpress company um, that has no data sheet and no other information about the LEDs. And but anyway, thanks for the helpful comments. No, that's genuine. Um, you know, people were actually very helpful and they introduced me to an electronic component called a resistor <laughs> and we're going to be using some resistors in this in this episode just so we get the correct amount of current to the leds just straight from the from the power supply like the 19 volt power supply run it through some resistors and get 40 milliamps out it wasn't that hard i just didn't think about it properly i'm going to make amends um and we're not forgetting that this is a chemistry channel so i'm not going to bloody spend ages on the engineering. In fact, let's just do a montage, right? I got new heat sinks, I got five volt timers, I got new LEDs. Let's just put it all together, then we can get back to actually trying to make some cubane. Let's get back to the chemistry, all right? Let's do it. Let's, let's just build a photoreactor right now. How hard could it be? This has been running for um, a couple minutes now, maybe eight minutes. It's on a duty cycle of uh, like 90% on, 10% off. So every uh, 54 seconds, it has six seconds of cooldown time. So, you know, you can see that these LEDs are off and then they're on again. 
You can see that glow of the hot glue as it fluoresces. So that's excellent. It's not getting too hot. These heat sinks aren't really getting very hot, even though I don't have the cooling fan on. But yeah, it's really not heating up too much. What is heating up though is these resistors. As sort of expected, these are getting pretty dank hot. Yeah. So I will. Ow. <laughs> My poor fingertips. <laughs> I've got this device to measure temperature, but the human inclination to grab things to see if they're hot or not. Anyway, so this bloody thing can cool the resistors down. I mean, the resistors are rated for it. They're like uh, one watt resistors, I think. So it should be all right. I reckon this can run all day, honestly, uh, this current, which is far better than the previous setup. Right, we've done it, we've built it. How are we gonna run our bloody samples? Previously, we've run our samples with uh, borosilica glass, um, just these small vials, you know, ones like these vials, and, and we're obviously gonna get some losses through the glass because the glass absorbs pretty well below 350 nanometers, and we're using, what, 310 nanometer LEDs. But the glass is thin enough that we've just said, ah, oh, you know, stuff the losses, you know, we'll, we'll be all right. We'll just have to pump more light into to compensate. So that was a very questionable approach, to put it nicely. <laughs> but the, the only real alternative is to get some quartz glassware. And that is very expensive um, and a bit specialist. So I've been trying to avoid going there, but I have got a small bit of quartz from eBay. No prizes for uh, guessing the country of origin. This is a, a, a quartz bloody cuvette. Excellent. So this is this is pretty standard quartz cuvette. It's got this uh, quite nice fitting Teflon lid. Yeah, obviously there's an immediate drawback in that this fits three mils of liquid, which is like the largest cuvette you can get. That's not a lot of cubane precursor we can fit into each run. But as a proof of concept, this is the best thing to do. So if we can at least get it working with the LEDs uh, as they are and, and the quartz, and if that works, so we can start thinking about how we would expand this, whether we buy a very expensive, say 50 mil quartz flask, and we just try and put the whole quartz flask in there. It should be enough room in this bloody Milo tin. Or we could try and do something more uh, like complex, like getting some quartz tubing and trying to pump the solution around in front of the LEDs, which will probably help with cooling as well, because I uh, actually don't know how hot it gets internally in there. And once again, we're running it in dichloromethane, so we can't let it get over 40 degrees because otherwise the dichloromethane is gonna boil and everything will get very bad. And in fact, we really don't want it to get to like 30 degrees because with these sort of photochemical reactions, if they start to get hot, that tends to drive side reactions. And so as a first step, why don't we um, just put some dichloromethane in this cuvette and put the cuvette in the uh, reactor, the photoreactor, and see how much it heats up whether it's gonna boil or not, or it's just gonna be fine for hours. They're heat sinking to the outside, that's why we're not heat sinking to the can, because we don't want the can to heat up, we just want the heat to dissipate out. Yeah, we got the fan on, should be all right. sitting in there for just a bit over half an hour. It's fine, it didn't heat up at all. I mean, I say it's fine, it's actually not fine at all. <laughs> the heat is fine, the evaporation rate is not. If it gets really concentrated, it won't absorb the light as well. Uh, and also it starts to drive side reactions and stuff if we start concentrating it. And also, I guess all our molecules are in, just in that little section. So, and the UV light is obviously coming in all around. So the amount of molecules actually exposed to the UV light really decreases. So we don't want it to get concentrated. That lid is too leaky. I thought it would be okay. But it's also another problem. Um, I just said I was gonna put this in and run it for half an hour. 
But uh, that took me genuinely six months to do. <laughs> so sorry if things weirdly got dirty and this got rusty, like in between shots. But yeah, damn. So it's summer now here. I was trying to keep this temperature below 30 degrees. Well, the ambient temperature is now 30 degrees and it will be for the next three months. So <laughs> we might have to come up with a bit better cooling system than what I was doing six months ago, which was fine because it was, you know, 15 degrees or so. But now it's um, 30 to 40 degrees in here. I don't know, maybe there's a better solution too. Maybe I'll think of a better solution. I've got a fucking fridge. What if I just fucking ran it in a fridge? That's a, that's an idea, right? I mean, it's not the newest of fridges. But, um, I believe it still gets cold, so, yeah? Oh yeah, yeah. Look at this bad boy go. Yeah, that's getting cold. Hell yeah, it's getting heaps cold. Fuck yeah. Bathurst 2017, access all areas. Fuck yeah. Just because it looks like it's been in a train wreck doesn't mean it doesn't work. Fuck yeah. Do I need the fan in there? What do you think? Is putting the fan in there stupid? It's not going to get any airflow otherwise. The fan's just going to blow the... No, oh, fuck, not put the fan in. Whatever. Why not? <laughs> it was the 240 volt line, I wouldn't do this, but it's fine. It's not going to cut the wires. It's all right. It's mostly sealed. I'm trying to console myself here. She'll be right. She'll be right. Got to say, one obvious negative of uh, abandoning this lab for six months. Well, I was in and out, but I wasn't here for that long. Some absolute monster spiders have moved in. Have a look at this funnel web. They're not like the Sydney funnel webs. Apparently, they can't kill me, but they do hurt, apparently. Where is that guy's little face? When he's popped his little head out of the funnel. Yeah, I see you. I wonder if I can coax him out with a really long stick. Hold on. No, he doesn't want to play. All right, so we've got a full cuvette again. Let's run this in half an hour for half an hour under the UV lights. I'll try it without the fan on. Let's let's just try it without the fan on for half an hour. See how hot everything gets. Should be fine without the fan. I'll take the fan out. It looks stupid in there. And then maybe the lack of airflow as well as the, uh, you know, the cold temperatures means we won't evaporate so much DCM. I suppose another alternative I just thought about is we could go back to carbon tap. I say back to, as in like, do the 60s or 80s method and use carbon tap. It's a lot less volatile, so it wouldn't evaporate. But let's not use carbon tap. <laughs> um, all right, I'll, I'll get this in here. I'm gonna need two hands because loading it into this tin is a lot harder than I thought it was gonna be. It's been 30 minutes. How are we looking? Resistors are cold. Heat sinks are cold. I'm sure we could pump way more power into this. Yeah, look, the solvent level has dropped. It's still pretty good though, I still think. I think the Teflon tape is making it worse. I might take that Teflon tape off. <laughs> I think it's making it worse. Look, I don't know, I, I'm ready. Let's run it. Let's run this photochemistry reaction. Let's get some bloody solid out. It's been so long. How is it going? It's obviously an important question to ask, how are our reagents? Because a lot of them have been sitting around for uh, years at this point. So how are they holding up and how are our supplies going? Because obviously at some point, I'm gonna to have to go back, make more Cubane, because I'm gonna run out of end product, especially if this step uh, continues to not work. So the monoketal, look, uh, and I'll say this, all I can do is judge on appearances at this point. The monoketal, the, the stuff that crystallized out, the stuff that we confirmed was of great purity, looks fine. I mean, it's still crystalline, it's all good. These are all being stored in the dark, but uh, just at room temperature and not a very stable room temperature either, so yeah. The dimer, the diketal, the stuff we convert into the monoketal, that looks okay, we've got quite a bit of that. This was our reaction flask for the monoketal. 
So we've got a bit of stuff in there as well. Next time I'll run the hydrolysis of the die ketal into the mono ketal. I'll just run it in there because that solid is just a mixture of mono and die ketal. The one that doesn't look okay is this tribromy. So this is the tribromo, it's the stuff we turn into the die ketal. And look, it, 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 it's doing what you'd expect a tribromide um, <laughs> organic compound to do. It sort of breaks down, releases a bit of bromine and stuff, which further degrades it, so um, I'm not sure if this one is going to be any usable anymore. Maybe it might clean up okay. Maybe it's worth just running in the reaction and seeing how we go, but in future I don't think I'll stop at this step. There's no point keeping product, especially if this product is so stable and stores so well. There's no reason to stay at this tribromo. Cyclopentanone ether, September 2020. Holy moly, that, that is over two years ago. So this was the stuff we vacuum distilled. It looks okay, it doesn't look cloudy, it doesn't look like there's any water separated out from it. So look, we won't have to go all the way back to a dipic acid. I don't think so. So we should be able to start from here and at least get a couple of grams of, uh, of this product. And then the UV reaction, we can keep going forward from there. It's not quite tar yet, but give it another year and it will be tar. It's even getting sticky in there, it feels like. God damn. As per usual, nothing is ever easy. Here is our plate, and we can see in each column there's two dots. But uh, that first row is our starting material. So we've got that first dot in the starting material. So it looks like, once again, a contamination dot from somewhere. Look, I haven't exposed the dichloromethane to any plastic this time. Because <laughs> last time we got two dots, I got very excited. But the, the, the dot was just from the DCM sitting in some plastic and, and taking a plasticizer from that plastic. Look, I'm preventing myself from getting excited once again. We've got to work out why that first lane is getting getting a, a second dot. So let's run some more bloody TLC. Oh, he's vaguely back. He's not sticking his little head out. They usually like sit with their face in the little hole. He's a, he's a big boy. Is he going to attack me? Lot. No, that's fair enough. Like for reference, you know, it's probably as big as my, well, not quite as big as my thumb. He lives in my walls. He's in my walls. He's in my walls. All right, this is more what we want to see. No dot in the first lane, which is just our uh, dichloromethane. Um, so there's no contamination on dichloromethane. We've got one dot for our starting material in the middle lane and then two dots for our reaction mix that's been running for two hours in the photo reactor fridge, let's say. Photo fridge. I don't know why there's two dots in the other line for this one for our starting material because that was starting material after 20 minutes and after 60 minutes. Maybe, I don't know. But look, the starting material is good. So this is, I mean, I'm, I'm starting to get a little bit excited. I still can't explain it, but um, however, a good test is once again, we've got our permanganate stain, which actually looks okay after several months in storage. So that's surprising, but good. We should expect there to be two dots under the permanganate stain. If we see two dots under the permanganate stain, but only one dot under the, the, uh, the UV light, we could start to be a little bit more certain that it's actually our product we're making, not just some random contaminant I'm sick of this contamination shit. All right, so we've only got one spot under the uh, permanganate stain. So we get two spots under the iodine stain and only one spot under the UV torch and the permanganate stain. I don't know, does that check out? I'm not sure. I'm going to have to think on this for a few days. Hopefully not a few months. A few days.
All right, I've given it a few days thought and I've come to the conclusion, I think it's working. We are forming some product, I, I think. But of course I have to confirm it's not just other some other random contaminant and really the only source it could come from now is the cuvette. We'll see. So I've, I've got rid of the old solution, really washed the cuvette, some new solid, put it in there, confirm this is only one spot before we put it in the photoreactor, leave it for a, a few hours. Let's see if we can get, we're only putting like a single milligram in. I wanna see if I can push it all the way to the product. Surely, it's only a milligram. I just all I want is the proof of concept at this point. I wanna be able to run this on the gram scale. If it's gonna take eight hours to convert a single milligram, let's let's not think about that just yet. All right, this is proof of concept video. So I'll run TLC, this is just blank DCM in there. I'll run that on the plate, put just a little bit of material in, run that on the plate, confirm that there's just the starting material in there, and then any product we see forming from there is in fact, the product are not just some random contaminant that's that's getting carried in. There's no way. There's no way it happened again. No. Do not tell me this happened again. There's a dot in the first column, which is literally just dichloromethane that I put into the cuvette, put the lid on, shook up, and then put on the TLC plate. And look, there's a spot. So that product spot, the product spot that we've been detecting, is just coming from the cuvette. We must be leaching something from the Teflon lid. None of this has been in the photoreactor at all. It's infuriating, because I felt like I was very slow to get my hopes up. Once again, it's not even the reaction. It's just, it's just detecting whether it works or not. It's so infuriating. Oh, that's it, I'm fucking going back to the lamps. I'm fucking, let's, let's, I fuck, I don't know what else to do. Let's just go back to the lamps. <laughs> I don't know what else to do. Oh man. After half an hour, the solvent level hasn't dropped that much. I mean, it's dropped, it's definitely dropped. Well, that's not too bad. I ran this cuvette in front of the lamps for like, a couple hours, we lost quite a bit of solvent, but not heaps. I did have to jam the lid in so much that I had to use the the pliers to get the lid off, <laughs> which is probably not very good for the cuvette long term, but at least it kept most of the solvent in. So first column is our starting material. We expect that dot to be there. We know that dot is gonna be there by now. That's all good. The middle column is after one hour, and then the third column is after two hours, and the dot has disappeared. All three lanes here are after three hours, and like I put heaps on that third column, but we see no evidence of starting material anymore. So that's that's really good. We no longer have starting material in our mix, but where is the product? We need to be able to detect the product. <laughs> Otherwise we could just be turning into tar, and, and how do we know? So we've maybe converted the whole one milligram. Anyway, let's all chuck it in the iodine chamber. We wanna see a product spot. Where is it? Where's the product? So we see in our starting material, we've obviously got our starting material dot and our mysterious contamination dot from, let's say, the Teflon, sure. That Teflon dot obviously is carried through. And then after two hours, we see a little bit of the, the Teflon dot, but no starting material dot. But no other dot either. Like, where's it gone? What's happened to it? All right, and here's our plate on all the runs are after three hours. We see virtually no dots. Yeah, look, we've got a little bit of a streak here. That's our Teflon impurity. And all the other dots are still on the starting line. That's really where all our product has gone. That one's streaked, I guess, because I've overloaded it. But still, the only dots that the iodine is picking up is uh, along the baseline, which leads to two possibilities. One, um, along the baseline implies it's like quite polar molecules. So what the lamps could be doing is turning our starting material into tar. Could just be generating tar. That's what the main criticisms of the lamps are, that they're just like a tar machine. They're just gonna turn it to tar, which is why we initially moved to LEDs. Uh, the other option is that none of our stains are picking up the final product. Just such an unsettling thought, because what if we've been making it this whole time and neither the lamp, the permanganate stain, or the iodine is picking up where the hell the product is. 
I genuinely don't know what to do. So I, I value your comments. Please, you know, comment. You don't have to be some sort of PhD professor in this to have ideas. I obviously have done a lot of stupid ideas and some of the stupid ideas have worked really well. You know, there are a lot of people commenting on the electronics. You know, I value all the electronics stuff as well. But if you are a PhD level person or a professor or something, and I've got a few comments from people who have said, hey, I do cubane chemistry, etc. If you have this molecule, maybe you could just send me some. This is a bit of a long shot. Does anyone have this molecule and they can just send it to my PO box? Please contact me anywhere. We're committed to this project. We want to see it through to the end and I want to finish this project within a year. A year is a long time, but seeing as it's taken us over two years to get to this point, trying to finish it within a year is... We need to get a move on. We really do need to get a move on with this project. Maybe. <laughs> no, no maybes. We'll fucking get there, right? We fucking better... Okay, so first of all, where are we at the moment? I think I filmed two other intros to this video, but I've scrapped it because it's just boring. Very quickly, we'll, we'll run over it. The last episode of the Cubane series, we've been trying this UV reaction. We've been hitting it with a few different light sources, and it hasn't appeared to work. A sort of fear crept in. Maybe it was working and has been working all along, but we weren't able to detect that it was working. So that failure comes from the fact that we're using TLC to analyze where the reaction is and whether it's working or not. Initially we used permanganate stain, and but then the worry was maybe, oh, the permanganate stain might not work. Or maybe the iodine doesn't show it up properly. The suggestion was to use vanillin, a vanillin stain, which I did. I got some vanillin recently. It was very pleasant. It smells very nice. Didn't give me great results, honestly. It doesn't seem like that's a great stain. So went to really one of the most universal stains, which is a cam stain, Ceric Ammonium Molybdate. Very reactive, very sensitive. Didn't show anything in terms of product spots. It doesn't seem like our UV step is actually working, but we can't tell it's oh, yeah. not working no, I didn't say that right. The fucking thing isn't working, right? That, it's not the problem of the TLC, it's the problem of the UV step. I could just keep trying. There are probably better TLC conditions. Some people helped me dig up this TLC conditions from the literature, which uses a different solvent. Maybe that's the cause of our issues, but maybe it's another little subtle issue. I'm not going to keep working on it now for the sake of me and for the sake of actually moving this project forward. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go back <laughs> and make more uh, starting material for this UV step because we've run these reactions before. I'm going to have to re-watch my own video to remember all the tips and little bits I did <laughs> um, but I want to make quite a bit of starting material for this UV step. Now I want to talk about other people's work. YouTube stuff that's going on and the literature stuff that's going on and what I think from the literature we can pluck out and hold up and say let's use this idea. Now there are a few other people who are taking on the challenge of the cube, taking on the cube. I'm obviously just going to highlight the ones that have YouTube videos, but good luck to everyone. And if you're making any good progress, make sure you post somewhere and help everyone else out if you want to. Misfits Car Club, which uh, you know made cyclopentanone a little while ago, I think maybe over a year ago. No judgment, but um, I think you're attempting to take on the cube. So hopefully all is well there. Luma Ray made a video about taking on the cube, which actively taunted me. Some guy in a shed in Australia decided that making yellow tar and blowing up metal cans was no longer enough. You're on. You think you can get to the cube before I can? That's probably reasonable, but I won't believe you until you do it. You've got to face all these challenges I do too. Alright, I'm back. I had a goddamn dentist appointment in the middle of filming. It's fucking pitch black outside so max field med this channel has been attempting the cubane synthesis for quite a while now and had a few setbacks a few failures but has managed to work through it pretty well so it's, it's quite impressive what he's doing there's two things i want to highlight in his experiments that i think are really cool the first one is he's kind of crushing two uh steps together into one step rather than doing the bromination and then isolating the brominated product and then doing the deals older reaction he's just doing it all in one pot without 
isolating the intermediate. And it, and it is working for him now. I think he had some trouble with the purity of the dioxane. I thought that was really cool. Um, and it's something I might try next work through of all the steps. And the second really cool thing that he's doing experimentally is about the photochemistry step. Now he's not really up to the point of attempting the photochemistry step, but really early on he built a sort of photochemistry reactor. Which he will I guess eventually use. Like me, he sort of decided that 310 nanometer LEDs were a, were a cool pathway to go down. But rather than having it as just one big batch trying to shine the light through, he wanted to do it as sort of a flow setup. I'm going to be turning it into a flow reactor as well. So I bought a peristaltic pump and FEP tubing for the UV light to pass through. Teflon polymer tubes, the fluorinated polymer tubes, actually have really good transparency in the UV. Now this is really cool because you can get fluorinated polymer tubing quite cheap like on eBay and stuff. I think it's used in 3D printing or something like that. And that tubing is quite resistant to a lot of solvents and it's not that hard to link it with a sort of a peristaltic pump that sort of can pump solution all around and, and you've got yourself a really nice flow reactor in a sense. It's not a flow reactor, but like a re reactor that flows, you know? Someone in the comment section maybe a year ago pointed out to me that the fluorinated polymer tubing does have very good transparency to UV in the wavelengths that we want. So I went online and I bought all this tubing and I bought all these peristaltic pumps and I, I got really excited to run this flow reaction once we got the small scale pilot UV reaction working. So I've kind of been scooped. I say that very jokingly. In academia, scooping is when you're working on a research project. And of course, you've got to put all this time and all this grant money into working a, a project. And then someone else publishes before you. In publishing, you always got to be kind of the first one to do it. You, you want that novelty. So if someone else scoops you and, and you know publishes your idea first, it kind of really diminishes your work. It's not a thing on YouTube. It's not really a thing because it doesn't matter if I do something that someone else has done. I'm just saying that because the scooping is in his favor, not in my favor. If the scooping was in my favor, I'd probably be celebrating it. Best of luck to all those channels and everyone else who's taking on the synthesis. Anyway, that's YouTube. We want to talk about the actual literature now. Obviously last year, or it might have even been the year before that, we had the perfluorinated cubane. This is such a cool molecule. You've got all those fluorines around the cube and they're all so electronegative. They're kind of sucking that electron density away from the cube that you kind of get a void in the middle of the cube, which the researchers were able to put another electron into. Another highlight that came out recently, just a couple of months ago, I think, was this one Asa homo cubane, which was synthesized for the very first time in the University of Queensland in collaboration with the CSIRO. So the Williams lab in Queensland have been doing cubane chemistry for so many years and keeps rolling out the hits. It's always such a pleasure to read such hardcore organic chemistry and it's great when it's sort of a cubane <laughs> spin on it because I just like cubane stuff. But okay, here's the real important paper out of the Zeisman Coleman lab uh, over at the University of St. Andrews. This is a cubane paper about an alternative way of doing the UV step. Instead of uh, pumping light directly into the first excited state of that cubane precursor, that state is really weakly absorbing, which doesn't really help. What, what you're doing is you're adding a photosensitizer in there, benzophenone, and instead you're putting the light into that benzophenone, and then the benzophenone is transferring that energy onto your cubane molecule and driving that reaction. And this is really important because benzophenone is very good at absorbing light, but also the wavelength is shifted away from this sort of 311 nanometer terrible window that we've been trying to hit, and actually they've done it with 390 nanometer light. You might not think it's that significant. We've been trying to do 311, now, you know, 390, what's the big deal? It's it's a world of difference. First of all, the transparency of, of glass, actually transparent at 390 nanometers, and it's not transparent at 311 nanometers, so negates the need for quartz, but mainly just the cheapness and the availability of UV light sources in that range, especially at 365 or 395, is so much better then at 311, that sort of deep UV stuff. I mean, I just have one of these lying around. This is 395, and this costs me like nothing. And there's more light coming off this, you know, terrible torch than there was out of one of our $15 per star <laughs> deep UV lights. Benzophenone is 
sort of a common chemical used in fragrances, so you can just buy it on eBay. It's, once again, stretching the definition of what a hardware chemical is, but it's still an available chemical. It's not like some obscure reagent that I have to go to Ligma Aldrich for. Their solvent choice being acetyl nitrile. The synthesis of it is crazy and you can't buy it and it's like it's too flammable to ship. We'll have to try it in an alternative solvent and hopefully that doesn't kill it. But I think this pathway is a great pathway forward. I mean, we could still build some sort of flow setup, but we can just pump in watts of 365 and actually have it work with these wavelengths. It's such a good idea and it's fantastic to see it work, but you do think... Surely someone's had that idea before, right? What if on someone's YouTube video there was a comment maybe suggesting this kind of thing years ago? Scooped, yeah, I'm, I'm back in scoop territory, yes. I'm scoop neutral again. Even though it's someone else's comment on one of my videos that I didn't even respond to, we're counting that as a scoop. Anyway. <laughs> Looking forward to trying this once we have more starting material, we'll probably have to go to the double deprotected starting material just for consistency to try and match that paper. Getting to Cubane this year, was that the claim? I might have said within a year on a previous video and that might have been six months ago. We're going to do it this year. Cubane this year, 2023 Cubane. Print the shirts, make the bumper stickers, 2023 Cubane we're doing. I am left in an off-white solid which is mostly 1,4-cubane dicarboxylate methyl ester, which is also off-white in literature, aka slightly yellow. Yeah, so um, there was a bit of a cubane race that started, and um, yes, I, I, I very much lost. And a particular person has been trying for three years, and that is very admirable. Although pain and suffering is an important part of chemistry, this is going too far. So I decided to help YouTube out a bit, and show them how to actually do chemistry. I've kind of been scooped. Camolius, first of all, how dare you? I was going to do this first, just because I've been at it for three years. Three years? We've been doing this for three years. Sure. <laughs> this is our year. This is our year 2023 Cubane. It's our year. It's our year. Yes, while there are a lot of very funny comments on Kamolis' video uh, that I did laugh at, I gotta say, we absolutely have to give Kamolis full credit for what he did. Just because he's a professional and he knows what he's doing and he has a well-stocked lab doesn't mean he's not an individual who's doing the Cubane synthesis at home. I, I could have a lab as well-stocked as his if, if, I, if I wanted to. If, if I... And because it's obviously just good-natured fun and Kamolis is a good bloke, he has sent me samples of some of the stuff he's made to use as standard. So actually we've got some of the, the diketal, the diketone, and we have done it. This is some methyl ester of the 1,4 dicarboxyl cubane. We've done it. We're here, I'm in the lab, at home, and we've got some cubane. So well done, series over, run the credit. So I know I'm going on a bit about someone else's video, but I just want to run through some of the things he does and how that's going to impact our series, and then we're going to get to some actual chemistry. We're going to do some chemistry this episode. We're going to get to some chemistry, okay? Kabolius runs this on such a large scale, which is very impressive, and two things really stand out to me. The first one is that his products all look very good. It's amazing how good he's managed to get his products to look after a bit of purification. And the second thing that really stands out to me is how bad some of the reactions look. Even though he makes the product's really nice. The reactions still tar up and go yellow. There's no avoiding it. There's just inherent tar. But even if you get tar, you can still purify around it. Obviously, the step that this series has been caught on for so long is the UV photochemistry ring cyclization step. And Camolius manages to do it, I mean, first time, by doing the benzophenone sensitized, recently published work. And, and that's so cool. It just works for him. He's able to use 395 nanometer light, just simple LED arrays, use normal glass, but it just works. And this channel, me especially, has been obsessed with tracking this reaction via TLC to know whether it's working or not. And Kamolius just doesn't bother, and it just works. He has to run it for three days straight, but because he can just use the 395 nanometer LEDs, he can put a whole lot of power into it, 
it's fantastic. It just work but it does highlight a slight difference in our procedure because you've got this complicated molecule that has the two protection groups on it the two ketal groups in it and you need to have at least one ketone to be able to do the photochemistry ring cyclization the question is do you pull both protection groups off and run it with the diketone as camolius does or do you just pull one of those groups off and then run it uh, with just one ketone in the photochemistry reaction and then pull the second protecting group off later as we're planning to do in our series currently. On paper, there are pros and cons for both sides. And the reason we are doing the one protecting group off first is because it was said that this molecule underwent cyclization in the photochemistry step better. And, and, and that was identified as our hard step. The more efficient we could make that step, the better. However, the catch then after the photochemistry step, this molecule is very hard to purify it uh, it seems like all the papers that do it this way note that this molecule is particularly hard to purify but looking at Camolius's way of doing things i think he has chosen the better route especially now that we have the synthesized photochemistry step so that should work a lot easier than before so we shouldn't need that you know, extra help from that one protection group, whether or not it actually helps or not. But also seeing how much it tarred up anyway, I don't want to try the one where it was extra hard to purify if the easy one to purify still look like that. Where does that leave us? Well, that kind of puts us to one step back in terms of we have the monoketal and, we, and that's where we were at and we were going to make more monoketal but rather than making more monoketal what we do is instead we'll make more diketone so we'll divert off i don't have any bloody dioxane and i don't feel like making any dioxane so we're going to go back to see how much tribromo product we have we're going to see if we can carry all this forward and see how much diketone we can make after we get the diketone purify it we can once again throttle the bloody photochemistry reaction grab it by both hands and wring its little neck until we get some buddy product that's my that's my dream that's what i think about constantly but um <laughs> for today more diketone Okay, what I want to try is uh, running the Diels older reaction with this. This is our Tribromo product, although it was at one point. It has gone a very ugly brown colour. I was been thinking about running a purification on this, doing a recrystallization, but that's not in the spirit of this series. We're doing fast and loose. It'll either work or it won't. So let's just put this straight into the Diels older reaction. So we've got 2.85 grams, uh, but I've just immediately changed my mind about not running any purification from it. I just had a quick look back at some of the references and, and they do say the quality of this material really does affect the yields of the uh, Diels Alder reaction. So, so we're just gonna be running a water wash, maybe a tiny bit of sodium sulfide just to clear up any free bromine from this and then a recrystallization from ethanol and we'll see what sort of yield we get from that. Um, and hopefully it doesn't take too long. I don't know, I'm trying to get through this and, and every time I go to do something, I've got to do something else, but oh well, we'll get to it, let's do it. and we've ended up with 2.1 grams of purified material. And while it sucks to lose, you know, uh, some amount of material while we lost uh, 0.7 grams of material, uh, this definitely has 
a lot better purity. Their weird smell is gone. There was a weird smell of the other one and the crystals were kind of sticking together. It was a bit sticky. We'll now use this material, all of it. How much we got? 2.1 grams, yeah, um, into the Dill's older reaction. Just need to reflux it with sodium hydroxide and ethanol. Um, let's just fly through it. Let's set it up and do it straight away. Let's Let's get to it. a bit mouldy. <laughs> oh. That's what I get for not doing chemistry enough. That's right, it's clear enough. Look at that, that's that's drinkable. <laughs> the green colours, not the mould. The mould is just the mould, the, the algae. The green is definitely just die about it. With the intention of suppressing mould growth. You reckon the cooling potential of the water decreases if it's filled with algae? Or does it increase, you know? You know, I really should change it. You know I'm not going to, but I just wanted to point out that I, I definitely should. That one. <laughs> And we have some material here. It's a slight yellow color. It's kind of a, a, a creamy off-white. Still a little wet. So now the step, this is a new step. Uh, we're trying to make the diketone. So we're trying to pull both of those protecting groups off. We're gonna be using some of the diketal and the monoketal just together in the reaction. I don't think there should be any issue in doing this. Uh, I could be wrong, but I think it should be fine. So this is some raw reaction mix we had before. Um, that we used in uh, making some monoketal. Everything else that didn't uh, crystallize out from that reaction mix, I've kept, which will be a mix of the monoketal and, and the diketal, I reckon. And we'll just use this um, when we run the reaction again. So it was a mixture of monoketal and diketal, but we kept it and there's probably a half a gram in there. And then we've got two grams or so of the diketal, which is slightly more brown than the stuff we've made today, but it might have degraded over time. So we've got about two grams there, uh, half gram, and then uh, I'm not sure exactly what the amount here is, but it'll be about a, about a gram, maybe uh, a bit less. So we're gonna chuck all of these together with some concentrated sulfuric acid and stir it for a day or so. Initially, we're gonna add the sulfuric acid very cold, and then we'll just let it stir at room temperature. For this total of about three grams, we're gonna need about 17 grams, maybe 20 grams of sulfuric acid should sit in this flask quite nicely. Uh, we're not in summer anymore, so we're not, it's not gonna get to 40 degrees <laughs> and it'll be stirring overnight. So it gets quite cold here at the moment and it might get to 10 degrees or so, not freezing, but um, kind of nice, good actual reaction conditions, I think. So I won't have to try too hard, uh, which is nice. I could use um, the drain cleaner as is um, unpurified, but uh, unsure about it. There's a lot of other variables in this reaction. So we're going to be using, I mean, this is still drain cleaner stuff. I just distilled it at some point. So every so often it sort of leaks out of that joint. Um, that's the compressor turning on. It does that every, you know, probably about eight out of 10 minutes. All right, so we're just about done. Um, I've turned off the heating and the uh, sulfuric acid stopped boiling pretty quickly. I'll just turn, turn off this. It, it, you can see it's it's nice and, and clear, uh, clear and thick, just how I like it, you know. Great, fantastic. Let's let's get to doing that.
here we are left with a clay colored material in good yield things are things are okay because we're doing a photo reaction next any colored impurities really will mess with things a lot because they'll strongly absorb the uv and really get in the way of the uv getting to the material which we need it to so we're just going to do a recrystallization to purify it the bloody camolius video um which i guess now is a you know, a reference point. Um, <laughs> uses uh, ethyl acetate and activated carbon to get rid of the color impurities, but his material um, is a lot more tarry than mine is. I'll enjoy saying that because I don't think I'll get to say it very often. I, I feel like a recrystallization, normal recrystallization will work fine here. And in the spirit of, of keeping a very hardware store level, um, we'll just use acetone and, and hexane or the, the shellite, acetone and shellite. And hopefully that's fine. This material is not. 100% dry, but once again, it'll be all right. Let's bloody rechrist it. Here we are, left with 1.35 grams of a nice crystalline powder. The yield's gonna be difficult to work out exactly, but look, the important thing is we have, you know, nearly one and a half grams of diketone to do the UV step with, and it looks like great purity. Yeah, it's a bit weird with that recrist. The, the tar seemed to just decide to leave at some point, whether it all oiled out or there was a small amount of water trapped in the, the crystals before the recrist and it sort of phase separated and took all the tar with it. But it's really nice when the tar just decides to leave your product um, and then just lets you decant the product off and leave the tar behind. I'm, I'm sure there's lots of diketone left in there, but um, for the sake of purity, we'll leave that behind. Important thing is we got some great material to continue on with. So uh, we're, we're back up as per always, it seems, at the UV step, but Feeling very, very enthusiastic about it. You get to bloody play with this thing. You ready? You ready? Look away. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. We've got to do it. The guy got that tattoo. Have I mentioned the tattoo guy? The Cubane tattoo with 2022? And then he left all these other spaces <laughs> for all the other years to be put out and crossed out when I, when I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. As you may be aware, we initially made very good progress in this series and have been caught for the last couple of weeks on this UV step. And I suppose when I say last couple of weeks, I mean the last hundred or so weeks. We initially started doing this reaction using the UVB lamps, wow. then we moved to UVB LEDs, and now we're back to 395 nanometer LEDs using a photosensitizer in the reaction. And this time I have a really good feeling about it. It's different than all the other times I had a really good feeling about it because this is the time. This has to be the time. We've got the purified diketone. We've got some benzophenone from eBay, and we have two 50 watt, 395 nanometer LED panels to blast UV into to this reaction and we're pretty much following a literature procedure i mean virtually exactly nearly at this point virtually exactly nearly sort of i mean it's the closest i've ever really getting to following an actual literature procedure in in the garage here and i'm super keen to get to actually doing the chemistry but very first i want to talk about actually what happens after the uv step because it's surprising how close we actually are to cubane i think we've forgotten this a little bit because we've been stuck at this step for so long but we're weirdly close to cubane so in the uv step we start with our nice diketone and then we make this sort of cage compound. We've been calling it the cage compound. It's got two squares and then a couple of pentagons and still has the two bromide groups on it. What we're ideally going to do is take this molecule straight out of the reaction mix. We're not going to purify it or anything and react it with sodium hydroxide. And that's going to make the cubane. The sodium hydroxide removes those last two bromines from the molecule and then it sort of contracts. Well, I mean, guess those pentagons turns into squares, right? Now, cubane is just swimming around in solution because because it's got two acid groups on it. So we want to precipitate it out. So we're just going to be adding in some hydrochloric acid, which will precipitate it out, which is really great because we're just using sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. They're just from 
the pool chemical aisle at the local hardware store. Well, the hydrochloric is, I think, the sodium hydroxide is also from the hardware store. I can't remember what they even sell it for as just a general cleaner. That's how close we are. We need to do a little bit of a reflux with the sodium hydroxide to make sure that reaction actually happens. The rearrangement reaction happens. The Favorsky, I'm probably saying that wrong, but I think everyone excuses that by now. You can just blame it on my Australian accent and that's fine. Yeah, me and my mates are going to fucking head back and do a Favorsky rearrangement. Brewski is a word. Do people use Brewski anymore? Like, oh, I'm going to go smash a couple of Brewskis, you know? A couple of Brewskis, four Brewskis, Favorsky. The four Brewski reaction because you need to have fucking four brews before you can... So that's basically it. We're not going to bother with any TLC reactions. We're just going to run the stuff under the UV for several days. Forget about TLC for now. It's just too painful to think about all the hours I've lost trying to do TLC when it probably doesn't even matter in the end of it. So um, that's what we're doing. Uh, let's get it right into it. All right, here we are. It's another ruthlessly sunny day. We had our uh, couple of days of scheduled rain as per the middle of winter, but um, we're back now. It'll be nothing but sun for the next eight months or so. And um, oh, this door, grass is growing. I gotta fix this door. Goddamn power tools. Oh, chemistry is the easy part. I can't even fucking get in to do the chemistry. Man. Right, all right. Anyway, we're here. Remember this box with the lamps? It's gathered some dust. Oh man. The passing of time. Every video in this series is constantly reminded of the passing of time. Where are we going? Alright, we'll go on. What is all this shit? Sure. What is this? A, a brick wrapped in foil? I really am the genius of our times, aren't I? God, there's more bricks wrapped in foil. God damn. I mean, I kind of like the lamps because everyone hates them, but <laughs> we are replacing them with panels of leds this is the future baby we're getting an upgrade this is enough ramble let's let's do it let's pull this bloody lamp out okay i've literally just taped this thing in and um most of the led panel comes through that hole okay i didn't even align it properly but uh turning it on hell yeah great promise okay i i, I will align that better and put the other one in I got a manual. Make sure that the distance between the floodlight and the object being lit is more than one meter so it is avoid high temperatures caused by short distance. It's normal for the surface temperature of the lamp body to be too high after a long period of work. Please do not touch it directly to avoid burns. Well, we're going to ignore all that. Ta da! Another immaculate build. Hell yeah, you can see why I'm regarded as certainly one of the makers of our generation. There's a fan, there's a stirring thing, there's two LED panels. Let's put them on. God damn, that's some UV. It's just bloody um, dichloromethane in that flask. That's the solvent we've got to use. Remember, if it gets over 40 degrees in that flask, the solvent will boil and the thing will explode. So we can't let that happen. I mean, it might explode, but it might pop the lid and everything will go everywhere and the solvent will melt all the panels and it might explode. Okay, it might explode. I haven't dissolved any uh, product in there to, to begin with. We're just gonna give it, I don't know, an hour, just see if things get way too hot. It's 395, so it's not too bad to my skin or eyes, um, but not that I will be looking at it for an extended period of time, because it, it doesn't seem very pleasant to look at. It looks a lot more blue um, on the camera than it is in person. It's kind of purpley, but it can't, doesn't look as bright as it does on camera, but it's because uh, a lot of it's kind of on the edge of your vision at 395. I mean, you should be able to see most of the 395, but it's kind of on the, on the limit of your human vision. So anyway, all right, now after about half an hour, things are hot, but they're not, they're not scalding hot. I'm burning myself. Yeah, the, the dichloromethane doesn't feel, I mean, it's warm. It just, we just have such a narrow window we've got to hit. Like, 40 degrees is not that warm. I don't know, it's potentially we could run it in the fridge. We're on the fridge. Could run it in the fridge. That's really stupid, isn't it? We'll try and do it without the fridge. What I, what I think is a reasonable approach, much more reasonable than the fridge, although the fridge is a fun option. Much more reasonable approach is just to use this timer here and, 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 and turn the 
stuff off and then on again, I think. I'm not sure about the lid. Maybe the lid doesn't need to be on either. Because that's really trapping the heat in. Because we're going to run it for three days. But have I mentioned that yet? It, it's not It's not like two hours. We really want to run it for like three days straight. If I have to break it up, you know, every half an hour, there's, there's five minutes of cool down time. Uh, I don't think it adds up too much. It at least lets us run it without everything blowing up or melting or catching on fire or exploding, etc. So I think that would be worth a while. So I'm going to fucking program that in with these little stupid buttons, but I can do that. Okay, I guess if we're talking obvious solutions, uh, more fans is is uh, the obvious solution. It's everyone's least favorite fan. It's fine. It, it, the fan wants to be rusty. <laughs> I could buy a new fan, but I'm not going to. It works. It's fine. It's fine. It's probably an electrical hazard. It's fine. Um, look, this stays cool. That thing cools down. I will still give it a bit of a duty cycle, I suppose, a couple of minutes off. It's fine. It's fine. I reckon we're nearly good to bloody dissolve some stuff up and, and just fucking send it for three days. Right? You feeling confident? We're just assuming it'll work. It's fine. That's not optimism. It's it's just denial, I think. So, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's set this bloody thing up. Alright, moment of truth. It has been three days. Three days? Yeah. Yeah, it was Wednesday to Thursday, Friday to Saturday. Yeah, but Saturday today. Another aggressively sunny day, which I suppose will prompt people to uh, suggest that maybe we just use UV from the sun rather than worrying about these lamps. And, and that's a very good suggestion. I mean, it is the middle of winter. It was raining, the grass is wet. So we've got to contend with that and then very soon it'll be summer and it'll be 40 degrees which will be too hot but maybe there's a appropriate time in there somewhere anyway we'll, we'll try that eventually i suppose all right moment of truth what, what are we expecting to see we're expecting to see it all tarred up it was a clear solution before and we should see some changes now so we're expecting maybe tarry solution oh i don't know all right let's let's get these lamps off oh not really tar, but pretty damn yellow. I don't know if that's a good thing. As per usual, everything always bloody goes yellow. Even when we want tar, it goes yellow. My God. <laughs> yeah, look, this doesn't look so great. While I said we wanted tar, the product we want does dissolve in dichloromethane. So the fact that this sort of uh, deposit has arisen, you know, that's not our product, but maybe it's in the yellow still, so we'll just filter off, well not really filter off, we'll just decant off our yellow solution away from the tar on the side of the flask here, it's on the uh, stir bar too, so we'll carefully pour that off. I'm going to remove the solvent from uh, our very yellow solution, it's a little wasteful, uh, I'm not like redistilling it, but it's, it's 30 mils of DCM. I'm just, just going to vent it to the atmosphere. I'm sorry. It's maybe a little irresponsible of me. It's fine. Not a big deal. Um, I'll just give it some extremely gentle heat. Let the solvent leave and should leave us with a residue. I could probably guess what that residue will be coloured like. Um, but at this point I don't want to speculate because that, that could be bad news. <laughs> Alright. We'll let this solvent fuck off. Here's our solid. You know I don't like yellow in chemistry. It's, it's generally a bad sign. And I don't think this time is any different. It's actually a little reminiscent of our first run. If we can think, cast our minds back to whenever that was. And then we ended up with a yellow solid that, well, I was gonna say it looks like this, but is this. 
This was a solid from uh, some of our first runs under the lamp. But what are we looking for? We're looking for a brown solid. And that's not just from the Kamolis video. In Kamolis video, it goes very brown, looks very, very tarry. You read all the references and they also say it goes brown. And this is not brown. It's not even slightly brown. And what I think a key step we've been neglecting pretty much this whole time and are getting a lot of comments about it is argon. I've sort of just accepted that there's some level of oxygen screwing around with the reaction that would be fine uh, in, in an effort to make this reaction more approachable. But there might be enough oxygen and, and we weren't, you know, we're just in this vial here and I didn't run in this flask, I ran in a different flask, this flask. It's still got some horrific red solid in it. Regardless, there could be a lot of oxygen through, which could be completely ruining our reaction. Rather than going to the brown product we want, it's going to this yellow and red sort of tar. Also, this could have just worked. So what I will do is I will do both options. I will continue on with this, assuming this works. So we just got to reflux that with some sodium hydroxide solution. But in the meantime, let's rerun some photochemistry reactions, but sparge it, see if we can seal up the vials nicely. Uh, so we've got a little bit of solid here of the diketone to run another reaction, slightly smaller scale. And also we have these solids that came from Camolius. Am I saying it right this time? I got some shit from the last video because I didn't say it right. It's Chem oleus. How was I saying in the video? Chemiolus. Extra syllable in there, like like saxophone. Chem oleus. 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 Sent us these samples. <laughs> He's got some diketone here. This is obviously the solid that he used under his lamps with benzophenone, and it worked first time. Yeah, let's not keep going on about that, but let's use some of this and run the reaction under under our lamps. We can run them both at exactly the same time, and if it works for his solid, uh, but not mine, we know it's the problem with the solid. If it doesn't work for both of us, I know it's the problem with the lamps. How good is that? That's a good idea. I don't know how much is in here. Uh, enough. I think more than what well, I have. <laughs> so, great. So I will run both of those now-ish. I've got to reflux this overnight. So, and you know, we're gonna put these under for, I suppose, three days. This is feeling very montage-y, so positive vibes into this montage. Good luck, future self. Let's do it. my argon regulator? That's a good question. The fuck would I have put that? The fuck would I put an argon regulator? If I was a fucking moron, where would I store a fucking... Alright, I found it. In with the tubing. That made a lot of sense actually. That was a very good decision and I don't know why I didn't look there originally. Days is up. How are they looking? Let's get these things off. Oh, pretty red and yellow for some reason. Mm, concerning. <laughs> Let's get them out. Right, so this is the Camolius sample, and this is my sample. And they're sort of reasonably similar. The Camolius sample had tar actually kind of settle out, whereas mine looks like it stayed floating a lot more. And really, the, the sides of the vial on the Camolius one, you don't really see too much 
stuck to it, whereas on my one, it looks like it's quite a bit of, I guess, like grease, tarry stuff on the sides. This is a pretty good reproduction of what Camolias did in his video. I used a different solvent, but um, the papers use DCM as well as acetonitrile, and, and there's no difference. Once again, I'm losing my mind at why this isn't working. W what are we doing wrong? <laughs> Let's get back to the other refluxing sodium peroxide one. Maybe that'll come through for us. Maybe, maybe I deserve some, some win here. I deserve some bit of win. That's what I deserve. All right, everything is cooled down. It had uh, a bit of a reflux overnight, and um, it looks, I mean, it looks like tar, but uh, I don't know, this, this could be it. We may have formed the cube, and if we form the cube, it'll be as the dicarboxylate, which in this basic solution will be as the sodium salt, so it will be dissolved into the solution. Bit of precipitate, but um, the benzophenone is in there as well, which uh, is not soluble in water, so that will precipitate out, so. Um, and any, I guess any tarry stuff, like genuine tar, um, would have precipitated out of this water solution. So at this point, to clean it up, I think we should run a filtration, get rid of the benzophenone, get rid of a bit of tar, and just be left with, um, ideally, a cubane dicarboxylate sodium salt in solution. So yeah, let's run that through the funnel. Now everything's, um, yeah, cooled down. Let's run it through the funnel and have a look at the bloody solution. All right, I don't know how much uh, help that filtration really was. The solution looks extremely turbid still. Not the greatest, uh, but um, let's do it. We, we've got to acidify it now, and um, we'll turn the, the dicarboxylate sodium salt back to just the dicarboxylate, uh, which is less soluble in water, so it should precipitate out. To do this, we're just going to be adding some hydrochloric acid. This is 32%. Obviously, hardware grade, uh, the bottle is filthy because I don't store it with my normal chemicals because it, it leaks acid vapor and that uh, tends to rust things around. So um, it goes into fucking um, the void somewhere where it's extremely dusty. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I don't get affected by acid fumes as much. So that's my excuse for the bottle being filthy. But um, hopefully the chemicals inside are, are pretty clean. So I, we're just going to use it as is. We're not going to use any bloody pure, pure, purified acid. This should be good enough grade um, if we're just acidifying a solution. So we'll add 10 mils of this to um, our solution and see if anything precipitates out. Ooh. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> in several years in the making, we have a slightly cloudy solution. Let me check that our solution is actually acidic. Yep, nice and red on the pH paper. So what I might do is I might just cool this down, make sure it's nice and cold so we precipitate out all our fucking cubane before we uh, filter it. Fantastic. small amount of um, mud colored material. While it definitely looks like tar, we can be, I, I guess, a little confident that it's our material because we had a, a product that was soluble in sodium hydroxide solution, but precipitated out in the acid solution. Very, very heavily implies that we've got a carboxylic acid group on the molecule and none of our starting materials or, or any other sort of side products we'd expect that. That being said, we should definitely wait for further analysis. I'm not gonna do any further analysis in this video. I'll leave the purification and analysis. Analysis is the key one, really. I guess to confirm this material is actually cubane dicarboxylic acid. With that also being said, let's go! This took me years and we've done it. Look at this shit colored material. <laughs> oh, get out of here. Let's go, Cubane 2023. Let's go. Yeah. I don't think I can process emotions well. 
Okay, so I got some of that solid. I, I got a little bit out and sent it off for NMR analysis. NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance. And so I sent it to my mate Brian, who's up in Queensland, and he ran it through the NMR analysis for me and excitedly texted me back that this product was 100% benzophenone. <laughs> <laughs> Which means there's no cu there's there's no cubane in that at all. There's not there's nothing there's no cubane. Let's go. Which is very classic of this series. <laughs> the roller coaster never ends. <laughs> as soon as you think we've done something good, it hasn't actually worked. <laughs> Okay, so it was pretty disappointing to have our solid come back as benzophenone because it suggests that the reaction hasn't worked at all or it's coming back as pretty like pure benzophenone and the carbons in the cubane don't just disappear. They, they have to be somewhere. Even if the cubane has fallen apart, we should still see peaks of like tar or something. So the, the realization is the cubane is probably still in there, the cubane dicarboxylic acid. It's still in there, but it's just not precipitated out. All right, and here is our magical tar that we got very excited about because we thought it was the cubane and um, we've run the NMR analysis. You can see where I've taken the sample out from there. So that's bad, obviously, um, but all is not lost because if we read one of the references that we're following, the reference that we were meant to be following um, nearly completely, exactly, or whatever, we notice that they also say the cubane doesn't precipitate out. They sort of mention that it's pretty weird. They use a phrase I don't see very often, but kind of says, hey, this doesn't make any sense, but this is what happened to us, and it was pretty reproducible, and it's a phrase, in our hands, you know, this happens. Like, everyone else did their thing, and we'd expected it to work that way, but in our hands, it just did this fucking thing. So, you know, whatever, but, you know, it's better that they report it the correct way that it actually happened for them, because here we are reproducing it, and it's in our hands as well, in my fucking crusty hands, it's it's done the same thing. Well, at least we think so. So our cubane dicarboxylic acid is still floating around in solution here. It's good not to throw away any solutions immediately, although we are potentially two or three weeks after we initially did this filtration. So maybe the, the <laughs> cubane has all decomposed. So it does suck being a very slow person, but um, you know, what can you do? So we'll give this another little filter because there's some absolute crud absolute scunge down at the bottom there uh, which is probably just more benzaldehyde that's slowly settled out once we remove the scunge we can do a liquid liquid extraction so what the paper did and once again i keep deviating from the paper and it keeps punishing me for doing it but the paper evaporates it down under vacuum so you don't um, decompose any of the organic stuff uh, and then you have sodium bromide mixed in with your cubane dicarboxylic acid. I'm going to instead do a liquid liquid extraction. Um, so I'm going to use dichloromethane. Dichloromethane is going to mix with the water. Well, it won't mix, it'll separate out, but all the cubane will dissolve into the, the DCM and then we can evaporate the DCM and we're left with our cubane. Why it hasn't precipitated out is it's strange. It's strange, but it's probably because I use just far too much water. Um, just because of the scale we were working on, it's hard to reflux a reaction where it calls for like five mils of water or something. I can't remember, I ended up using 30 mils or something. So it's, it's just such an excess of water because of the small scale we're working on. And my stuff is just not set up to do very small reactions. You know, I'm like, oh, I'll get a small flask is like a, a 250 mil flask for me. <laughs> anyway, um, let's get this filtered and then we can do a liquid liquid extraction and then we can think about yeah, being positive about all this again once we're back on track to where we think we are, which is actually having the Cubane. <laughs> And after all that work, we're left with um, a tiny amount of solid. This is probably cubane, but there's like, you know, maybe a couple milligrams here, which is just uh, not very much. So I'm, I'm going to assume that the cubane doesn't really want to come out of uh, the, the solution very good and go into the dichloromethane. So to make that a little bit better, I'm just going to increase the polarity of this uh, solution by dissolving a whole lot of um, salt into it. And then hopefully uh, the DCM can dissolve the, uh, the, the cubane out of there a bit easier. 
because <laughs> uh, this is not much. I mean, it's potentially enough to analyze, but um, purpose is to try and actually get some enough Cubane to go on to the next step with, not just like prove we've done it. So uh, let's let's do this all again, but um, dissolve a whole heap of salt in there first. Okay, I wasn't getting any fire with the dichloromethane extracts, um, uh, even after saturating it with uh, uh, salt. But on a whim, I thought I'd try ethyl acetate instead. And look, all the colors actually gone into the layer but <laughs> with the dichloromethane. It was, so, it was so clear it wasn't taking much of the color, which I assume the organic product is uh, causing that, that color. So, okay, maybe dichloromethane is just a terrible solvent for this. So I'm just gonna do a couple of extractions with um, ethyl acetate and then drive up all the ethyl acetate uh, in the same way I've been doing it with the dichloromethane and then hopefully that leaves us with more of an actual solid behind <laughs> more of a solid residue than we've been collecting from uh, evaporating off the dichloromethane because I'm getting stuff all but this looks much more promising so I'm going to do that right now Oh, yes. Okay. We're back here at the start now. Um, this solid, well, I mean, the, this red tar, I sent that off for NMR analysis. Once again, to Brian, what do you know? There's actually Cubane peaks in there. Well done, everyone. <laughs> the Cubane acid is, is definitely a major component, but it's not like it's majority Cubane. It's very, it's very impure. But the good news is we definitely have the Cubane in there. So, so it's all worked. Big thank you to Brian up in the Queensland University of Technology for running these uh, spectra for me. That's enough of me talking. Let's go back to the present tense. The future, the past, I don't know. Wh where are we in the timeline? We're just going to go back behind the camera now. So these were the DCM extracts. I'm assuming it's the same product, but there's very little in here. So this could just be impurity. So maybe we'll just forget about this one and just look at the ethyl acetate extracts, which is this one. It was a yellow solution that went down into a red tar. I mean, of course, it feels very fitting that at the end, well, this isn't the end, but, you know, our first sort of cubane is a tar because the whole series has just been combating various tars 0.55 grams of tar so half a gram of tar great so that is there right so we'll, we'll put that aside because i'd like to loop back around to when we're running the uv reaction we ran this stuff through um, as our first stuff and then while we were thinking about what was happening we ran two more test reactions through the uv setup and one of those reactions was chemiolus is it chemiolus Chemi, it doesn't matter. Some of his stuff, so it was 0.25 grams in each. So a total of 0.5 grams. I mean, it looked like it did the UV reaction properly as well. So there was no reason to throw that out. So I did the whole making cubane process with those two solutions as well. Combined them, uh, evaporated the solvent off to just leave us with that solid residue, which we then reflux for uh, several hours over a sodium hydroxide solution or in a sodium hydroxide solution. And it goes that sort of awful brownie color. Now, the bit that tricked us up last time was that none of the cubane dicarboxylic acid precipitated out. It was just the benzophenone, which is what led us astray. However, when we added the acid this time, or added the, yeah, added the acid this time, we see a lot more precipitate. And that's this thing here. Look how much precipitate is in here. So, I mean, I could be fooled again and I hate, I don't mind being fooled by chemistry because chemistry is a crafty trickster, but getting fooled twice by the chemistry is not something I aim to do. <laughs> I don't want to get fooled again by this, but there does look like a fuck ton of precipitate in here. All right, I've decided I wouldn't be fooled by the tar a second time. So I, I've readjusted the pH of this um, with some sodium hydroxide solution. So now it's um, on the basic side. So all the cubane dicarboxylic acid would react with the sodium hydroxide to form sodium, uh, the sodium salt, uh, which is much more soluble. So all the precipitate we see is benzophenone, the stuff we don't want. So we can now filter all that shit off and then we can reacidify uh, the solution. Stuff probably won't 
precipitate out that much, but we can then do an extraction with ethyl acetate, which we know works, uh, to get the rest of the cubane out um, that will be free of benzophenones. Very tempting to be fooled here again, because this really looks like the precipitate, but this is what happened last time. There's our cubane. It's not in this. It looks like a lot of material, but it's not. And it's not the thing we want. I've got to convince myself of this. So this solution, we've now got to reacidify it. I'm also going to add in a lot of salt just to increase the polarity of solution. So um, the cubane acid will uh, more likely go into the ethyl acetate. Um, I obviously stole this salt from the kitchen. Here's all our combined extracts, it's very dark, and we have some, well, I mean, it looks like some insoluble shit in there too. Um, well, I guess low solubility stuff. There's some of it on the side. And some water down the bottom, it's mostly water down there with a little bit of the precipitate. So I'll dry it out over some calcium chloride and then run it through a filter, and then it'll get rid of all the polymerized, polymerized crap, as well as the calcium chloride, and then we can evaporate off the ethyl acetate to leave us just with a nice residue of cubane, which will probably look exactly like this, but all going well, except for the part where I spilled the ethyl acetate a little bit on the table here. A bit sloppy. <sighs> I'm a professional, I'm a professional. So here we are with our bloody Cubane. Disgusting tar. You know, uh, maybe not this DCM, yeah, we, we've disregarded these DCM extracts. So here we are. It's probably all up about three quarters of a gram. So, so not, not a whole lot. And we know it's very impure. We can look at it, we can look at the analysis. It's all very impure. So the next step is to turn um, this cubane diacid into the methyl ester. And this is what everyone does when, when making this, because you can go from the methyl ester back to the dicarboxylic silic acid very easily. Uh, and it's just a great way of purifying it. The series isn't over. We have cubane, but we would like to end up with a cubane solid that is actually nice to look at not this awful um, shit. Like we should be able to get to uh, somewhat approaching a nice white solid with a methyl ester um, in the next video, potentially. <laughs> Who knows? So we'll see you next video for um, less tar, maybe. Potentially less tar, but you never know. You never know. Last episode, we confirmed we had made some cubane in here via our NMR analysis. This is obviously horrendous. We need to purify this. There's still a step really in our scheme that we need to do. And this is really the purification step everyone does. It's turning cubane diacid into the methyl ester. This is done because the reaction itself you know, is sort of a purification step, making the methyl ester really selects for, you know, the diacid. But in addition, the methyl ester is just a lot more easy to purify, at least compared to the raw diacid. You can recrystallize it. It's got a reasonable vapor pressure, even though it's a solid, so you can do things like purify it by sublimation. Some people even ran uh, a vacuum shore path distillation of the methyl ester of cubane itself, although some people reported some explosions when they uh, tried doing that um, shore path distillation. So we're not going to be trying the shore path distillation. Recrystallization and um, sublimation to purify are, are well within our ability to do things here in the shed. That's much better than having to do column chromatography or some being you know actually serious there's not a lot of material so that's a bit of a challenge um I, I can't remember how much is in here but if i had to guess i would say it's it's very close to sweet fuck all i usually don't work on a very small scale i love to 
fucking put 10 grams of something in and then get one gram back out. But starting with 100 milligrams or so um, is a bit more challenging. And this is very this is very disgusting. I mean, it's, it's very tarry and is just a raw extract from the ethyl acetate we extracted from the solution. So I think we got to really even do a pre-purification step first, dissolve it in a basic solution and then precipitate out with acid again, just to try and get rid of some of the organic nonsense that's in here and then we can go on to the esterification step because I feel like some of that organic nonsense will just plague us if if we don't try and cut it out now which is easy to say but uh, hopefully it all works because we don't have much room for like redundancy and doing it multiple times we could sit on this and say yes we've done it um, but we've got to risk it all we've got to risk it all so <laughs> let's do it all right, I'm just putting in a very minimal amount of water here. I'm gonna dissolve this in like the minimum amount of water possible. A bit less than a mil. Shouldn't dissolve very much at all, but we'll add some uh, um, some sodium hydroxide. Just, once again, a very small amount of sodium hydroxide. There's like maybe five prills of sodium hydroxide in there. Now we can see it dissolves it pretty well. Fantastic. Uh, it's reasonably neutral, so I might put in just another couple of prills of sodium hydroxide just to ensure it's definitely basic and we're, and we're definitely dissolving as much of the, the dye acid as we can out of there. Yeah, okay. That's really strongly basic now. It's pretty murky, pretty tarry. So I really want to run it through the centrifuge. I <laughs> say that like it's a, the centrifuge, like it's a name I gave it. it, it it's, um, I don't think I've filmed the centrifuge before. I have a centrifuge, just really casually, you know, as you do, as one does, I have a centrifuge. Look, it's a centrifuge. I acquired this from a skip. Um, someone was throwing it out and they let me rescue it because it was on a shelf with other broken things and had been there for years and so the assumption was it was broken and they were throwing it in the bin which I guess is fair enough you know how could you possibly fix this but um you know there's absolutely nothing wrong with it <laughs> um I mean the hard part is you can't get the lid off unless it's powered up and so they didn't want to power it up to test it because what if it was really broken or something and you shorted out the building so Whatever, it's got my sticker on it now, so fine. We'll put our bloody tar mixture in here, and then we've got one to balance it out, and we should hopefully be able to separate any any bits of tar that haven't really dissolved. Because this looks pretty bloody turbid, pretty murky. Potential scunge. My my scunge sense is it's through the roof, you know. I've got a I've got a sense for these sort of things. I reckon there's some scunge in there. So, all right, let's do that. We'll we'll we'll, we'll spin it buddy fast. That's our cubane dicarboxylic acid as the sodium salt, sodium salt of cubane dicarboxylic acid. So we're going to be adding acid, a strong mineral acid. I'm thinking probably nitric acid because we don't have a lot of room in this uh, container. So we need an acid that's reasonably concentrated, but has a has a sodium salt that's very soluble. Not that there's going to be much sodium salt in there. Anyway, that's a, that's a long thought process to say that we're just going to be using nitric acid. We could use hydrochloric acid, but there's not a lot of room here, so we'll just use a drop or two of nitric acid, why not? Yeah, well, hopefully the acid precipitates out again and then we can centrifuge it down uh, and this time we can get the stuff out that we actually want. As opposed to this stuff, which is tar. Just random in insoluble um, impurities. Get rid of that. Yeah. Always good to see the obvious things work, but fantastic.
And that's our cubane diacid there. It still looks pretty bad and does look like there's still a lot of tar in it. <laughs> yeah, we didn't expect to completely clear it up with this step, but it looks like we've got rid of some stuff. Maybe improved it a little bit better. It's kind of now a brown sludge rather than it being a brown tar which I think is a step up on the sort of tar scale, I guess. We will chuck this in desiccator, get this dry. Bloody paint flaking off, I'm gonna repaint this bench. Anyway, uh, yes, in the desiccator, and then we can run the esterification reaction when we're, when we're back here, uh, and this is nice and dry. All right, the product's been drying in the desiccator for the last couple of days. Oh, it might've been two weeks even, maybe even three weeks. I am very bad at keeping track of time. Anyway, it, it's definitely dried because we're into that Australian December weather where it's like 30 degrees every day for many hours in the day. <laughs> um, not sunburnt yet, but if I wait another two minutes, I will be sunburnt. I've got the, the product out and there's not very much of it. I mean, you know this by now, but geez, that's not a lot of product. It's about uh, 60 milligrams. One interesting thing is in the last little while, um, this is our, our um, solution that um, the stuff didn't precipitate out of. Given a bit more time and a little bit of focusing, yeah, we've got some actually really nice crystals coming out there. So that will be nice uh, cubane as well, the, the cubane dicarboxylate. But we should be able to uh, spin this down and add them to the reaction mix because we're, we're, we're on to the esterification step now. Um, we've just got to dissolve this small amount up in some methanol. The methanol is both acting as a solvent and the thing reacting with it. And we need just a little bit of acid, hardly any. We'll add um, some concentrated hydrochloric. I've only really got 32%. I don't have any anything stronger than that, but um, uh, you know, the fuming stuff is so annoying to store and, and make, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we'll need like half a drop of that um, and maybe 10 mils of methanol. Uh, it's just enough so it gets a nice reflux going. And we'll set this up for reflux for a couple of hours. Uh, I'll just set up the reflux and I'll add that in later on, um, just so get everything going. Before we get into the montage, uh, there's just two quick intrusive thoughts I want to go through. Um, this is methanol, obviously. <laughs> really in the whole Cubane scheme, um, we're trying to do everything from the hardware store. Um, that's the whole point of the series, you know this. Uh, methanol is not from the hardware store here. It's kind of the one exception in this whole thing, I mean, if we're ignoring how I've used ethyl acetate as a solvent, maybe this procedure could be like improved for the home chemist with ethanol, making the, the cubane, the, the ethyl ester. I don't know if that will work as well. Um, probably not. I got this methanol from a store that I think has since closed down, which just sold barrels of methanol, toluene and, and nitromethane. Hobby car racing things. So this, this is the last of my methanol. Um, and then once that's all dried up, that'll be it. Um, I was paying $2 a litre for it. Bargain, should have got a whole barrel, but then again, that that is not so safe to have a whole barrel of methanol lying around. All right, the other intrusive thought um, is this condenser is stupidly big, but all my other condensers are dirty um, and are off getting washed up. That implies like someone else is doing it, I'm doing it, but it's just elsewhere. Um, <laughs> this is the only <laughs> condenser I could find. It's so stupid, anyway. Great, <laughs> let's, let's do the goddamn chemistry now. Okay, here we are, here's our solid, it's dried out. Look, we've got some tar, it's all good. This should be a joyous point because we've probably made the methyl ester of the cubane, so look, we've done the series. But I'm furious with myself because I've spent all of this episode so far whinging about low yields and not having very much product and whinge, whinge, whinge. The whole time, 
I fucking forgot I had a whole nother flask of this stuff. I mean, look, it's not, not heaps more, but at the end of the last video, we had the stuff in the vial, plus an extra bit of stuff in this, in this flask. And I just forgot about this flask of this stuff. Infuriating. So this is, this is Cubane dye acid. Um, this could have done with some purification with the, uh, the bloody, you know, acid base stuff as well, but it's fine. Look, so we got to reflux this with the methanol as well. We've just done the step, but now we've got to go back and redo it. I might um, combine this in with it again anyway, because I really only refluxed it for maybe three hours and um, a lot of the papers do it overnight or 12 hours or something like that. It probably doesn't really make a difference, but look, if we're going to do the reflux anyway, we might as well add our material back in. And then we can arrive back at this point with, with more of our meth lester because I've got a little bit here, but it's just such a waste to have ignored this flask anyway. <laughs> I'm only mad at myself. <laughs> but I'm glad I realized now, not later, when I post the video and everyone's like, what about that other flask of the Cubane that you just completely forgot about? <sighs> All right, anyway, shit, um, let's, you know, fuck it. No montage for this one. We've already seen it. We've already seen it. Let's just go washing out the flask, blah, 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 then this other stuff, reflux. Hell yeah, love your work, future me. Um, that, yeah, shit. All right, m moving on with the video. Oi, get out of there. Off, wakey, wakey. Come on. Get out of there. Out, 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 no, out, out, up, oh, yes, good, thank you. Yo, how is there a spider there already? Where is he? Come on, mate, let's get you outside. Come on. Here is our, oh, I was going to say dried, but it's not even close to dried um, product. We, we've once again done it. It's, it's tar. Play the test. We've done it. It's tar again. But this is what we want. Uh, it, it, it's got a lot of water in it. All the methanol has, has, has left. It's been sitting here for a couple of days, which is always a bad thing to do, but um, what can I do? <laughs> um, and, and absolutely pissed with rain. It was pouring down out here. Um, not that not that any rain got directly in there, but I think there's something in there that's that's pulling in water from the air um, once once we hit 100% humidity. So it took off some of that water, but uh, we're just going to be adding in some more water now anyway. So there's no point driving this completely to dryness. This is a rotovap step. Obviously, you know, I don't have a rotovap, so I'm not going to waste time drying stuff out. I was blowing some argon through it um, to to dry drive off the methanol and everything like that. And it was pretty dry and then and then the water sort of absorbed into it, so I don't know what that's about. All right, now we get to extract our product. And, and this is a pretty clever reaction because we've gone from something that was sort of semi-water soluble and not very soluble at all in DCM to something not soluble in water at all and is very soluble in DCM. Even if we have a little bit of our dicarboxylate acid left in there and um, that didn't form the ester, we can separate out and pull just the ester out. So we're gonna just add a little bit of water in there Give it a stir um, just to try and dissolve everything we don't want into that water and then we'll add some DCM in there as well. Just give it a stir, just let our tar component, our, our methyl ester, get into that DCM and then we'll just do some, some more extraction. So, so take off that DCM with a separatory funnel in the usual way. I let this stir for about an hour and we've still got some stuff, some tar undissolved, but at least we've got all the stuff off the stir bar. And, and yeah, definitely our DCM layer, which is the bottom layer, definitely takes on some color. It's, it's not a good color. Some might even say that this would be yellow, but still, <laughs> nothing is ever perfect. and Nothing is even ever very good, but um, we'll settle with okay. We'll use a separatory funnel. Um, we wanna just collect the DCM. Um, and the water doesn't have anything that we need, so we can put that aside, um, you know, to throw out later. I will put some more dichloromethane in there and, and try and try and dissolve all that stuff up.
All right. Um, still trying to extract this with dichloromethane. It's not really doing too much more. If you can see, uh, there's really not a lot of color in that dichloromethane and this stuff is not dissolving very well. It just must be some tar. It looks like a lot of it and we didn't have a lot of cubane to start with, so it's not a good sign. I mean, yeah, if it's not easily dissolving into our DCM, then it's not the product we want. Whether it's trapped all in that tar and can't get out is uh, a bit frustrating. So I think it's all just adhered to the bottom of the <laughs> of the glass. Uh, typical tar, just tar nonsense. That's what this whole series has been about. It's fine. God damn, I'll see if I can get something in there. is our methyl ester. It was always gonna look like this, a yellow tar at the end. It feels very fitting on um, this whole series. We've just been fighting tars and different yellow tars, but there we go. There, there is definitely some there, which is fantastic. But once again, it's still looking pretty bad. And a lot of the point of getting to methyl ester and why I wanted to get to methyl ester is it's easier to purify, um, I guess, modern uh, YouTubers and, and modern chemists will, will just do column chromatography. But historically, I think it's been really useful because it has a reasonable vapor pressure. So you can purify it by sublimation. And to do that, we've got this fancy device here, which I have bought. Um, this is a cold finger. So you run uh, cold water through there um, and you have some sort of outer enclosure that you pull a vacuum on, you heat your, your substance below, it will form a vapor and then, because this is kept cold, this is your cold finger, crystals will form out of the gas phase on here and it's a really nice way of purifying things. Yes, looking at this object, it's very clear that this is a very stupid object. I bought this item specifically for this project, knowing that I probably wouldn't have that much powder, or maybe I was delusional and thought I would have heaps of product to purify, because this thing is huge for cold finger. And I guess maybe I thought it came with the outer enclosure, because like this, or you can just run water through it, but it, you need somewhere to put your solid and pull the vacuum on. And this item fits nothing of my glassware. Actually, no, I, I trolled through all my glassware and I found one, one flask it fits in, and this is a two liter flask, which, I don't even have the adapter for. I got this at like an antique store the other day. Made in Australia. That's that's real antique shit, you know? Um, <laughs> this was like 60 bucks at an antique store and I was like, hell yeah, I'm gonna get this. If I was like, oh, let's do the sublimation in this flask, you know, like, shocking. Like, that's terrible. And and, and I thought, oh, well, it's not too bad because I've got extension piece, which I don't think I've hardly ever used. What a random bit of glassware, but you'd expect this to go like through there which that all makes sense. And then, oh no, it doesn't, it doesn't fit. Maybe it doesn't fit through the, the joint. You can't, you can't put that all together. Shocking. So I've been, I've been trolling through all my glassware. Like I even found the Klyzan adapter and you think like, oh cool, this is a perfect opportunity for a Klyzan adapter. You put this through and it's like, that gets jammed again. I've been looking through all my glassware, even the bloody broken bits. Glassware graveyard, but Got all this glassware, nothing fits together. So um, what I think is probably the best way is this bit I don't really use that much. If I cut this joint like halfway-ish, then it should be able to fit over this thing and then I can fit it up there and then I can fit it onto a flask. Look, it's not, it's not very convincing. Um, I'm not very convinced myself, but um, if we can modify the glass so it all fit together properly, then it gives us a really good chance to do this nice sublimation. Whereas, um, otherwise, it's just not going to work. So let's give that a shot. Um, I definitely have some Cubane from um, Camolius who sent it over. Chemiolus. Chemiolus. I'm, I'm learning. Chemiolus sent over this Cubane methyl ester so we can use that in our sublimation setup once it's made. But can't make some eggs without breaking at least one fry pan. You know what I mean?
right, and here is our complicated setup. All together, it looks like quite a bit. <laughs> so we've got our cold finger in here. Um, this is, I've greased all these joints. That bit, that bit sticks in there, and that bit that will be cold sticks just above the surface of the flask there. Um, we're running some, some water through that. There's just green water that'll, that'll flow through there. Um, we need to pull a vacuum on it. So I've set up this vacuum system. This is a good vacuum pump with this. It's sort of a trap. Um, sort of an adapter <laughs> because I need valves to kind of open and close it which would be nice but also the uh yeah and we've got a gauge on there so that's why that that bit is there the reference we're following from the CSIRO paper from the 1997 they give values of 0 0.01 millimeters mercury as the pressure and 100 to 120 degrees some, somewhere around there I don't think we'll get that lower pressure um with this setup because my you know pipe and shit are all real dodgy so we'll probably just have to go a little hotter to, to get the stuff to sublime the melting point is is 160 so that's our kind of goal is to sort of maybe just stay below melting reasonable pressure hopefully enough of it sublimes what else needs to be done oh, i've got this big bit of ice that's got to go in here got this from the local bottle which is just what we call a place that sells a bottle of alcohol because you can't sell them in the supermarket i had my first job at that bottle though which is why I generally don't like going there because it wasn't really that pleasant of a job. Um, <laughs> I earned $50 a week, which makes me sound like a boomer, um, but it was only a few years ago. It's just because the guy would only schedule me for two hours a week. <laughs> I would finish a shift and then buy like a slab of beer. Sometimes that would be more than what I'd earned that entire week. So the guy would just make a profit off me working there. Anyway. This is a five dollar bag price so we'll get the water nice and cold we're gonna be using the um oh come on this is one of the last times i get to say it it's not chemiolus it's like aurora, aurora borealis camolius look we've got a small sample of like confirmed uh methyl ester of the cubane still not very much so we'll put a little bit in there a little bit at the base of the flask um get it heating uh, i might just heat it with a heating mantle yeah we feeling confident once again a lot of moving parts um, but I'm feeling confident. That kind of worked. I got a few crystals on the cold finger, but we got a lot of water on the on the cold finger as well. I don't know how. It must have leaking leaked a joint somewhere. Whether it's this short joint that we cut into. Oh, sorry, I'm getting so sweaty. It's fucking scorching out here. Yeah. All right. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's send it. It wasn't a great trial run, but feeling a little bit more confident now. I think we just got to pump the vacuum a bit more. So we should be able to pull out some crystals from, from the yellow here. So we're just going to dissolve this up in a little bit of dichloromethane. I'll keep some aside just in case we destroy this all. But then I'm just going to put the dichloromethane into the flask, uh, let it evaporate, form a, a, you know, a collection of crystals down the bottom. And that'll be good because they'll be adhered to the flask, not loose like the previous samples were. And they're kind of blowing around a little bit. But um, if they're stuck there, that'll be good. They'll get the heat from the flask um, and then go onto the cold finger. What could possibly go wrong? Let's do it.
after all that nonsense, we're left with, oh, I mean, about 10 milligrams of reasonably pure, from my assumptions, cubane. You can see all this tar that's left behind that didn't want to sublime. Uh, the product did go slightly yellow. Apologies, it's in an amber vial. I'm not trying to cover up the color, but I uh, just ran out of clear vials, but um, it's pretty nice and crystalline, a little oily. It's kind of got a smell, a bit of a petroly smell. I mean, I can't tell the difference between this sample and the and the camellia sample. Oh, my mine's definitely more yellow. But um, in terms of smell, they, they, it's this very similar. So that's it. I think I'll do a wrap up video and talk about this whole series as a whole. Um, I would love to do a Q&A as part of that. So if you have any questions, please write them in the comments or I'll make a community post as well a bit later. But any questions you have about the series, it's been going for three years now. Any loose ends? I, I swear there must be heaps of loose ends I haven't tied up. Improvements, you know, um, other suggestions or, or or things you think I might have missed. We could go back and, and redo it all and get more out. But um, the point was we were trying to do it and we've done it. Crazy.